Audible Inc. presents The History of Money, written by Jack Weatherford, narrated by Victor Bavine. Forward. Reinventing Money. Money is one of the shatteringly simplifying ideas of all time. It creates its own revolution. Paul J. Bohannon. The dollar is dying. So too are the yen, the mark, and the other national currencies of the modern world. Our global money system is infected with a deadly virus and, already severely weakened, it is now only a matter of time before it succumbs. The dollar, mark, and yen will join the ducat, cowrie shells, and the guinea in the scrap box of history as items of interest primarily to antiquarians and eccentrics. Just at the moment in history when money dominates the whole of our society, it faces some strange and ominous challenges. In the last decades of the 20th century, the global money system began to cough and sputter, to jerk and stumble. The currencies of several weaker nations unexpectedly sickened and died in a paroxysm of inflation, while the exchange rates of the strongest and healthiest currencies wobbled and lunged uncontrollably one way and then another. After reigning as the world's major financial institution since the Renaissance, banks teetered and fell under billion-dollar losses that seemed to occur inexplicably overnight. The United States continued to nurse a rising national debt, growing trade imbalances, episodic bouts of inflation, and a long-term decline in the value of the dollar. Despite rather awkward but extensive intervention at many levels, no government seems able to control its own currency, and new financial institutions now stretch across the globe in a network of interconnected businesses with a power never before known in history. Supposedly global agencies such as the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations, and the World Bank seem largely irrelevant to the finances of any but the weakest players already on the international dole. Despite the alarming monetary situation, the demise of the present monetary order will mark neither the end of commerce nor the death of money. Even as the old system staggers hesitantly into its grave, we can discern the new system rising on the horizon to replace it. We can see a flickering image of that new system in the soft glow of the computer screen, and we can smell its acrid scent among the electric cables on the floor of any international currency exchange. We can hear it in the electronic whir of encoded chips on plastic cards passing through the electronic readers that are already replacing the old cash registers. In the realms of cyberspace, money is now being reinvented as a free-floating force that can appear instantaneously anywhere in the world in any amount. No longer tethered to the fortunes of one government or a single country, the new money is emerging in a large variety of new forms. The new money is raw power. The new technology is already changing the way we earn and use money and it will create a whole new class system of rich and poor. The new money system will transform the way we distribute goods and the way we finance civic life. It will rearrange the political map of the world and create whole new local and global entities that are difficult to imagine today. The newly emerging system will change the very meaning of money. The present revolutionary change in the nature and uses of money constitutes the third great mutation in money. The first generation began with the invention of coins in Lydia nearly 3,000 years ago and resulted in the first system of open and free markets. The invention and dissemination of coins and the accompanying market created a whole new cultural system, the classical civilizations of the Mediterranean. The new monetary and market system ultimately spread around the world and gradually destroyed the great tributary empires of history. The second generation of money dominated from the beginning of the Renaissance through the Industrial Revolution, and it resulted in the creation of the modern world capitalist system. It originated in the banks of Italy 
and it eventually created a system of national banks and the paper money that they issued for use in daily commerce. The invention of banking and the paper money system destroyed feudalism, changed the basis of organization from heredity to money, and it changed the basis of economic power from owning land to owning stocks, bonds, and corporations. Each of the two initial types of money created its own unique culture that differed markedly from all earlier ones. Now, at the opening of the 21st century, the world is entering the third stage of its monetary history, the era of electronic money and the virtual economy. The rise of electronic money will produce changes in society as radical and far-reaching as the two earlier monetary revolutions caused in their own eras. The new money will make sweeping changes in the political systems, in the organization of commercial enterprises, and in the nature of class organization. Virtual money promises to make its own version of civilization that will be as different from the modern world as from the world of the Aztecs or the Vikings. Introduction The World Market The thing that differentiates man from animals is money. Gertrude Stein A young mother, barefoot and bare-breasted, hurries out of the mud hut with her nursing baby tied loosely at her side in a cloth sling, and with six eggs floating in a bowl of milk balanced delicately on her head. Even though the sun has not yet broken over the horizon, Sweat ripples across her face and drips from the gold ring piercing the middle of her lower lip. From the ring, the sweat drips down her chest and rolls across the decorative scars that glisten on her stomach. One morning in every five, she arises before dawn to begin the eleven-mile trek from her village of Kani Kombole in the West African country of Mali to the town of Bandiagara, where a market is held every five days. She hurries out of the family compound to join her sisters, her female cousins, and the other village women who have already begun the slow climb up the cliff that contains the tombs of their ancestors and that forms part of the Bandiagara Escarpment, a rise of some fifteen hundred feet to the plateau above. As the panting women slowly climb the rocky face of the escarpment, the mud and thatch huts gradually recede from view until they appear to be nothing more than sandcastles on a beach. In the heat, the two- and three-story huts, the rickety corn cribs, and the goat pens seem to melt in the first rays of the penetrating tropical sun. The women march for nearly three hours. They carry their nursing infants with them, but must leave behind the heavier children who are too young to make the arduous journey on their own. On her head or back, each woman carries something to sell in the marketplace. A bag of tomatoes, a bunch of small onions, a bowl of chilies, or a sack of sweet potatoes. Flies buzz around them constantly, attracted by the moving feast of fresh foods. Occasionally, the women stop to rest on some large rocks in the shade of a lonely and misshapen baobab tree in an otherwise austere landscape. They take small sips from the milk bowl, but they cannot rest for long. Pestered by the growing swarm of insects, and always in a hurry to get to market before their customers arrive and before the heat of the sun peaks, the women push solemnly ahead. A short distance ahead of the women, a small caravan of men marches with donkeys piled so high with millet that they look like parading haystacks. Even though all of the travelers come from the same village and often from the same families, the men and women travel in separate groups on their separate missions. On the other side of the world, in an apartment building on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, a young man clutching a new leather briefcase given to him as a graduation gift waits for an elevator. Dressed in a gray suit, gym shoes, and a raincoat, but without a tie, he steps into the elevator, which is already crowded. With a silent nod, the young man puts the briefcase between his knees and awkwardly ties his floral print silk tie without elbowing his neighbors. As he leaves the building and moves onto the sidewalk, 
he joins a rapidly moving column of people from adjoining buildings headed for the subway, where they join even more people pressed together in the cars that carry them south to the financial district at the southern tip of the island. After emerging from the subway, the man pauses to buy a sesame bagel, which he plunges into his pocket, and a paper cup filled with fresh-roasted Ethiopian blend coffee, which he sips through a hole in the plastic lid. Five days a week he makes the same commute from his apartment building to the New York Stock Exchange, situated among some of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. The town of Bandiagara, Mali, lies in the Sahel, the borderland between the southern Sahara and the thick rainforest along the West African coast. Once in the market, the women of Kani Kombole go their separate ways. One takes her onions to the onion truck, where the buyer will transport them to the city. Those with tomatoes spread out their sashes on the ground and arrange their produce on them, protecting their goods from the sun under small canopies of thinly plated straw on gnarly sticks. The woman who had balanced the milk and eggs on her head takes her load to the dairy area, where she displays the eggs in a small gourd next to the larger bowl of milk. Once she has sold her goods to townspeople or traveling wholesalers, the village woman might buy a plastic pail, some tobacco, a block of salt, a few cups of sugar, or some other luxury goods to take home with her. The food, however, is for the townspeople to buy, not her. The few overripe bananas from the coast, the dried dates brought in from an oasis in the Sahara, and the expensive oranges from the coastal farms cost more than the whole load of vegetables or milk that she was able to bring to market. Except in the Muslim communities, where almost all public activities fall into the domain of males, women operate and manage the markets throughout West Africa. The women carry the produce to and from the market, and they negotiate the buying and selling. Most of the people who come to the market as buyers or sellers are women. Although men may wander through on a specific mission, the interactive style of the market is female and based largely around enduring ties of kinship, friendship, and personal knowledge of one another. Despite their illiteracy and complete lack of formal education, most of the women in the marketplace at Bandiagara can negotiate buy and sell with great facility. They barter produce for produce, will accept payment in coins and paper money, often in several different currencies, and can make change. Even though they cannot read the words on the money, they recognize the value of the different bills primarily by their color, shape, size, and the images on them. Because transactions are made publicly in front of a line of other attentive women, the marketplace abounds in advice and help in each transaction to make sure that it proceeds according to tradition. Women bargain and barter, often without even sharing a common language. All they need is a couple of words and a set of hand gestures to signify the numbers. A clenched fist means five. A hand clap signifies ten. The milk seller's primary competitors in Bandiagara are not other women like her in the neighborhood. They are the dairy farmers of Wisconsin, New Zealand, and the Netherlands. The imported milk is condensed, canned, and distributed free in the poor countries of Africa. Although clearly marked not for sale in English, it persistently shows up for sale in the stall immediately next to the young mother from Kani Kombole. The amount of canned milk for sale depends in part on economic conditions in North America, Europe, and the South Pacific. It depends on how much milk Nestle, Hershey, or Kraft buys for their annual production, and on the fluctuating value of the American dollar, the Dutch guilder, and the New Zealand dollar relative to the French franc, to which the West African franc of Mali is tied. It depends on how hot the summer is and how much ice cream people eat. It depends on the world's annual yield of soybeans, one of the major competitors of milk products. The amount of canned milk for sale in Bondiagora in any given month also depends on the dairy subsidies and the foreign aid appropriations made by the U.S. Congress in Washington, D.C., the food policies of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva, and the European Common Market, headquartered in Brussels. 
and the mercurial aid programs of religious and other private charitable organizations around the world. When there is an abundance of donated milk on the Bandiagara market, the young mother is less likely to sell her fresh milk. When the cans of milk disappear, she will earn more money and will be able to take home more goods that day. Her eggs provide a small financial cushion that help to stabilize her income somewhat, since foreign food programs frequently donate milk products but rarely send eggs abroad. She can usually sell the eggs, even on days when she and her family drink the bowl of unsold milk rather than carry it all the way back to Kani Kombole. The Money Net the floor of the New York Stock Exchange seems as littered as the ground in the market of Bandiagara. Instead of peanut shells, corn husks, and banana leaves, however, the floor is covered with multicolored slips of paper from financial transactions. Any experienced trader can instantly determine the volume of activity and the areas where it has transpired by the number of white and yellow slips of paper piled up around a hot zone like pottery shards around a kiln. Aside from the messy floor of the exchange, the cavernous hall looks deceptively like a high-tech automobile assembly line with banks of electronic equipment, miles of blue computer wires, and monitors hanging down on flexible arms, like the robotic equipment used to put cars together. The green letters on the electronic boards cast an ethereal glow into the antiseptic atmosphere of the large cavern. Despite the apparent chaos on the floor, activity is carefully regulated by a system of colors. The monitors give out the latest financial information in an eerie computer light. Each worker has his own particular jacket color and type of plastic identification badge, and the bright yellow telephones are easy to spot. Workers on the floor chat idly about sports, chew gum, or munch snacks in casual groups that suddenly spring to life as frenzied huddles of would-be buyers and sellers jump, shout, and gesture furiously whenever the stock of a particular company comes into play. Although women are allowed to work on the floor of the stock exchange, it remains largely a male domain, with a decidedly masculine style of interaction that is loud and intense. Traders on the floor haggle and transact business for people and institutions throughout the world. In the space-age booths on the floor, they receive requests for purchases or sales from their home office, located somewhere nearby in the financial district, which, in turn, have received orders from branches and customers around the world. Depending on the time zones, they can connect with virtually any financial nexus on the globe through a few telephone calls and computer transmissions. Every stage of the procedure can be executed electronically until the final moment when buyer meets seller in the form of two traders standing face to face on the exchange floor to negotiate the details. It does not matter that one is trading for a Belgian in Osaka and the other for retired teachers in Omaha. They may not even know where Osaka or even Omaha is, but at the last moment all of these transactions from around the world are finalized in a personal encounter between a trader trying to sell for the highest price and a trader who wants to buy at the lowest price. Both are acting on behalf of people whom they will probably never know or even see. The same communication lines that brought the requests will, in turn, instantly transmit information about the sale to computer monitors around the world and thus influence other players in their decision to enter or to avoid the market at this particular moment. When the sun sinks lower in the sky and the scorching noon heat subsides, the young mother gathers up her baby, the empty milk bowl, and the three cola nuts that she purchased with her earnings. She then joins the long line of women marching out of town toward their villages and the evening chores that await them at home. Without the heavy milk on her head, her feet move more lightly, and she scurries along toward the family compound in Kani Kombole, where she will help to milk the family goats before losing the light of day. 
At the end of a long day on the stock exchange, the young man loosens his tie and joins friends for a beer and some rumor swapping, mixed with an extended analysis of what happened on that day's markets and speculation on where the market is headed in the days to follow. On the way home, he picks up some takeout Italian food for himself and his roommate, who turns out not to be home. So he shares his dinner with his roommate's dog as they watch a basketball game on television. After eating, he clicks on his portable computer, updates the values of his own investments, and sorts through the advertisements and bills that arrived in the mail. The young mother in the marketplace in Mali and the young stock trader in New York do not live in the same country or even on the same continent. They will probably never meet or even know of each other's existence. He is an Irish Catholic living in one of the most technologically advanced, affluent, and crowded cities in the world. She belongs to the animistic Dogon tribe and lives in a small village without running water or electricity. He uses the most advanced communications technology in the world, while she can neither read nor write and must bargain with hand signals. They speak different languages, live in different worlds, and despite the modern modes of communication and transportation, each of them might have great trouble understanding the values and lifestyle of the other. Yet they are united in one network, in a single grid of interlocking institutions that spans the globe, connecting the stock markets of Hong Kong, San Francisco, and New York to Amsterdam, London, and Lima, as well as to all the small towns, villages, and farms scattered around the globe. The same market connects every country, every language, and every religious and ethnic group. Many independent markets once operated throughout the world. Some sold milk and beans. Others sold stocks and bonds. Some sold insurance or agricultural futures. Others sold mortgages or cars. Today, Electronic communications efficiently connect all of these markets into a single international market, uniting all parts of the globe and, just as importantly, all parts of the market. They are united by one thing. Money. No matter whether they call their money dollars, rubles, yen, marks, francs, pounds, pesos, bots, ringgits, kroners, kwanzas, levs, escudos, liras, bipulwells, rials, drachmas, shekels, yuans, quetzals, paangas, ngultrums, uguias, rupees, shillings, or afghanis. They all operate in essentially the same way as smaller parts of an international monetary system that reaches every farm, island, and village on the globe. No matter where and no matter what the local currency, the modern system permits the easy and quick flow of money from one market to another. If one could strip away the clattering machines, electronic beepers, video monitors, cellular telephones, computer keyboards, and miles of blue cable, the stock exchange would look much like market day in Bondiagora, when the merchants huddle in their miniature stalls, persistently offering their meager wares for sale. Whether the transaction is for bolts of cloth, bags of spice, slabs of salt, rolls of tanned skins, bowls of fresh milk, or ownership of a small portion of a large corporation, the fundamental activities of the market differ very little. Money has created a unified world economy that includes the price of milk and eggs in the market at Bondiagora, as well as the price of stock in Sara Lee Foods or PepsiCo on the New York Stock Exchange. Although fluctuations in politics, religion, technology, and even the weather can play a role in any of these endeavors, money constitutes the basis of the entire system and forms the crucial link in establishing value, facilitating exchange, and creating commerce. Money unites them all together into a single global system. It is the tie that binds us all. One hundred years from now, the market women of Africa will still be doing a thriving business, but the stock exchange will probably have disappeared. People will always need to make personal contact to procure the daily necessities of life, but they do not need it for financial transactions. 
the electronic market is rapidly replacing the face-to-face -face market of the stock exchange in a way that it can probably never do with food. Cash Configuration Even though the young American man in New York and the young Dogon woman of Mali live in an economically united world and work in similar markets, there are many obvious yet important differences between their cultures and lives. At the heart of these differences is the fundamental role played by money in the lives of the people of Dogon compared with the part it plays in the lives of Americans. The Dogon woman uses money only once every five days when she goes to market. The man in New York uses money every day and nearly every waking hour. Money constitutes a minute part of the Dogon woman's life away from her village and is rarely used inside the village, where interactions center on her kin and her husband. Money is a part of virtually every interaction of the American's day, however, from work and meals to fiddling with his computer at home. Money penetrates the heart of his life. The American man and the Dogon woman live in cultures with different core values and focal points. Every culture organizes life around a few simple principles, activities, and beliefs. The other institutions and activities of the society hang from that core like branches from a tree trunk. These central acts, institutions, and values form what Ruth Benedict, arguably the most perceptive American anthropologist of the 20th century, called a cultural configuration. Dogon culture configures itself around a core of art, ritual, and myth. Around the world, museums feature the unique sculptures, masks, and headdresses of Dogon artisans. In addition to these arts, the people decorate their mud huts, clothing, and bodies, and they spend much of their time in a cycle of ceremonial dances and rituals intimately tied to their unique cosmology and myths. Ritual and art become the central forms of expression around which and through which they organize their political, economic, and social life. The Dogon emphasis on the arts is unusual in the inventory of world culture, but it is certainly not unique. The Balinese of Indonesia, the traditional Hopi and Pueblo people of the United States, and a few other cultures in the world share their focus on art, myth, and ritual. Most cultures, however, have far more mundane cultural configurations than these artistic ones. In East Africa, the cultures and social systems of the nomadic tribes focus on cattle. In his classic study of the newer people of Sudan, British anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard described them as obsessed with their cattle. Boys take the name of their favorite bull and write love songs about their cattle. Women call themselves cows and their men bulls. Marriage has become official only through the transfer of cows to the wife's family. And homicides have to be redressed and expiated by providing cows for the victim's family. Cattle are more than a store of wealth or value. Cows constitute the social idiom of newer life. The Bedouins of Arabia and North Africa focused on camels. The Navajo and the ancient Hebrews focused on sheep. The Plains Indians of North America, the Gauchos of South America, and the Mongols and Turks of Asia focused on horses. The culture and social system of the Sami, or Laps, of northern Scandinavia focused on the reindeer. And the Cree of Canada focused on the caribou. This focus was more than just a passionate interest, like the American interest in cars or the Japanese fascination with electronic devices. Rather, these animals became the focal point around which the entire culture configured itself. Ancient Egyptians focused on the authority of a powerful state bureaucracy centered on a death and burial cult. Laborers spent decades building the pyramids and the other tombs of their pharaohs, and the economic organization of the whole country focused on supplying and completing these great projects. In contrast to the monetary cultures in which gold served as a medium of exchange and economic organization, in ancient Egypt it served as an object for burial. The Egyptians buried more gold and other precious commodities in the earth than any other known civilization in history. The cultural focus is not always an animal or object. 
The culture of Tibet, for example, focuses on the rituals, rites, and meditations of that nation's unique variety of Buddhism. The Tibetans' largest buildings were temples and monasteries that served as centers of politics and economics as well as religion and learning. Prior to Tibet's subjugation by the Chinese, monks ruled the country and about a quarter of the male population entered the priesthood. Many of the tribal societies of New Guinea and Melanesia were organized around the political competitions of their so-called big men, who arranged marriages, cultivated yams, and distributed pigs. Among the Papuan people, these big men negotiated marriages in order to form good alliances and to get wives who could grow yams and raise fat pigs, with which the big man could then make more alliances for himself and for his children who, in turn, helped him produce more yams and pigs. The cycle culminated in mokas, a great celebration of feasting, dancing, and oratory, during which the big man gave away as many pigs and as much food as he could in order to make yet more economic and political alliances, and thereby begin a new round of marriages, yams, pigs, and mokas. Human sacrifice served as the central organizing principle of the Aztec Empire of ancient Mexico. In the early years, the Aztecs sacrificed war captives. But once they had defeated all of their neighbors, they faced a shortage of sacrificial victims. They solved the problem by waging ceremonial wars, or flower wars, which they enacted with their subject peoples solely for the purpose of capturing young men for sacrifice. They erected massive pyramids for conducting these rituals, and they organized their wars and even their ball games around the core rituals that expressed the main beliefs of their culture. It is difficult for us to understand how the Dogon could have organized their lives around art and ritual, the New Era around cows, the ancient Egyptians around death, the Aztecs around human sacrifice, and the Papuans around marriages, yams, and pigs but each of these offered a focus for conducting the essential activities of life. It would probably be just as difficult for them to understand our world, organized as it is around this odd abstraction we call money. Papuans recognize that yams and pigs can be eaten. Marriage brings sexual gratification and the production of children. The Dogon recognize that art is beautiful to behold, and rituals can be enjoyable activities and pastimes. By contrast with these forms of aesthetic and biological satisfaction, money lacks immediacy. Yet in modern society, money serves as the master key that unlocks nearly all pleasures, as well as many pains. Money constitutes the focal point of modern world culture. Money defines relationships among people, not just between customer and merchant in the marketplace or employer and laborer in the workplace. Increasingly in modern society, money defines relationships between parent and child, among friends, between politicians and constituents, among neighbors, and between clergy and parishioners. Money forms the central institutions of the modern market and economy, and around it are grouped the ancillary institutions of kinship, religion, and politics. Money is the very language of commerce for the modern world. A language all nations understand. Afra Bain, a 17th-century dramatist who grew up in Suriname, wrote in her play The Rover in 1677. Money speaks sense in a language all nations understand. Money not only speaks sense, it also imposes that sense on whatever society it conquers, and it does so in a way that subjugates all other institutions and systems. From virtually the moment of its invention, Money became ever more important in Western society and eventually overwhelmed the feudal system and the aristocratic hierarchies of earlier civilizations. As money swept through history and across societies, its impact seemed surprisingly similar from ancient Greece and Rome to modern Japan and Germany. The tendency of money to replace family values appeared very early in Japan in the works of 17th-century writer Saikaku Ihara. 
He wrote at the same time as Aphra Bain, but on the other side of the world. Nevertheless, his observations on life seem quite familiar. Birth and lineage mean nothing. Money is the only family tree for a townsman. Though mothers and fathers give us life, it is money alone which preserves it. What he wrote in the seventeenth century is echoed in 1936 by Gertrude Stein, who said that the thing that differentiates man from animals is money. Even though little else unites their cultures, money has produced similar sentiments in a twentieth-century poet, a second-century Roman philosopher, and a seventeenth-century Japanese business writer. Their comments show how money was evolving into the key element in a new and complex type of society so very different from that of the Dogon, the Hopi, or the Nuer. Money has had a greater impact on the life of the American man working on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange than on the life of the Dogon woman in the Bandiagara market. But the difference is one of degree and not of kind. The difference is more quantitative than qualitative because the Dogon have also headed down the same path as the monetary cultures of the world. The Dogon are walking a little slower than the rest of us, but our economic way of life may be about to disappear just as quickly as it came into being. The young man working on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange will soon seem as quaint and old-fashioned as the woman carrying milk and eggs on her head. They both work in market systems that are rapidly becoming obsolete as money mutates into a new form that demands new kinds of markets, new ways of making financial transactions, and new kinds of businesses. Phase 1. Classic Cash Money alone sets all the world in motion. Publilius Cirrus Chapter 1. Cannibals, Chocolate, and Cash The last conflict is at hand, in which civilization receives its conclusive form, the conflict between money and blood. Oswald Spengler In the center of the Aztec imperial capital of Tenochtitlan, the priests performed their daily sacrifices. They marched the victim up the steep stairway to the top of the pyramid, where four priests grabbed his limbs and spread him out on his back on a large stone altar. One of the fearsome and blood-spattered priests raised an obsidian knife above his head and then plunged it into the heaving chest of the victim, held down on the altar before him. Quickly yet delicately, he slit open the chest and thrust his probing fingers between the ribs in search of the victim's heart. The priest pulled out the still-pulsing heart and tossed it onto a flaming brazier, an offering to Huitzilopochtli. The sacrifice could be performed in as little as twenty seconds, yet the heart could continue throbbing on the burning brazier for as long as five minutes. For Aztec merchants, the climax of the liturgical year of Aztec sacrifices came during the midwinter festival of Panquestalistali, the raising of the banners, when they could show off their success and wealth by sponsoring one of these human sacrifices. Unlike warriors who personally captured enemy soldiers on the battlefield for eventual sacrifice on the altar, the merchants had to buy their sacrificial victims at a price of up to forty woven cloaks. After paying for his victim, a merchant had to feed, clothe, and care for him in lavish style over many months as he was being prepared for the grand spectacle. In order to sponsor the sacrifice, the merchant had to host four lavish banquets and celebrations for other merchants and military leaders. Each banquet required new costumes, jewelry, and regalia for the merchant and his sacrificial victim. After procuring the lavish goods especially for the banquets, the merchant had to offer them as gifts to the guests in appreciation for their participation in the celebration. Only after all the appropriate ceremonies had been performed, the banquets hosted, and the expensive gifts presented, did the merchant finally escort his victim up the long flight of stairs to the altar where the priests ripped out his heart. After the sacrifice, the merchant took the mutilated body home, where the women cleaned it and cooked it, 
The merchant then served it in yet another ritual meal with corn and salt, but without the customary chilies. Everyone was free to enjoy the flesh except the merchant himself, for whom the sacrificial victim was something like a son. Under the guidance of the high priest, called the Tlenemakak or fire giver, the Aztecs orchestrated a series of sacrifices throughout the year. In preparation for these rituals, the priests pierced various parts of their own bodies, including the tongue and genitals, with maguey thorns as an offering of their own blood to the gods. An appropriately pious priest always had small open wounds on his temples from which blood oozed down the sides of his head. His hair grew long and matted with the blood, providing him with a frightening appearance and a horrendous odor that clearly set him apart from others in the Aztec world. Each god and each commemorative place in the complex Aztec calendar called for its own kind of sacrifice. In the early spring, for example, people fasted for rain and sacrificed tamales and small children to Tloque and Chalchihuitlique. Later in the spring, they performed more rain ceremonies to Shipe Totec, the fertility deity in the form of gladiatorial sacrifices. The priests tied the victim to a stone and armed him with a stick studded with feathers in place of blades. With this ritual weapon, he had to fight warriors with real weapons of sharp obsidian blades. The warriors strove to cut the victim only slightly, so that he might be cut many times and thus bleed as much and as slowly as possible to prolong the power and spectacle of the sacrifice. The priests seized less cooperative victims, who refused to play the role of ritual gladiator, bound them with ropes, and offered them to the fire god by slowly roasting them alive. In subsequent ceremonies during the ritual year, priests flayed men and tortured children to death, so that their tears might induce the gods to send more rain. The gods supposedly had a special fondness for babies born with a double cowlick, Priests seized such babies from their mothers at birth and kept them in a special nursery until time for their ritual sacrifice. Throughout the year, special victims impersonated the gods. An impersonator of the god, Tezcatlipoca, had to be a handsome young man without a blemish. For a year he lived as the god, participating in rituals, singing, dancing, and playing his flute throughout the city. People regaled him with gifts and flowers. He had four beautiful wives. But at the end of the year, he had to leave them and climb the pyramid, where his heart was ripped out and his head severed. The most dramatic sacrifice came during a dance when priests seized the impersonator of Shippe Totec and quickly flailed him. A priest then put on the skin of the dead person and continued the ceremony. In a female version of the same ceremony, a woman was sacrificed and her skin worn by a priest of the goddess Tochi. Although the sacrifices sponsored by the merchants ended up on the dining table of a special banquet, most sacrificial victims had a more mercantile end. After the sacrifice, the priests rolled the heartless body back down the steep stairs that the victim had ascended only minutes before. At the bottom of the pyramid, attendants severed the head and placed it on a trophy rack containing the slowly rotting heads of previous victims. They disemboweled the corpse and sent the choicest cuts of meat to the Tian Quitzli, the city market, where they were sold for chocolate. Chocolate Cash The Aztecs used chocolate for money, or more precisely, they used the cacao seeds, usually called beans. With these cacao seeds, one could buy fruits and vegetables such as corn, tomatoes, chilies, squash, chayotes, and peanuts. Jewelry made of gold, silver, jade, and turquoise. Manufactured goods such as sandals, clothing, feathered capes, cotton-padded armor, weapons, pottery, and baskets. Meats such as fish, venison, duck, and specialty goods such as alcohol and slaves. The Aztec marketplaces usually stood adjacent to the main government buildings so that the exchange of goods could take place under the close supervision of government officials. Markets like the one in central Tenochtitlan occupied a great area, but the government prohibited any buying or selling outside the officially prescribed trading zone. Government officials regulated prices and sales, and they stood at the ready to punish and even execute anyone violating the law of the market. 
the government also sponsored a hereditary caste of long-distance merchants, the Pochteca, who had an important official status within the state and had their own god, Yacatecutli. In addition to the Pochteca, the Aztecs sent out official tribute collectors, or Calpishke, to all parts of the empire to bring back goods for the central administration in the highland valley of Mexico. The empire operated primarily on the basis of tribute. The markets functioned as subsidiary parts of the political structure, and many different standardized commodities served as forms of near money. Several tribute lists have survived and show the amount due from various provinces in the form of corn, amaranth, beans, cotton armor, obsidian knives, copper bells, jade, gold, sandals, shields, feathered capes, cacao, shells, feathers, and other practical and ornamental goods. The vast bulk of goods that passed through the Aztec Empire moved primarily as tribute from the peripheral parts of the empire to its capital. In this regard, the Aztec Empire was like virtually all other empires in the era before the spread of money. Ancient Egypt, Peru, Persia, and China all functioned as tributary systems rather than market systems. Within this tributary system, the local markets played a minor role in distributing goods, but cacao had a major role within that smaller sphere of activity. Of all the forms of Aztec money, cacao proved to be the most commonly available and the easiest to use. The cacao tree produces large, greenish-yellow pods that look something like cantaloupes. When ripe, the fruit has a fleshy white pulp that is quite delicious, though it tastes nothing like chocolate. When preserved by drying and toasting, the beans can last for many months before being ground up to make chocolate. Cacao grew mostly in southern Mexico, in what are now the states of Oaxaca, Chiapas, Tabasco, and Veracruz, and in the Central American nations. From these areas it was traded and sent as tribute throughout the Aztec Empire, particularly to the capital, Tenochtitlan, the site of modern Mexico City. Cacao became so important as a means of exchange that it produced its own counterfeiting industry. Criminals would take the small husk of the cacao bean, empty it, and replace it with mud. They then sealed the husk and mixed the fake cacao beans with real ones to further obscure them. Commodity money, like cacao, operated in a system based more on barter than on purchase. An Aztec would exchange an iguana for a load of firewood or a basket of corn for a rope of chilies, and if the goods did not have precisely the same value, the traders used cacao to even it out. The cacao beans served as a way to calculate value and to round out the exchange, but it did not serve as the exclusive means of exchange. The seller who wanted to exchange an opal, cactus, worth five cacao beans, for an ear of corn worth six cacao beans, for instance, would turn over the nopal and then add one cacao bean to even out the trade. For large purchases, merchants calculated values in terms of bags of approximately 24,000 beans, but such quantities proved too cumbersome for use in daily transactions. As in many primitive systems where commerce focused on certain important commodities, the Aztecs used more than one commodity to standardize exchanges. In addition to cacao beans, they used coactli, cotton cloaks, the value of which varied from 60 to 300 cacao beans. The coactli served for larger financial transfers, such as the purchase of slaves or sacrificial victims, for which the bags of cacao beans would be too bulky. Other standardized exchange commodities included beads, shells, and copper bells, which were traded as far north as the modern state of Arizona. Commodity money has the great advantage of being an item of consumption as well as a means of exchange. The Aztecs could easily grind their cacao money into chocolate paste, then beat it vigorously into a container of water to make a delicious drink that they greatly prized. Unlike paper money and cheap coins that can easily lose their face value, commodity money has a value in and of itself and thus can always be consumed no matter what the status of the market. Chocolate, like all other types of money, has no inherent value outside of a cultural context. In order for it to have value, people have to want it and know how to use it. 
The Mesoamerican love of chocolate as a food and as a means of exchange contrasted greatly with the values of the first European pirates to seize a ship loaded with cacao beans. The pirates mistook the cacao beans for rabbit dung and dumped the entire cargo into the sea. The Aztec Empire of Mexico illustrates how complicated the economic and political relationships can become, even in the absence of money. Their distribution system reached as complex a level as an empire and a proto-market system could reach within the confines of a tributary empire and primitive or commodity money. Through the use of particular commodities, they came almost to the point of creating a modern monetary system, but they never quite crossed the line. Commodity Money Throughout the world, commodities from salt to tobacco, from logs to dried fish, and from rice to cloth have been used as money at various times in history. Natives in parts of India used almonds. Guatemalans used corn. The ancient Babylonians and Assyrians used barley. Natives of the Nicobar Islands used coconuts, and the Mongolians prized bricks of tea. For the people of the Philippines, Japan, Burma, and other parts of Southeast Asia, standardized measures of rice traditionally served as commodity money. Norwegians used butter as money, and in the medieval era they used dried cod that could be easily converted into other goods or into coins by trading with the Hanseatic merchants living in Bergen. They, in turn, sold the fish in southern Europe, where there was great demand for it on Fridays during Lent, and at other times when the Catholic Church prescribed the eating of meat. In China, North Africa, and the Mediterranean, people used salt as commodity money. At great risk in some of the hottest places on earth, tribesmen of the central Sahara mined large slabs of salt three feet long and several inches thick. The Sahara contained some of the purest salt in the world, and a caravan of passing salt merchants might at first sight be misperceived to be transporting slabs of white marble tied to the sides of their camels. Because of its purity, the salt can be easily cut into a number of standardized sizes. Merchants usually wrapped the smaller denominations of salt in a protective reed covering in order to reduce the danger of the salt chipping and prevent people from scraping off parts of it between trades. The modern English word salary and the Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese word salario are derived from the Latin word sal, meaning salt, or, more precisely, from salarius, meaning of salt. It is thought that the Roman soldiers were paid in salt, or that they received money for the purpose of buying salt to flavor their otherwise bland food. Pastoral people often used live animals as a type of money in which the value of everything else was calculated. The Siberian tribes used reindeer. The people of Borneo used buffaloes. The ancient Hittites measured value in sheep, and the Greeks of Homer's time used oxen. Wherever people have had cattle, they have tended to use the cattle as a form of commodity money. Pastoralists calculate and pay virtually everything, from slaves and wives to fines for adultery and murder, in cows. Cattle played an equally important role in the economy of many ancient European peoples, from Ireland to Greece and throughout the Indian subcontinent. The cattle complex survives in modern times in eastern and southern Africa, among tribes such as the Maasai, Samburu, Dinka, and Nuer. The traditional importance of cattle survives indirectly in several modern European languages. The word pecuniary, which means related to money, is derived from the Latin pecuniarius, meaning wealth in cattle. The ass, a Roman coin, represented a value equivalent to one hundredth of a cow. Related English words include pecunious, an obsolete term meaning wealthy, and the more commonly used impecunious, meaning poor. The importance of the bovine idiom in European culture is further illustrated by the word cattle, which is derived from the same Latin roots that gave us capital, another broader term for money. Chattel, any item of movable personal property such as a slave, is derived from the same source. Thus, modern names for two of the most important economic systems in European history, 
capitalism and feudalism, can both be traced back to systems based on cattle. Even human beings have served as a measure of money. In ancient Ireland, slave girls became the common value against which items such as cows, boats, land, and houses were measured. Viking raiders and merchants sold the young women to slave traders in the Mediterranean, where they were highly valued because of their red or blonde hair. Irish males had far less value as slaves. In parts of equatorial Africa, by contrast, male slaves had a higher value than females and children, who would be measured as mere fractions of the value of a male. Of all the forms of money, slaves proved one of the least reliable because of their high mortality rate and their tendency to escape. Modern Commodities the use of commodity money has never disappeared, and it rises again whenever the normal flow of commerce and economic life is interrupted. Cigarettes, chocolate, and chewing gum filled temporary monetary gaps throughout Europe at the end of the Second World War. Not since the fall of the Aztec Empire had chocolate had such a high purchasing power as when the American soldiers arrived in Europe. During the tyrannical reign of President Nicolae Ceausescu in Romania, the country had an ample supply of paper money and aluminum coins, but the money had virtually no value because the dictator and his wife exported almost everything produced in the country. They rationed food, allowing fewer than 2,000 calories a day for each of the common people, and the temperature in their homes and offices was not allowed to rise above 55 degrees. Under such an austere regime, Cigarettes, particularly Kents, functioned as the real currency of the nation. Anything could be bought for cigarettes. Food, electronic goods, sex, or alcohol. Cartons of cigarettes had the advantage of being easily broken up into ten packs per carton, each of which could in turn be broken up into twenty cigarettes. Consumable commodities such as tobacco and chocolate serve as adequate means of exchange but they cannot perform all the functions of money. For example, they make a poor store of value. Anyone who had to accumulate sacks of grain or a load of tobacco as a way of amassing wealth would soon find that the grain rotted or was eaten by insects and rats, and the tobacco would slowly lose its flavor and begin to fall apart. In order to store their wealth for use in the future, people need more durable items, such as cloth, furs, feathers, whale teeth, boar tusks, or shells. These commodities last longer than food, yet they too eventually deteriorate and lose their value. Food items might function adequately for the exchange of goods, but they are not good stores of value. Animal skins and furs proved extremely useful in Russia, Siberia, and North America, but they had little practical use in the warmer markets of the Caribbean, Africa, South America, and Southern Asia. The Canadians used the thick, luxurious beaver pelts that their large country produced and that were so popular with European hatters and clothiers. Farther south in the British colonies, the settlers used the skin of the North American deer, which achieved great importance in trade. Each skin was known as a buck, a word that has survived as a slang term for the dollar. Throughout history, commodities and valued articles sometimes created an economic system that superficially resembled a money system, but such systems were invariably limited in scope and utility. Primitive money works best in a tribal community or in a heavily regulated market. At one end of the political and economic spectrum, empires such as that of the Incas of Peru organized their entire realm without the use of any markets or any money. At the other end, the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, built a tributary state allowing the limited use of money with a proto-market system largely controlled by a ruling military class. Whale teeth served as items of great value in Fiji and a few surrounding islands, where they still play an important role in the ceremonial life and the prestige system of the people. Whale teeth, however, did not prove very effective in trade with other people who simply had no interest in them. Similarly, dog teeth were valued as a medium of exchange in the Admiralty Islands, but outsiders frequently found them disgusting and did not want to trade for them.
The desire for rare and valuable objects often induced entrepreneurial individuals to make risky journeys high into the mountains, deep into the jungle, or far out to sea. The items became important as gifts, particularly at important moments in the life cycle, such as birth, puberty, marriage, or death. They also became important as gifts between friends or as a part of the making and breaking of alliances among villages or particular groups of people. Durable commodities such as shells, stone, and teeth provide a long-term store of value. But because they occur naturally, their size, texture, color, and quality varies, and that fact keeps them from being entirely fungible. One whale tooth will not precisely equal another in value, and thus it becomes difficult to use the teeth interchangeably in a commercial system. Some items, such as shells, may be so abundant in coastal areas that they are too common to serve as money, and yet in a mountainous area they can be too rare to serve as general money. Even the cowrie shell, which had enormous popularity across much of Africa and other areas bordering the Indian Ocean, was of no use to most people in the world. They did not see its value, and therefore the shells always had limited circulation in specific areas. With items such as shells, however, tribal people came very close to developing real cash economies. Shells departed from the merely decorative aspect of culture and became a way of accumulating and storing wealth as well as a mechanism of trade. Money never exists in a cultural or social vacuum. It is not a mere lifeless object, but a social institution. To function completely as money, a material cannot exist simply as an object. It requires a particular social and cultural system. Once the system is in place, many different objects can serve as money. Often these uses arise from within the political or prestige sphere of social life rather than the commercial or subsistence spheres. Such items may be used to buy titles, to mark deaths, to negotiate marriages, to claim the right to use magic spells, or to acquire ritually powerful songs. More rarely, they have been used in the exchange of land, cattle, and other major goods, but even these exchanges often came about as subsidiary parts of a larger political or marriage negotiation, rather than as merely commercial activities. THE LOVE OF GOLD Next to food, humans seem to value metal as one of the most popular commodities in exchange. Of all the substances that can be used to make money, metal has more practical applications and has held its value over a longer time and a wider distance than any other. Because it is long-lasting, it serves as a good store of value. Because it can be made into smaller and larger pieces, it serves as a good means of exchange. It is not as bulky as the logs used by the Hondurans, nor is it as cumbersome as the bags of corn used by the Guatemalans. Unlike food commodities, which disappear when used, metal can be converted into something useful at any time and yet retain its value. It can be jewelry or a spear tip on one day and serve as money the next. From Scandinavia to Equatorial Africa, people have used particular standardized objects made of iron as money. The Sudanese made iron into hoes. The Chinese used a slightly differently shaped hoe made of bronze, as well as miniature knives of the same material. Ancient Egyptians used copper, while the people of southern Europe preferred bronze. The people of Burma used lead, and the people of the Malayan Peninsula used the tin that abounds there. In West Africa, people used copper rings known as manias as a specialized form of currency. Throughout Liberia and other parts of West Africa, people used long strips of iron flattened on both ends and known as kissy pennies, after the kissy tribe that manufactured them. The tribes of the Congo used brass rods, and in East Africa, many tribes manufactured metal objects in a distinctive shape for use only in their own society. The shape of their iron money was as much a form of identification for the people as their language. As technology developed, the type of desired object became more sophisticated and made great advances with the discovery of different metals. Of all the metals, gold has been the most universally valued. 
gold has relatively few practical uses outside of decoration and some sophisticated modern technological applications. Yet people throughout the world have been attracted to it. Even if it lacks utility, empirical evidence shows that humans everywhere have wanted to touch it, wear it, play with it, and possess it. Unlike copper, which turns green, iron which rusts, and silver which tarnishes, pure gold remains pure and unchanged. People around the world have closely associated gold and silver with magic and divinity. Sometimes the list of divine substances included other precious goods, such as silk cloth in India, vicuña cloth in ancient Peru, olive oil in Judea, and butter in Tibet but people almost everywhere regarded gold and silver as sacred substances. In most cultures, the gods valued offerings of precious metals more than flowers, food, animals, or even human beings. The Maya of the Yucatan sacrificed gold, silver, and jade objects to their gods in their sacred cenotes, deep pools of water formed in the peninsula's limestone base. In one of the highland communities of Colombia, before the arrival of the Europeans, the Chibcha Indians performed an annual ritual in which they covered their chief with gold dust. When he dived into the sacred lake, the water washed off the gold, becoming a gift to the gods. The chief was known to the Spaniards as El Dorado, the Golden One, and his wealth became the object of the greatest search in world history. In particular, Gold was considered a divine substance. People around the world noted the resemblance of its color to the sun, a coincidence to which they ascribed a deeper meaning. The ancient Egyptians believed that gold was sacred to Ra, the sun god, and they buried great quantities of it with the corpses of their divine pharaohs. Among the Incas of South America, gold and silver represented the sweat of the sun and the moon, and they covered the walls of their temples with these precious metals. Even after conquest, when the Spaniards took the Indian gold and silver, the natives decorated their new Christian temples with foil paper to imitate the sacred substances, and they tossed gold and silver-colored confetti into the air in place of gold dust. The ancient people of India considered gold the sacred semen of Agni, the fire god. Therefore they donated gold for any service performed by Agni's priests. Proto Money. As early as the end of the third millennium BC, the people of Mesopotamia began using ingots of precious metals in exchange for goods. Mesopotamian clay tablets inscribed in cuneiform in 2500 BC mention the use of silver as a form of payment. People called these uniform weights of gold and silver minus, shekels, or talents. An entire warehouse of olive oil, beer, or wheat could be reduced in value to an easily transported ingot of gold or silver. This system proved effective for merchants accustomed to dealing with a whole shipload or warehouse of goods. But gold remained too scarce and valuable for the average person wanting to sell a basket of wheat or buy a goatskin of wine. Such people had no access to this system of gold and silver ingots. Once human technology and social organization developed to the point of using standardized amounts of gold and silver in exchange, it became only a matter of time before smaller coins appeared. The technological and cultural leap from primitive coins constituted the first money revolution in history, and to the best of numismatic knowledge, it happened only once. It took place in Western Asia, in what is today Turkey and from there it spread around the world to become the global money system and the ancestor of the system in which we live and work today. Money does not occur in nature, and no version or analog of it exists among any other members of the animal kingdom. Money, like language, is uniquely human. Money constituted a new way of thinking and acting that changed the world immediately. Only now, after nearly 3,000 years, is the full power of money becoming apparent in human affairs. As it supplants or dominates many of the traditional social bonds based on family, tribe, community, and nation. Chapter 2 The Fifth Element 
Money ranks as one of the primary materials with which mankind builds the architecture of civilization. Lewis Lapham The oldest recorded word in European literature is the ancient Greek word for rage at the beginning of Homer's Iliad. In English, we usually translate his first line as Sing, O Muse, of the rage of great Achilles. But the original text begins with the word that means rage, wrath, or anger, and that emotion becomes the primary one in Homer's account of the Trojan War. Ten years of conflict, during which Greeks sacrificed, killed, tortured, raped, maimed, and enslaved one another. These rage-driven men lived in what modern scholars call the heroic or Homeric age, on the edges of the great ancient empires of the time. Their world would have remained in the shadows of historical darkness had it not been for the two great Greek epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer, which comprise an overture to civilization's recording of its own fateful unfolding. The Greeks portrayed to us in Homer's work were people of combat, not people of commerce. The heroes pursued lives of war, raiding their neighbors and defending their family honor. Homer described in vivid detail the weapons of his heroes, the armor they wore, the designs on their breastplates, and every implement they used in battle. He described the beauty of their ships, but he also grimly related where the spear entered the warrior's head, where it exited, and how long the slain warrior's mother and wife cried at his funeral. Money had no place in the epic poems of Homer, just as it had no place in the lives of his heroes. In the words of Voltaire, Agamemnon might have had a treasure, but certainly no money. Commerce did not appear in Homer's poetry in which men pursued honor, not wealth. They imposed their will upon others at any cost. They did not negotiate, compromise, or argue over the value of worldly goods. The strongest demanded that goods be given to them as tribute for use in their campaigns. They did not deign to haggle with shopkeepers. Fortified palaces, like that of Agamemnon in Mycenae and Priam in Troy, formed the center of the Greek communal life in the Homeric age. And markets did not figure as places of importance. Each town tried to produce as many of its own goods as possible so that it would have to trade as little as possible with other towns. In their spare time, the Homeric heroes hunted, feasted, and played ritual war games. Homer gives no hint of thought or self-reflection among his heroes. Their ideas and impulses came either from a deep-seated desire to increase their own personal honor, or as inspiration whispered into their ears by the gods. The heroes of Homer were men of passion rather than the men of moderation so admired in classical Greece. The phrase, Gnothi seoton, know thyself, which later became the motto of the classical Greeks of the Golden Age of Athens, would have been virtually meaningless to Achilles, Odysseus, Paris, Hector, Agamemnon, Priam, and the other Homeric heroes, who were men of action, not reflection. How could we imagine Odysseus coming home from his ten years of wandering to establish a pottery workshop, oversee a farm, or open a wine shop? Like the other Homeric heroes, Odysseus cavorted with divine beings, fought dreadful monsters, drank heavily, seduced women, both mortal and divine, and lived among other heroes in an eternal game of defending and increasing honor. Commerce had little meaning for Odysseus and his comrades, because they lived in a world that did not yet know money. Despite their lack of knowledge of money, it was very near the walls of Troy that money was born. It was here, in the little-known kingdom of Lydia, that humans first produced coins, and it was here that the first great revolution began. This revolution was destined to have a far greater impact on our world than all the heroes of ancient Greece. As Rich as Croesus Through the millennia, a succession of kingdoms arose, flourished, and withered, along the Ionian coast and adjacent islands. Each one left something that its neighbors and successors later adopted into their own culture. 
of the many great civilizations that flourished and withered in ancient Anatolia, the Lydian does not rank among the best known. The Lydians spoke a European language and lived in Anatolia after about 2000 B.C. They formed a small kingdom under the Mermnidi dynasty beginning in the 7th century B.C., but at its height the Lydian kingdom was little more than an overgrown city-state spread out from Sardis. The Lydian kings were not celebrated in myth or song as great warriors, conquerors, builders, or even lovers. The names of the dynasties and kings are known to us through Hittite tablets and the books of the Greek historian Herodotus, but only one name of ancient Lydia is commonly known today, Croesus. As rich as Croesus is a common expression in modern English, Turkish, and other languages around the world. Croesus ascended to the Lydian throne in 560 B.C. to rule a kingdom that was already rich. His ancestors had made a firm economic basis for the kingdom's wealth by manufacturing some of the best perfumes and cosmetics of the ancient world. Yet these goods alone could not have raised Croesus to the level of wealth that myth accords him. For that, he depended on another invention of his ancestors, coins, a new and revolutionary form of money. Something similar to money and something resembling markets can be found in Mesopotamia, China, Egypt, and many other parts of the world. But they did not actually use coins until the rise of Lydia and the subsequent minting of the first coins between 640 and 630 B.C. The genius of the Lydian kings can be seen in their recognition of the need for very small and easily transported ingots, worth no more than a few days' labor or a small part of a farmer's harvest. By making these small ingots in a standardized size and weight, and by stamping on them an emblem that verified their worth to even the illiterate, the kings of Lydia exponentially expanded the possibilities of commercial enterprise. The Lydians made the first coins of electrum, a naturally occurring mixture of gold and silver. They made the electrum into oval slugs several times thicker than modern coins, or about the size of the end digit of an adult's thumb. To ensure their authenticity, the king had each one stamped with the emblem of a lion's head. The stamping also flattened the lumps, beginning their transition from an oval nugget to a flat, circular coin. By making the nuggets the same weight and thus approximately the same size, the king eliminated one of the most time-consuming steps in commerce, the need to weigh the gold each time a transaction was made. Now merchants could assess the value by tail or by simply counting the number of coins. Such standardization greatly reduced the opportunity for cheating on the amount or quality of gold and silver in an exchange. One did not need to be an expert in handling a scale or in judging the purity of metal in order to buy a basket of wheat, a pair of sandals, or an amphora of olive oil. The use of coins that had been weighed and stamped in the royal workshop made it possible for commerce to proceed much more rapidly and honestly, and it allowed people to participate even if they did not own a scale. The commerce of coins opened up new dimensions for new segments of the population. The wealth of Croesus and his ancestors arose not from conquest, but from trade. During his reign, 560 to 546 BC, Croesus created new coins of pure gold and silver rather than electrum. Using their newly invented coins as a standardized medium of exchange, the Lydian merchants traded in the daily necessities of life, grain, oil, beer, wine, leather, pottery, and wood, as well as in luxury goods such as perfumes, cosmetics, jewelry, musical instruments, glazed ceramics, bronze figurines, mohair, purple cloth, marble, and ivory. The variety and abundance of commercial goods quickly led to another innovation, the retail market. Rather than leaving buyers to seek out the home of someone who might have oil or jewelry to sell, the kings of Sardis set up an innovative new system in which anyone, even a stranger, with something to sell could come to a central market. Numerous small shops lined the market, and each merchant specialized in particular goods. One sold meat, and another offered grain. One sold jewelry, another cloth. 
One sold musical instruments, another pots. This market system began in the late 7th century B.C., but its descendants can clearly be seen in the later Greek agora, in the medieval market squares of northern Europe, and in suburban shopping malls of the contemporary United States. Marketing became so important for the Lydians that Herodotus called them a nation of kapeloi, meaning merchants or sellers, but with a somewhat negative connotation akin to hucksters or snake oil salesmen. Herodotus saw that the Lydians had become a nation of shopkeepers. They had changed mere trade and barter into true commerce. The commercial revolution in the city of Sardis provoked widespread changes throughout Lydian society. Herodotus reported with great amazement the Lydian custom of allowing women to choose their own husbands. Through the accumulation of coins, women became free to make their own dowries and thus had greater freedom in selecting a husband. New services quickly entered the marketplace. Hardly had the first shops been put into operation before some enterprising individual offered a house specializing in sexual services for the many men engaged in commerce. The first known brothels were built in ancient Sardis. In order to accumulate their dowries, many unmarried women of Sardis supposedly worked in the brothels long enough to secure the money necessary to make the kind of marriage they desired. Gambling soon followed and the Lydians are credited with inventing not only coins but dice as well. Archaeological excavations clearly indicate that gambling and games of chance such as knucklebones thrived in the area around the market. Commerce created the fabulous riches of Croesus, but he and the elite families of Lydia squandered their wealth. They developed a great appetite for luxury goods, and they became mired in an escalating game of conspicuous consumption. Each family sought, for example, to build a larger tomb than the families around them. They decorated these tombs with ornate ivory and marble, and they held elaborate funerals, burying their deceased relatives with golden headbands, bracelets, and rings. Rather than generating more wealth, they were destroying the wealth that their ancestors had accumulated. The elite of Sardis used their new wealth for consumption instead of investing it in production. Ultimately, Croesus poured his wealth into the two bottomless wells of conspicuous consumption so common among kings, buildings and soldiers. He conquered and he built. Croesus used his vast wealth to conquer almost all of the Greek cities of Asia Minor, including the Grand Ephesus, which he then rebuilt in even grander style. Even though he was a Lydian, not a Greek, Croesus developed a great fondness for the culture of Greece, including its language and religion. Because he was something of a Hellenophile, he ruled the Greek cities with a light hand. In a famous episode in Greek history, Croesus consulted the Greek oracle of Apollo to ask what chance he might have in war against Persia. The oracle replied that if he attacked mighty Persia, a great empire would fall. Croesus took the prophecy as a propitious one, and he attacked the Persians. In the bloody campaign of 547 to 546 BC, the empire that fell was the great mercantile empire of the Lydians. Cyrus easily defeated the mercenary army of Croesus, and he then marched on the Lydian capital of Sardis. While the Persian army looted and burned the wealthy city of Sardis, Cyrus taunted Croesus by boasting of what his soldiers were doing to the city and to the wealth of great Croesus. Croesus responded to Cyrus, Not mine any longer. Nothing here belongs to me now. It is your city they are destroying and your treasure they are taking away. With the conquest of Lydia by Cyrus, the reign of Croesus ended, his Myrmnidae dynasty died, and the Lydian kingdom disappeared from the pages of history. Even though the great kingdom of Lydia and its rulers never rose again, the impact of that small and relatively unknown kingdom has remained vastly disproportionate to its geographic size and relatively minor role in ancient history. Many surrounding peoples quickly adopted the Lydian practice of making coins, and a commercial revolution spread throughout the Mediterranean world, particularly to Lydia's closest neighbor, Greece.
the market revolution. Even though the great armies of Persia conquered Lydia and many of the Greek states, the highly centralized Persian system could not compete effectively with the revolutionary new mercantile system of markets based on the use of money. In time, these new markets based on money spread throughout the Mediterranean, and they continued to clash with the authority of traditional tributary states. The great struggle between the market cities of Greece and the empire of Persia represented a clash between the old and the new systems of creating wealth. It represented a clash between the market system based on democratic principles and a tributary system based on autocratic power and it was a clash that has erupted repeatedly in history right up to the modern day. Enriched by their newly emerging markets, the Greeks displaced the conservative Phoenicians as the great traders of the eastern Mediterranean. The monetary revolution sparked by the kings of Lydia ended the heroic Greek tradition and set in motion the evolution of the Greeks into a nation based on trade. With the spread of coins and the Ionian alphabet, a new civilization arose in the Greek islands and along the adjacent mainland. Coinage gave a great impetus to commerce by providing it with a stability it had previously lacked. Coins became, quite literally, a baseline against which other commodities and services could be more easily measured and exchanged. Coins provided the ancient merchants, farmers, and consumers with a permanent medium of exchange that was easily stored and easily transported. That ease of use, standardization of value, and durability as a store of family wealth attracted ever more people to the new commodity. The classical Athenians enjoyed the advantage of having discovered rich deposits of silver in Laurium, some twenty-six miles south of Athens. The mines produced silver from the 6th to the 2nd century B.C. They averaged 75 to 150 feet in depth, and some reached a depth of nearly 400 feet. The uniqueness of Greek culture, in contrast to that of Persia and Egypt, did not rest on the heavy-handed authority of a state supported by a massive army. The Greeks could not even unite into a single state. They remained divided into many, each sharing to a varying degree in the economic and cultural flowering of this new land. The power and might of Greece never depended upon the army. Not until after the apogee of classical Greek civilization did the whole area unite under one leader and one army when King Philip of neighboring Macedonia conquered the city-states and when his son, Alexander, made his brief but spectacular path of conquest first around the eastern Mediterranean and then to the Indian subcontinent. The greatness of Greece came as a byproduct of the monetary and mercantile revolution from Lydia, the introduction of money, modern markets, and wholesale and retail distribution. Money made possible the organization of society on a scale much greater and far more complex than either kinship or force could have achieved. Kinship-based communities tend to be quite small. Bands of sixty to a hundred people tied through kinship and marriage to similar neighboring bands. The power of tributary systems and the state to organize humans proved far greater than mere kinship. A tributary system could easily include millions of people divided into provinces and classes and administered by a bureaucracy with a well-established system of keeping records. The use of money does not require the face-to-face -face interaction and the intense relationships of a kinship-based system nor does it require such extensive administrative police and military systems. Money became the social nexus connecting humans in many more social relationships, no matter how distant or how transitory, than had previously been possible. Money connected humans in a more extensive and more efficient way than any other known medium. It created more social ties, but in making them faster and more transitory, it weakened the traditional ties based on kinship and political power. Money also became the medium for the expression of more values, making a great leap forward when its use was expanded from the realm of articles and commodities to something as abstract as work. A man or woman might be paid for cleaning out the stables, for a day's work at the spinning wheel, 
for help in chopping timber or in feeding the animals or for a sexual act. Work and human labor itself became a commodity with a value that could be fixed in money according to its importance, the amount of skill or strength it required, and the time it took. As money became the standard value for work, it was also becoming the standard of value for time itself. People found that money served as a convenient substitute for various services and tributes owed to political or religious authorities. Instead of giving a portion of his crops to the Lord, the peasant would simply pay a tax. Instead of giving a portion of their produce to the church or temple, people could make monetary contributions. Even service to God became valued in monetary terms. God no longer wanted the first fruits of the harvest or the firstborn animals in the spring. God, or at least the priests, wanted money. The value of a work of art or a musical performance could be as easily expressed in terms of money as could the value of a goat or an apple. Even justice itself became a monetized activity. Instead of paying an eye for an eye, a limb for a limb, or a life for a life, people could pay for their crimes with money. Money spread into marriage and inheritance through dowries, bride purchases, and cash allotments at divorce or death. With the rapid monetization of value, virtually everything could be expressed in terms of a common denominator, money. In this way, a system of shared values was established to calculate the value of virtually everything from a loaf of bread to a poem, from an hour's sexual service to taxes, or from a rack of lamb to a month's rent. Everything could be expressed within the terms of one simplified system. The Greek Genius The introduction of coined money had an immediate and tremendous impact on political systems and the distribution of power. The tensions in ancient Greek society appeared starkly in the reforms made in Athenian law by Solon, the great lawgiver, in 594 to 593 BC. Debts, for example, had become so out of control in Athenian life that Solon outlawed debt bondage and cancelled all outstanding debts in order to begin with a clean financial and commercial slate. Other politicians in the millennia since Solon have attempted to utilize the same strategy, but invariably the cancellation of debts has produced only a short-lived political reprieve and the same financial problems have soon returned. The most radical of Solon's reforms, however, was the abolition of the traditional practice of limiting eligibility for holding public office to men of noble birth. Money had a liberating effect on the Athenians, and thenceforth eligibility for election to public office would be based on landed wealth. At the time, such a move was radical and much more democratic than the older system. Money was helping to democratize the political process. It was destroying the old aristocracy based on inherited rights, relationships, and offices. Democracy arose primarily in city-states like Athens, which had a strong market based on solid currency. Of all the Greek cities, Sparta most resisted democracy, coinage, and the rise of a market system. Legend maintains that the rulers of Sparta allowed only iron bars and spear tips to be used as money. This permitted some internal commerce, but effectively minimized private commerce outside the city-state. Not until the 3rd century BC did Sparta begin to mint its own coins. The vibrancy of the revolutionary spread of commerce among the Greeks produced new temples, civic buildings, academies, stadia, and theaters, along with a body of glorious art, philosophy, drama, poetry, and science. The center of the classical Greek city was not the palace of a great king, the fortress of the army, or even the temple. Greek public life centered on the agora, the marketplace. Theirs was essentially a commercial civilization. After thousands of years of empires throughout the world, the marketplace emerged during the Greek era and changed history. Every great civilization prior to Greece had been based on political union and force backed by military might. Greece, which by then was unified, arose from the marketplace and commerce. 
Greece had created a whole new kind of civilization. The wealth generated by this commerce expanded the leisure time of the Greek elite, thus allowing the opportunity to create a rich civic life and to pursue social luxuries including politics, philosophy, sports, and the arts, as well as good food and festive celebrations. Never before in history had so many people had so much wealth, yet in a world with only a few luxury goods, they spent that wealth on leisure consumption. Scholars still today mine the rich intellectual deposits of words and ideas laid down by these Greeks, and their era marks the beginning of the academic disciplines of history, science, philosophy, and mathematics. The emergence of the money system and its sibling, the public market, imposed a new kind of mental discipline upon human beings. Long before people needed to become literate, the market had made it necessary for them to be able to count and use numbers. People were forced to equate things that had never before been equated. It is often difficult for us to think back to the pre-monetary era, since we are so accustomed to thinking in terms of groups, sets, and categories of things. Counting existed long before money, but outside of the city it had only limited utility. A good shepherd did not need to know only how many cows or sheep were under his control. He had to recognize each one by its appearance, sound, and hoofprint. It did not help him to know that one cow was missing. He needed to know which cow was missing. Knowing that particular cow, its appearance, its history, and its individual habits, the herdsman knew if she was likely to be in the bush giving birth, or if she had wandered back to the waterhole for one more drink. He knew where to look for the cow and how to spot her if she had joined another herd. The use of counting and numbers, of calculating and figuring, propelled a tendency toward rationalization in human thought that shows in no traditional culture without the use of money. Money did not make people smarter. It made them think in new ways, in numbers and their equivalencies. It made thinking far less personalized and much more abstract. Throughout most of human life, religion used stories and rituals to appeal to emotions such as fear of the unseen, or to greed to have control over the invisible, to have eternal life, or some other commodity otherwise unobtainable on earth. Political institutions also appealed to emotions, most often to people's fear of outsiders or of their own rulers. Money and the institutions built on it respond primarily to the intellect rather than to the emotions. Money and the culture around it force a kind of decidedly logical and rational intellectual process, unlike any other human institution. As Georg Simmel observed in The Philosophy of Money, the idea that life is essentially based on intellect, and that intellect is accepted in practical life as the most valuable of our mental energies, goes hand in hand with the growth of a money economy. Through the rise of their new money-based economy, the Greeks were changing the way people thought about the world. These new ways of thinking and organizing the world gave rise to new intellectual occupations. Simmel wrote that, those professional classes, whose productivity lies outside the economy proper, have emerged only in the money economy. Those concerned with specific intellectual activity, such as teachers and literary people, artists, physicians, scholars, and state officials. The First Economists the ancient Greeks recognized air, water, fire, and earth as the four natural elements from which all substances were made. For many of them, however, money constituted a fifth, albeit cultural rather than natural, element. This was in keeping with a Greek saying, Krimata aner, money is the man. In Greek texts, we see myriad perspectives in the words of individual citizens and even slaves who wrote their own plays, poems, and philosophical dialogues. The Greeks bubbled over with records of the most mundane aspects of daily life at home or in the vineyard, as well as with speculations about everything from the origin of life to the fluctuating price of wheat. The philosophical trinity of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle seems to exemplify the classical age. 
but just how representative were they of the spirit and culture surrounding them? After all, the Athenians themselves condemned Socrates to death. In general, the philosophers constituted a rather aberrant part of the Greek psyche, a psyche that offered a much more practical bent than that seen in the great works. Xenophon probably best exemplifies the character of classical Greek culture. He followed many pursuits over the course of his adult career as a politician, teacher, general, and writer, but he may be described best as a practical philosopher. On a military expedition to Persia, he and his fellow Athenian mercenaries defeated their enemies, but their leader, Cyrus the Younger, died in battle. This left the Greek mercenaries stranded hundreds of miles from home in an enemy nation. The Greek forces, known in history as the Army of Ten Thousand, put their trust and their lives in the hands of Xenophon, who successfully led them on a three-month journey back through hostile lands to their Greek homeland. Like many famous generals, he later wrote a best-selling book about his adventure. In the Anabasis, Xenophon described the long campaign. But unlike Homer, Xenophon did not make himself or his fellow officers into heroes of the type described in Homer's works. As a practical man, he recognized that the focus of the story was the soldiers themselves. Without fancy phrases or high-flown rhetoric, the Anabasis probably represents the best Attic prose ever written. In some aspects, Xenophon, the practical man, equally as comfortable with workers, soldiers, and farmers as with scholars, seems very much a predecessor to the more modern minds of Michel de Montaigne, Johann von Goethe, and Benjamin Franklin. In the midst of his civic duties and commercial work, Xenophon wrote another book, Economics, in which he described in detail the running of a home. In writing this book, he introduced the word oikonomikos, economics, which meant skilled in managing a household or a state. Managing a home, women's work in the Greek world, was certainly nothing that Homer would have shown the least interest in doing. For Homer, women were trophies of war that enhanced a hero's honor. Sacrificial offerings in hard times, or mere domestic props, who wove and waited eternally for their fathers, husbands, and sons to return from their latest raid or campaign. Even though Xenophon was not a feminist of the modern sort, he took the practical work of the household very seriously, and depicted the woman as the queen bee of a hive. He filled his book with the simplest, most practical information on how to arrange a home, train servants, store wine and foodstuffs, and impose order on every aspect of the domestic economy. While the wife ran the household, the husband tended the farm and managed his own business, as well as the civic business of the polis or city-state. Like many books of its day, economics is presented in the form of a dialogue, this one between Socrates and Iscomachus, one of the richest businessmen of Athens. In economics, however, Socrates the philosopher does not loom quite so large or appear quite so clever as he does in the better-known Socratic dialogues written by Plato. Instead, Iscomachus, the simple man of business, has much more to say and emerges as the hero of the story. Iscomachus did not attain a very important place in literature or philosophy, and even he admitted that with his wealth and simple lifestyle he was not well liked by many people. On the scale of literary value, Xenophon's works cannot compare with those of Homer. Iscomachus is certainly no Agamemnon or Achilles. Yet practical citizens like Iscomachus pushed and pulled the classical Greek world to the high pinnacle of commercial and artistic success that it attained. Most Greek scholars lacked Xenophon's wide involvement in war and peace, and they did not share his interest in financial activities. With an attitude that presaged that of many generations of scholars to come, both Plato and Aristotle, his student, had great difficulty with some of the concepts of money and the market. Plato, ever the dictator in moral issues, wanted to outlaw gold and silver as well as foreign money. According to his work, The Laws, in place of real money, there should have been some valueless coins, a kind of token or government script, to keep records among tradesmen. Anyone returning from a foreign port with money should have been forced to surrender it upon arrival. According to Plato, 
No honest man could ever be rich, since dishonesty always paid better than honesty. Consequently, the richer a man was, the less honest and virtuous he must be. In Plato's view, people should be punished if they attempted to buy or sell their allotted land or home. Plato's proposals for the regulation of the market seem harsh to us, even in a century of some strictly planned economies. In Book Eight of the Laws, for example, he writes that the market should be controlled by wardens who would inflict punishment on anyone violating the rules, of which there were many. Aside from the retail sales made by neighborhood vendors, Plato would permit three product-specific markets to be held each month, one every ten days, and people would have to buy supplies sufficient to last them a month. The first market would sell grain, the second, held ten days later, would sell liquids, and the third would sell livestock, slaves, and other related products, such as hides, textiles, and clothes. Aristotle never shared the totalitarian proclivities of Plato, but he did have some odd ideas about markets. He did not believe that everyone in the marketplace should be charged the same price. To him it seemed only natural that people with more money should pay higher prices than poorer people. He did not see impersonal market principles in operation. He saw individual relationships. The outcome of the interaction, according to Aristotle, should be determined by the status of the participants, not by the value of the merchandise. For him, the purpose of the market was not merely to exchange goods, but also to satisfy greed. Consequently, the market catered to a basically undesirable human instinct and had to be monitored carefully. Aristotle viewed the operation of the marketplace in personal rather than abstract terms. Even though he was certainly capable of abstract thought, we can see in his works the struggle of a person trying to understand the newly emerging phenomena of money and markets. Prior to the invention of money in the form of coins, the chapters of history overflow with stories of many civilizations on different continents speaking different languages and worshipping different gods but we see in virtually all of them a common pattern. Whether we consider the ancient Egyptians or the Aztecs, the Hittites or the Babylonians, the Cretans or the mysterious people of Mohenjo-Daro, we see that they all appear to have risen only to a similar level of civilization. It is almost as though each of them encountered the same invisible wall, which they were unable to penetrate. They developed their own architecture and religion, science and commerce, poetry and music, only so far before they stagnated. The Greeks, however, broke through this barrier. Suddenly, architecture, philosophy, science, literature, and the other arts and sciences soared to a level of attainment unknown to any earlier civilization. Some scholars would have us believe that this breakthrough arose from some superior quality of the Greek mind, psyche, race, or culture, from some more advanced sensibilities about humans and nature. But we see little in history before or after that time to indicate that the Greeks were unique among the many peoples of the world. What was different for the Greeks was that they lived next door to the Lydians, who invented money. Unlike other neighbors, such as the Phoenicians and the Persians, who already had sophisticated social systems without money, the Greeks were a largely unformed civilization, and their adoption of money propelled them forward past all the other peoples of the area. Greece was the first civilization to be transformed by money, but in a relatively short time, all cultures followed the Greeks down the same road and underwent the same metamorphosis. Humans have found many ways to bring order to the phenomenological flow of existence, and money is one of the most important. Money is strictly a human invention, in that it is itself a metaphor. It stands for something else. It allows humans to structure life in incredibly complex ways that were not available to them before the invention of money. This metaphorical quality gives it a focal role in the organization of meaning in life. Money represents an infinitely expandable way of structuring value and social relationships personal, political, and religious, as well as commercial and economic. Everywhere that money went, it created marketplaces. Money created a new urban geography by giving rise to towns and cities centered on the market rather than the palace. 
The exchange of goods necessitated new commercial routes over land and sea from one urban nodule to the next, thereby linking Greece and neighboring lands in a new web of commerce. This new social network, founded on commerce and money, gave rise to a new political system. Philip of Macedonia saw an opportunity to bring all these interconnected points together into a united kingdom under his rule. His son, Alexander, expanded this system to parts of the world that had not yet been fully incorporated into the new commercial culture. As he conquered new lands, Alexander founded new commercial cities, which he often named for himself, that would unite that land to the expanding commercial world of his empire. In Egypt, he founded Alexandria on the Mediterranean so that it could serve as a link between the commercial Greeks and the more isolated riches of the Nile River Valley. Because of Alexander, Greek became the language of commerce. Merchants on the Nile Delta, on the island of Sicily, along the coast of Tunisia, and in the cities of Israel used Greek as the trade language. The Greek spoken in the markets of Iberia and Palestine was not the classical Greek of Aristotle, and certainly not the ancient Greek of Homer. The merchants used a simple, almost pigeonized form of shop Greek, but this language proved capable of conveying great ideas far beyond the needs of simple market exchange. The marketplaces of the Mediterranean became focal points for discussing a new kind of religion. The followers of Jesus used the simplified market Greek to spread their ideas from one market center to another. His disciples and followers spoke in the marketplaces of cities such as Ephesus, Jerusalem, Damascus, Alexandria, and Rome. They wrote down their stories in this market Greek, sometimes called God's Poor Greek, and their writings became the New Testament. Prior to the rise of the Greek commercial system, each country had its own gods. The gods of the Egyptians were different from those of the Greeks, the Persians, and the Hebrews. The common commercial culture, however, provided an opportunity for the rise of a common religion open to all people. Christianity blazed through the cities of the Mediterranean as a totally new and revolutionary concept in religion. It was a uniquely urban religion that had none of the fertility gods or weather gods of the sun, wind, rain, and moon that were associated with farmers. It was the first religion that sought to leap over the social and cultural divisions among people and unite them in a single world religion. Its followers actively sought to make Christianity a universal religion. They did so in much the same way that money was creating a universal economy. The coining of the first money in Lydia unleashed a revolution that began in commerce but spread almost simultaneously to urban design, politics, religion, and intellectual pursuits. It created a whole new way of organizing human life. After nearly 500 years of rapid social change, all of these forces came to focus in the rise of a new type of empire centered in Rome. This unique empire was to be the greatest extension of the classical civilization created by money, but it was also to be the beginning of the end of money as a system based on metal coins. Rome became both the climax of the classical world and its destroyer. Chapter 3 The Premature Death of Money Thy money perish with thee. Acts Chapter 8, verse 20 The ancient ruins of the imperial age lie scattered across the center of modern Rome like whale bones that have washed up on a rocky shore and been picked clean by the birds and rodents that make their nests and burrows amid the debris. The Colosseum stands as the largest of these ruins, a symbolic focus of Roman civilization at its architectural best and its moral worst. Roman engineers turned the floor of that arena into a large pool on which mock sea battles were performed, resulting in real death and blood. An extensive system of underground passageways and cages held the animals and gladiators who fought in the Colosseum, and trapped doors propelled them suddenly into the arena to the delighted roar of the ever-surprised crowds. 
Emperors imported lions, tigers, elephants, rhinoceroses, ostriches, crocodiles, bears, and other exotic animals for displays of combat against each other and against humans. Dwarfs fought bears. African pygmies faced pale Celtic giants. Gladiators chased Christians around the arena, hacking them to death or leaving them to be attacked and devoured by starving animals. Construction of the Colosseum, which was officially known as the Flavian Amphitheater of Rome, began in A.D. 69, during the reign of Vespasian, and was completed a decade later in the reign of Titus, who opened the Colosseum with a 100-day cycle of religious pageants, gladiatorial games, and spectacles. The common name by which the structure was known even in Roman times was probably derived from Colossus, in reference to the large statue of the Emperor Nero near the arena. The Colosseum held 45,000 to 50,000 spectators, and to protect them from the fierce summer sun, workers stretched a large canvas canopy over the top. During its half-millennium of use, the Colosseum underwent extensive renovation seven times, but with the fall of Rome it became a quarry for later generations in need of building stone. Today, only about one-third of the original structure remains. Despite the gory stories associated with the Colosseum and its symbolic importance in Christianity as a place where untold numbers of saints and martyrs met their grisly deaths, the Colosseum was much more a symptom than a cause of the rot of Rome. Behind the gore lies another story, one of an economy seemingly gone berserk a situation in which the bizarre entertainments of the Colosseum and the persecution of the Christians seemed normal. To understand the economic heartbeat and the story of money in Rome as well as the ultimate cause of the empire's collapse, we need to look beyond the Colosseum toward Capitoline Hill, home of the high god Jupiter Capitolinus, the official deity of the Colosseum Games. Even though it is the smallest of the seven hills of Rome, Capitoline Hill always ranked as the most important, for here stood both the great citadel of Rome and the capital, the main temple of the empire. The temple served as home to the king of the gods, Jupiter Optimus Maximus, who occupied the center of the temple, and the side chambers honored Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, and Juno, the sister and consort of Jupiter, as well as the mother of Mars. Together, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva constituted the Roman trinity, known as the Capitoline Triad. But each one came in several different aspects, with a different surname for each aspect. Money occupied a sacred place in many temples, but particularly in the one dedicated to Juno Regina, the highest Roman goddess, who reigned as the Queen of Heaven and occupied a position much like the goddess Hera, wife of Zeus, in Greek mythology. Juno represented the genius of womanhood and was the patroness of women, marriage, and childbirth. As Juno Pronuba, she watched over marriage negotiations. As Juno Lucina, she protected pregnant women. And as Juno Sospita, she presided over labor and childbirth. As an extension of her role as protector of women and guardian of the family, Juno became the patroness of the Roman state. According to Roman historians in the 4th century B.C., the irritated honking of the sacred geese around Juno's temple on Capitoline Hill warned the people of an impending night attack by the Gauls, who were secretly scaling the walls of the citadel. From this event, the goddess acquired yet another surname, Juno Moneta, from the Latin Monere, to warn. As patroness of the state, Juno Moneta presided over various activities of the state, including the primary activity of issuing money. In 269 BC, the Romans introduced a new silver coin, the denarius, which they manufactured in the temple of Juno Moneta. The coin bore the image of the goddess and her surname, Moneta. From her first name, Juno, comes the name of the month of Junonius, or June, the most auspicious month for marriage. Also from Moneta came the modern English words mint and money and, ultimately, from the Latin word meaning warning. Cognates in other European languages also derive from Moneta, including the Spanish moneda, meaning coin. 
From very early classical times, money showed a close relationship to the divine and to the female. We can still see that connection in money-related words in European languages, which are frequently feminine in gender, as in the Spanish la moneda and the German die Mark and die Münze, coin. The frequent melting and reissuing of coins kept the mints at the temple of Juno Moneta in nearly continuous operation, whether the supply of gold and silver increased or not. The coins seem to have flowed out of the mint in a constant stream, and it is from the Latin word curere, meaning to run or to flow, that the modern word currency is derived, along with other related words such as current and courier. The devalued coins gushed like a great river from Capitoline Hill throughout the entire empire. Today, the site of the temple of Juno Moneta, the source of the great stream of Roman currency, has given way to the ancient but ugly brick church of Santa Maria in Aracelli. Centuries ago, church architects incorporated the ruins of the ancient temple into the new building. However, with so many more attractive and impressive sites scattered throughout the city, the site of the ancient mint now attracts scant attention. An Empire Financed by Conquest Rome developed the most sophisticated economy of any civilization up to that time. Only a few centuries after the minting of the first coins in Lydia, the Greeks had spread the money economy throughout the Mediterranean. The Romans, in turn, carried it across most of southern and western Europe. As no other empire had done, Rome organized an immense area and operated it according to a new system that borrowed heavily from the tradition of ancient empires, but combined that tradition with revolutionary new ideas based on markets and money. Rome built the world's first empire organized around money. Whereas the great Egyptian, Persian, and other traditional empires had largely rejected money in favor of government as the main organizing principle, Rome promoted the use of money and organized all of its affairs around the new commodity. The Roman Empire reached its economic apogee sometime around the reign of Marcus Aurelius. For the first time, virtually all of the Mediterranean as well as many of the adjacent lands found themselves united under a single political ruler, the Roman Emperor. Unification provided protection and therefore encouraged trade. It also promoted the standardization of products and measurements and increased the kinds and the quality of money available in the marketplace. Most of the commercial growth of Rome occurred during its Republican era, prior to the rise of Julius Caesar and the long line of emperors to follow. Caesar and the early emperors showed a keen awareness of the value of commerce and markets for their imperial power and using this knowledge they managed to sustain and even improve upon some of the republican achievements. Despite the commercial success attained during the early imperial era, later emperors showed little significant or enlightened interest in commerce. Their fame and glory came from the military and from conquest, and their riches too derived much more from the achievements of the army than from those of the merchants. As long as the empire continued to expand, the emperor could appropriate the wealth of the newly conquered lands and use it to finance his army, pay for the government, and support whatever projects he might dream up. Each conquest brought in a new surge of gold and silver loot, as well as slaves for sale in the markets. It also gave the emperor new soldiers to train and turn against the next enemy. Unlike Athens and Sardis, Rome produced very little of anything nor did it serve as a major mercantile crossroads of commerce. Rome was simply an importer of wealth. What came into Rome stayed there. As H. G. Wells wrote in The Outline of History, Rome was a political and financial capital, a new sort of city. She imported profits and tribute, and very little went out from her in return. Rome had discovered money, not just wealth and tribute, which all civilizations had coveted, but money that could be used for speculation, buying and selling land, and which supported a whole new equestrian class that rivaled and irritated the traditional patricians. As Wells wrote, Money was young in human experience and wild, 
Nobody had it under control. It fluctuated greatly. It was now abundant and now scarce. Men made sly and crude schemes to corner it, to hoard it, to send up prices by releasing hoarded metals. Roman emperors did not operate on a budget. A few of them saved, but most spent whatever they could get. The acquisition of each new kingdom or province produced a temporary jump in imperial Roman income and subsequently in expenditures. Government spending doubled from 100 million to 200 million sesterces with the acquisition of the treasury of the kingdom of Pergamum in 130 BC. A sesterce equaled one-fourth of a denarius. By 63 BC, the budget had grown to 340 million sesterces following the conquest and looting of Syria and so it continued with the conquest of Egypt, Judea, Gaul, Spain, Assyria, Mesopotamia, and all the other nations along the Mediterranean. During the reign of Augustus, when the empire reached its zenith, the cost of government surpassed a billion sesterces for the first time. After the death of Augustus, the profligate spending on useless military campaigns, building projects, and personal pleasure by his successors Caligula, Claudius, and Nero became increasingly difficult to calculate. Conquest and pillage proved capable of financing the empire for only so long. The Roman legions had soon conquered and looted all the wealthy areas around them. By the reign of Trajan, from 98 to 117, the cost of conquest had surpassed the value of riches it brought into the empire. For new conquests, emperors had to probe rather marginal areas, such as the British Isles and Mesopotamia, where the cost of the conquest proved hardly worth the expense, and where the natural resources and the goods generated by the area did not suffice to pay for the garrisons necessary to occupy and guard it. Rome produced little and once it had looted the lands around it, the empire developed a growing imbalance of trade as it continued to import goods from Asia. Unable to offer quality manufactured goods in return for these imported goods, Rome had to pay in gold and silver. This created a drain of bullion, causing the emperor Tiberius to complain that our wealth is transferred to foreign and even hostile nations. In A.D. 77, Pliny the Elder complained that as much as 550 million sesterces a year went to India to pay for luxuries. By far the highest expense of the Roman Empire arose from the financing of its huge and widely dispersed army. As the empire's borders expanded, the long and twisted lines of communication and transportation could no longer hold it became increasingly difficult for the emperors in Rome to retain the loyalty of soldiers who were recruited from many different nations, spoke many different languages, and served far from the city of Rome, which few of them would ever see. Even after the emperors stopped conquering new territories, they had to maintain a massive army and, frequently, utilize it to put down rebellions and fight off the invading tribes who constantly tested the Roman resolve to defend its borders. Despite its declining ability to produce revenue for the state, the army continued to grow in size. Even during the 3rd and 4th centuries, when the geographical size of the empire declined, the number of soldiers more than doubled, from approximately 300,000 to 650,000. Military equipment and weapons became steadily more elaborate and expensive as the army required more horses for transportation over longer inland routes and as military tactics shifted to an increased use of mounted cavalry in place of the traditional Roman reliance on marching infantry. The new equipment and horses further increased the military budget and strained the imperial treasury. The Government Glut although considerably smaller in number than the army. The bureaucracy of Rome increased at roughly the same rate even as the empire was shrinking, and it became a paid institution during the time of Augustus, who began to pay officials for the public service that had been performed free during the Roman Republic. Beginning with the reign of Augustus, the number of salaried officials and assistants grew steadily. Unable to stem the imperial decline with the army, the emperors organized and reorganized their imperial administrations, searching desperately for a formula to help them overcome the mounting problems confronting them. 
They created more and smaller provinces, split the empire, and divided the job of ruler between an emperor and two or more Caesars, who acted as assistants or regional emperors. Each change, however, added a new layer of administration to the hierarchy and created new regional and local capitals, along with all the supernumeraries, palaces, temples, and other public buildings to which even regional capitals aspired. Despite the constant stream of organizational reforms, officials were rarely cut from the public payroll. Instead, more were added. According to the best available evidence, during the reign of Diocletian alone, the government bureaucracy may have doubled in size. Faced with climbing government expenses, emperors searched for new revenue and new ways to make the existing revenue stretch further. Nero began to tamper with the coinage itself. In A.D. 64, in a naive attempt to deceive the populace, Nero decreased the silver content in the coins and made both the silver and gold coins slightly smaller. By collecting the existing coins and reminting them with his portrait bust but using less silver, Nero produced a momentary surplus of silver and gold. The same pound of silver that had formerly produced 84 denarii now produced 96, giving Nero almost a 15 percent profit. He similarly increased from forty to forty-five the number of golden aurei, manufactured from a pound of gold, thus rendering the coins about eleven percent less golden. When pressed for yet more money, subsequent emperors followed Nero's strategy and continued the debasement of the nation's money supply. By using the available supply of silver and gold to produce more coins, the emperor had more coins to spend without raising taxes. Increasing the number of coins, however, did not actually increase the amount of money. During his reign, Nero had reduced the silver content of the denarius to 90%. By the time of Marcus Aurelius, the denarius had only 75% silver, and by the end of the second century, Commodus had reduced the content to only 67%. Then, when Emperor Lucius Septimius Severus raised the soldiers' pay, he was forced to reduce the silver content of the denarius to less than 50%. Caracalla introduced an entirely new coin called the Antoninianus, or double denarius, which contained even less silver but had a face value worth two of the old denarii. By the reign of Gallienus, from 260 to 268, the Antoninianus contained less than 5% silver. Thus, over the course of 200 years, the silver content was cut from nearly 100% to virtually nothing. The amount of silver previously used to mint a single denarius eventually produced 150 denarii. And as the silver content decreased, the price of goods increased in direct proportion. Wheat that had sold for one-half a denarius in the second century increased to one hundred denarii a century later, a two hundredfold increase. So long as the emperors maintained the backing of the army, no other power in Rome seemed capable of challenging them. With such vast political power, the emperor's greed pushed them toward the acquisition of ever greater riches. In addition to seizing the wealth of the foreign peoples conquered by their armies, the emperors coveted the great riches generated by agriculture and commerce within their own empire, and they found new ways to acquire it. From the reign of Augustus, if not before, the tax income of the empire was derived from two primary sources. The tributum capitis was a poll tax paid every year by each adult between the ages of twelve and sixty-five. The tributum soli was an annual property tax on all land, from forests to croplands, as well as on ships, slaves, animals, and other movable property. This tax seemed to equal approximately 1% of the total property value. The brunt of this tax burden fell much more heavily on agriculture than on commerce, therefore encouraging commercial activity. Most of these taxes went into the treasury of the central government located in Rome, so cities and provinces levied their own taxes to cover civic projects and salaries. Additionally, they created city and provincial taxes on goods being transferred in and out of their territory. These two primary taxes sufficed as long as the army brought in great amounts of loot from its conquests, 
but they began to prove insufficient as government and military costs rose. The emperors had to impose new taxes. They increased taxes on land, with the result that farmers abandoned the less productive fields and agricultural output therefore declined. The emperors turned increasing attention to taxing commerce and inheritance, going so far as to create a sales tax. In the quest for greater tax revenues, Tiberius ordered each man in the empire to take his wife and children with him to the community of his birth in order to make a census from which a head tax would then be made. According to the Gospels, it was during this time that Joseph of Nazareth returned to his natal city of Bethlehem with his bride, Mary, who then gave birth to Jesus in a stable. Not only did imperial Roman taxation play an odd, indirect role in the birth of Christ, but the New Testament contains repeated references to Roman taxation, to the resentment it caused, to the people's hatred of tax collectors, and even to discussion of whether or not the followers of Christ should pay taxes. Jesus settled this question in the affirmative by showing his followers a coin bearing a portrait of the emperor and then commanding them to Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Luke chapter 20 verse 25 Christianity was born just at the beginning of the protracted economic struggles of the Roman Empire, and although few could have suspected it at the time, the new religion would play an important role in that struggle only a few centuries later. In the third century, the emperor ordered an indictio, a special and supposedly temporary levy to requisition oil, wine, wheat, meat, leather, and clothing for the support of the army. These levies soon became a new layer of permanent taxation, very similar to the tributes demanded in the older palace economies. The small traders and merchants bore an increasingly larger tax burden from the oppressive Chrysargeron tax on manufactured goods and retail business. Although this tax yielded relatively little for the national coffers, it did great damage to the artisans and small traders throughout the empire. The more people produced, the more taxes they paid. By the time of Diocletian, many Roman subjects were not earning enough money to pay their annual taxes. In order to meet their annual tax assessments, they were forced to sell their animals, tools, or even the land itself. Increasingly, those smaller merchants who lacked land had no alternative but to sell their own children, and sometimes even themselves, into slavery to pay their taxes. Thus, more and more families were reduced to poverty. With fewer external sources to exploit, the government found increasingly grotesque ways to exploit its own citizens. One simple method arose from the ancient practice of confiscating the property of anyone judged to be a traitor to Rome, or, more accurately, to the emperor. Soon the emperors used the accusation of treason as a ploy to confiscate the property of anyone rich enough to attract the attention of the emperor, but not close enough to him to maintain his favor. Caracalla, for instance, raised the pay of the army by fifty percent in order to ensure its support then financed much of the increase by confiscating the property of the growing number of people whom he judged disloyal to him. Late in the fourth century, the Roman soldier and scholar Ammianus Marcellinus wrote one of the first histories of the Roman Empire. He recognized that the empire had already peaked and attributed its decline to taxation and the bureaucracy. Even Emperor Valentinian III recognized the difficulty when he said that if we claim these expenses from the landowner in addition to what he pays already, such an exaction will crush his last feeble strength. If again we demand them from the merchants, they will inevitably sink under the weight of such a burden. After making this rational and compassionate observation, however, Valentinian imposed a new sales tax. As taxes increased, the emperor and his favorites were exempt from taxes and enjoyed an ever more luxurious life, while the farmers, tradesmen, and craftsmen who created the abundance lived in abject poverty. The entire economy focused on maintaining the government. In the Roman Empire, one did not complete the journey along the path to riches and fortune by hard work, through agriculture or commerce, or even through birth into a noble family. 
Rather, one completed the journey by becoming a favorite of the erratic emperors, thereby receiving appointment to high office and thus being entitled to claim or steal large sums of money. Among the elite, the taste for luxuries grew continuously. They eschewed simple linen and woolen garments in favor of silk imported over thousands of miles and at great cost from China. They used large quantities of Arabian perfume and incense. They wore increasing amounts of gold and silver jewelry, as well as amber and furs from the Baltic and other precious stones from throughout the empire, and they used more and more cosmetics from Anatolia. Money changed hands many times as these goods traveled laboriously along caravan routes to the most distant parts of the empire. But the money eventually left the Roman Empire in order to pay for the goods at their sources in China, India, Africa, and the Baltic. The desire for these luxury goods consumed ever greater resources, and it created a drain of gold and silver from Europe to Asia that was to continue almost until the 19th century. The Roman desire for Asian luxury goods created the first great trade imbalance on a global scale. Because the Romans produced comparatively little, they had little to offer on the world market other than gold and silver in exchange for the luxury goods of Asia. The continuing desire for Eastern goods enriched the ruling Andhra dynasty of South India and the Han dynasty of China. The extent of the trade between Asia and Rome in ancient times became evident in recent decades when archaeologists and builders discovered some of the largest caches of buried Roman coins as far away as southern India. The First Welfare State The elite associates who surrounded the emperor were not the only people to benefit from Roman successes. Beginning in the days of the Republic, before the foundation of the Empire, Roman politicians found that they could often increase their power by bribing the masses with bread and circuses. In addition to the exotic free entertainments that were staged in the Colosseum, the politicians exempted free citizens of the city of Rome from taxation and gave them heavily subsidized or even free wheat, paid for by taxes and tribute seized from the hinterlands of the Empire. This practice quickly became institutionalized as a public dole. When Julius Caesar first came to power, nearly one-third of the people, approximately 320,000, received free wheat on the public dole. But through skillful maneuvering, he reduced the amount by more than half to a still substantial 150,000. After Caesar's assassination, the numbers started to climb once again, and the benefits increased. In addition to wheat, Emperor Severus gave the people of Rome olive oil. From time to time, emperors gave cash payments as part of the dole. Emperor Aurelian, who acquired the title Restorer of the Empire, changed the allotment of wheat to a ration of bread so as to spare the masses the expense of baking. He also subsidized the price of wine, salt, and pork for the masses in the city of Rome. Like people anywhere, once the tax burdens became too high in comparison to the benefits and services offered by the government, the Roman subjects found ways to avoid the taxation. Commerce declined. People produced more of what they needed for themselves and traded less on the open market. While the poor suffered from heavy property taxes, the latifundia, the great landed estates grew greatly, particularly those that had been granted a tax-free status. The high taxes induced more peasants to abandon their land and move to the tax-free estates, where they at least had a steady supply of food and the essential goods produced on the estate itself. As people left the small farms and towns, the large estates grew. And finally, without sufficient commerce to keep them alive and functioning, the great cities began to decline and to fall prey to marauding tribes. Even though no one at the time thought in terms of economic policy, it was the cumulative actions of the government that strangled the economy of Rome and of much of the rest of the Mediterranean and European world as well. The emperors saw the signs of death in the economy and proposed strenuous measures to revive it, but these measures served only to worsen the situation. Diocletian, who ruled from 284 until 305, was in a sense the first modern ruler to attempt to regulate and fine-tune the economy in recognition of the fact that it was the true engine of empire. 
In order to preserve the system, in 301, Diocletian issued his Edict of Prices, which ordered a freeze on all prices and wages. In practice, however, rather than freezing prices, the edict prompted merchants and farmers to withdraw their goods from the market. Production declined. Diocletian then ordered all male citizens to follow the occupation of their fathers. A merchant's son must be a merchant, a farmer's son a farmer, and a bureaucrat's son a bureaucrat. Soldiers' sons had to be soldiers, thus creating a hereditary military class. Even the sons of the workers who produced coins had to become mint workers. Diocletian's edict forbade the heavily burdened farmers from selling their land, thus permanently tying them to the same plot of land, a practice that foreshadowed the age of feudalism. The empire began to take on the characteristics of a static, caste society, a tendency that grew even stronger in medieval Europe. In the last centuries of the Roman Empire, the emperors operated without a workable currency. Like the ancient empires that had preceded it, Rome turned to conscription and forced labor to meet its needs. The government often would not allow its citizens to pay taxes in the debased money that it still issued. Instead, officials demanded payment in goods, crops, or labor. As tax policies continued to suppress productivity and commerce, the emperors found it increasingly difficult to supply their armies and the bureaucracy with the equipment and goods necessary to rule the far-flung but diminishing empire. The markets had withered. Even the emperor could no longer depend on the open market to supply him with the sandals, armor, weapons, saddles, tents, and other goods that an army needed. Out of desperation, Diocletian created government-sponsored workshops to manufacture armaments and supplies. As privately financed shipping and other transport enterprises declined, Diocletian also had to create government transport companies to move the goods that were manufactured in the workshops. Well before the end of the third century, these changes made the emperor and the government the greatest manufacturers in the empire, in addition to being the largest owner of land, mines, and quarries. Step by step, the imperial government took over the direct administration of the economy and crowded out the small, independent merchants, landowners, manufacturers, and entrepreneurs. The government workshops and transport systems never functioned as efficiently as the older ones, which had been based on a network of relations among many different merchants. The creation of these workshops further stifled commerce and drove private entrepreneurs either out of business or into total dependence on government contracts. An increasingly greater portion of the economy fell under direct control of the bureaucracy which consumed ever more of the national output of agricultural and manufactured goods. By its last decades, Rome had become another state-administered economy, an empire without money and markets. It had reverted to a palace system more like that of Pharaonic Egypt or Imperial China than that of the Republican system on which it had been built. Profits from Persecution as the economy of the Roman Empire continued to deteriorate, the desperate emperors searched for even more radical solutions outside the economic realm. To ensure the support of the people while increasing his power over them and the army, Diocletian ordered all citizens to worship him as a god. Then, in 303, he began the horrendous persecution of Christians that was to last for a decade. The persecution of the Christians added money to state coffers and provided plenty of victims for the shows in the Colosseum. In the short term, Diocletian's measures and those of his successor, Constantine, helped to contain the increasing cost, but they further stifled the economy. The efforts of Constantine, who ruled from 306 to 337 to revive the empire, were even more drastic because he looked increasingly beyond the economic world to the sphere of religion to find a solution to the empire's problems. After supposedly receiving a vision of the cross with the words, In hoc signo winces, in this sign you will conquer, just prior to a major battle, Constantine reversed the religious policies of Diocletian and ended the persecution of Christians. He then changed the course of Roman religious history in 313 by issuing the Edict of Milan, granting Christians freedom to practice their religion and returning their confiscated property to them. 
Even though Constantine himself remained an unbaptized pagan, in 325 he presided over the Council of Nicaea, which adopted a common theology for all Christians and produced the Creed of Nicaea, a statement of beliefs that faithful Christians of many denominations still recite today. Constantine recognized that the persecutions had provided very little benefit to anyone. As it did with all traitors, the state had confiscated much of the Christians' property. But the small sect had relatively little property or wealth. The persecution of a religious group, however, proved to be a bizarre new tool crafted by the state, and once it was devised, the state looked for new reasons to use it. If the emperor could not obtain much property from the Christians, then he needed to target a wealthier group from whom to confiscate property. Constantine found that wealth in the many well-endowed pagan temples throughout his empire. Unable to finance his administration from taxation, and unable to loot new lands, Constantine began confiscating the riches in the temples of his own empire. He conducted a systematic looting of these temples, and with the gold and silver he minted gold coins to finance the construction of his new capital, Constantinople. The building of the new capital cut off the money supply to Rome and further depressed the economic condition of the Roman lands. Although it is difficult to determine the precise motive after the passing of so many centuries, it may well be that Constantine's desire to acquire the wealth of the great temples played an important role in his support of the Christians and his eventual conversion to their religion. No matter what his motive, he certainly benefited greatly from the confiscation of temple wealth. Constantine waited until he lay dying before converting to Christianity and allowing himself to be baptized in 337. He left Christianity as virtually the official religion of the empire and, in so doing, further strengthened the position of the emperor in the imperial system. With the empire firmly established in the east, the western Mediterranean and Europe fell increasingly into chaos, even while continuing in name as the Roman Empire for more than another century. Because the peasants lived under such an onerous tax burden from their own government, Many of them welcomed conquest by barbarian tribes, who offered them far more freedom than was allowed by the Romans. They joined the barbarians, eagerly slaughtering their own rulers and looting the remaining cities of the empire, including the once mighty imperial city of Rome. In the fourth century, as the western half of the empire decayed, the mint in Rome ceased production of its totally debased currency. The Ostrogoths captured much of Italy and ruled from Ravenna making the mint there the primary one for their kingdom. When the Byzantine ruler Justinian I conquered Italy, he used the mint in Rome to produce some coins for the Byzantine Empire, but it operated as a mere subsidiary workshop for Constantinople. The making of coins in Rome had come to an end, and with it, the classical economy. By A.D. 476, the date of the second sacking of Rome and the date usually given for the collapse of the empire, the classical money economy that had survived for barely a thousand years also collapsed. So completely had the Roman economy deteriorated that almost a thousand years would pass before the money economy returned in full force. During the long period known as the Dark Ages and then the Middle Ages, money played only a wispy shadow of the role it had held in classical Greece and Rome at their height. After more than a thousand years of using coins in a culture based on city life, people retreated into a rural and virtually moneyless economy. The Road to Feudalism Today, scattered across the face of the former Roman Empire in Europe, from England to Italy, stand many great country estates, manors, chateaux, castles, and monasteries. During the nearly 1,000 years from the fall of Rome in 476 until the Renaissance around 1350, these estates served as centers of productivity and power that created one of the greatest rural civilizations ever known. The medieval era, which might also be called the manorial era because of the importance of manners, represented a major departure from classical Mediterranean culture. Whereas classical culture focused on the city, Medieval culture focused on the country manner, whereas classical culture emphasized commerce, 
medieval culture emphasized self-sufficiency. And whereas classical economy focused on money, medieval economy focused on hereditary services and payment in kind. Medieval culture, then, departed radically from that of the classical era, especially in that the medieval world virtually gave up the use of money. Rather than collect taxes in coins, landowners required payment in crops and service from the peasants. Rather than manufacture trade goods, each manor sought to be as self-sufficient as possible by producing its own food and clothing and even by making its own tools. No longer able to sell their services, people became serfs who were bound to the land. Even slavery virtually ceased during this era, with the exception of criminals, pagans, and Muslim captives taken in war. Because of a decline in education, fewer people could read or figure numbers, which made them all the more suspicious of and reluctant to use coins. Coins continued to be minted during the medieval era, but they varied greatly in quality from region to region and from year to year. They were often made to resemble classical Greek or Roman coins, but had frequent misspellings and were easily counterfeited. The general quality of money dropped so low that the average merchant, as well as the illiterate peasant, needed to be extremely cautious when using coins of any type. The struggle between the tributary empire and the market system seems to have been won by the empire. Under Roman hegemony, government had defeated and apparently destroyed the market system itself. The Romans seemed to have inadvertently managed to do what the Persians had attempted but failed to accomplish in their years of war against the merchant cities of Greece. Despite the virtual death of coinage systems in Western Europe, a reasonably healthy system of coinage continued to operate in the eastern Mediterranean under the aegis of the Byzantine emperors at Constantinople. Money did not grow or develop more complicated institutions, but at least it did survive. After centuries of slumber, the system gradually returned to life during the era of the Crusades, when Western Europeans invaded the Muslim lands of the East. Money acquired a newly important role in financing the extensive new trade routes opened between East and West, and in financing the large military expeditions that were launched over great distances for long periods of time. Chapter 4 Knights of Commerce In faith there is profit. Saikaku Ihara On Tuesday, May 12, 1310, French soldiers loaded fifty-four bound men onto carts and took them into the country outside of Paris, where they stripped off the men's clothes and tied them to stakes surrounded by piles of wood. As the prisoners vociferously screamed their innocence, the guards lit the wood beneath them. The flames crawled higher, singeing their hair and lapping at their flesh. The heat caused huge blisters to erupt and their skin to split open as their fat liquefied and ran down their limbs in delicate rivulets of flame. The roar of the flames gradually drowned out the screams of the burning men. With this mass execution of the Knights of the Temple in the bucolic fields near the convent of Saint Antoine, Europe's first international banking system began to crumble. Even though most of the men burned that day had not been the top leaders of the financial enterprise, the system never recovered from the much publicized execution of its members and the accompanying public humiliation of their enterprise. Within another four years, even the once powerful leaders of these men met the same fiery death on an island in the Seine River, and their entire banking system collapsed with the extinction of their order. The Virgin Bankers the first major banking institution arose not from the merchant community, but from an odd and seemingly unlikely order of religious knights known as Templars. Founded in Jerusalem around 1118 by Crusaders, the military order of the Knights of the Temple of Solomon dedicated their lives to serving the Church and, specifically, to the task of liberating the Holy Land from the infidels. The Templars later became businessmen, who ran the world's greatest international banking corporation, which they operated for nearly two hundred years. During that time they laid the foundation for modern banking, but they did so at a huge price to themselves. 
their success led not only to the destruction of the order, but to the torture and public burning of its leaders as well. Recruited largely from among the younger sons of nobility, who inherited no titles or riches, the knights pledged themselves to a life of devotion to the church. They lived adjacent to the ruins of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, and from this location they derived their name. They undertook the special obligation of maintaining the safety of the highways for pilgrims coming to the Holy Land. The Knights Templars did not pursue an easy life, at least not in the early years. Although they fought strenuously, they ate only two silent meals a day while listening to scriptural readings. They ate meat only three times a week. As a sign of their chastity, they dressed in white mantles emblazoned with a large red cross. They kept their hair short and tonsured like other monks. Married men could join the order, but they had to live chaste lives apart from their families and, even so, could never don the traditional white mantle reserved for the brothers who lived as perpetual virgins and never married. All knights had to stay away from women and could not kiss any female, even a family member. To forestall any potentially inappropriate interaction, the order did not have a female branch, and, unlike other orders, it did not allow youths to enter. As a final precaution against sin, the Templars slept in shirt and pants with a cord around their waist to remind them of their vow of chastity. They kept a candle burning in their room throughout the night to discourage any immoral acts, whether alone or with someone else. In the twelfth century, According to an eyewitness account, the knights went into battle in silence, but at the moment of attack they burst loudly into song with one of the psalms of David, Not unto us, O Lord. They maintained a strict code of warfare that virtually precluded surrender or defeat on the battlefield. Because of their willingness, even eagerness to die, the Templars were among the most feared warriors in the world. The Templars served as the romantic model for the knights in Richard Wagner's nineteenth-century opera, Parsifal. Even the strictest and most well-constructed codes, however, contain some cracks that expand and widen with the passage of centuries, until the original structure is eventually altered beyond recognition. Though founded in complete poverty, a sequence of papal bulls gave the order the right to keep all spoils that they captured from Muslims during the Crusades. Like virtually all religious orders, they also accepted gifts and bequests from the faithful back home. The most infamous of these gifts came from King Henry II of England, who donated money to the Templars in atonement for the murder of Thomas a Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, by four of Henry's knights in 1170. The king donated enough money to support two hundred knights a year in the Holy Land, and he left in his will an additional fifteen thousand marks for the Templars and another order, the Knights Hospitallers. Through the years, the Templars acquired more land and valuables, all designated to support the work of the order in Palestine. The Knights regularly transported the proceeds of their European estates to their headquarters in Jerusalem. Because the Templars owned some of the mightiest castles in the world, and because they constituted one of the fiercest fighting forces of the time, their castles served as ideal places in which to deposit money and other valuables. The fierce and respected Templars also offered an ideal means of transporting such valuables over long distances and even across the Mediterranean, since they exercised responsibility for safety on the highways and in the shipping lanes. A French knight could deposit money or take out a mortgage through the Templars in Paris, but receive the money in the form of gold coins when needed in Jerusalem. The Templars, of course, charged a fee for the transaction, and since they paid out in different currency from what they received, they could take an additional cut of the money for the exchange. In addition to serving as a depository for and a transporter of treasure, the Templars administered the funds gathered from religious and secular sources to finance the Crusades. They also made loans to kings, including Louis VII of France, and to those knights who needed funds for themselves and their retainers when going on a crusade. Knights who were not members of the order customarily stored their valuables in a fortress of the Templars, 
leaving on file as well their last will and testament, for which the order was to serve as executor if the knight did not return. The order frequently held and supervised mortgages and other financial affairs for kings during their absence, as when Philip II of France left the Templars in charge of revenue from his lands when he marched away in the Crusade of 1190. The Templars' castles soon became full-service banks, offering many financial services to the nobility. The Templars' headquarters in Paris became one of the greatest treasure houses in Europe. To ensure scrupulous honesty, the order forbade its knights to own money themselves. This prohibition was so strictly enforced that any knight who died with unauthorized money on his person was considered to have died outside a state of grace. He was denied a Christian burial and thus, according to their religion, condemned to eternal damnation. Such strict rules and beliefs kept pilfering and even petty dishonesty in check throughout the history of the order. Over the course of the thirteenth century, this order of educated and honest knights served as financial agents for the papacy and handled many accounts for the French kings, including their household accounts. As bankers to the kings and popes, the Templars grew into an institution somewhat akin to a modern treasury department, except that they did not collect taxes. At their maximum strength, they employed approximately 7,000 people and owned 870 castles and houses scattered across Europe and the Mediterranean, from England to Jerusalem. Despite the dedication of the Templars to their mission, they steadily lost ground in Palestine to the Egyptian Mamelukes, an army of fierce military slaves, most of whom had been recruited from Christian families and had converted to Islam. In 1291, the Templars lost the city of Acre, their last stronghold on the mainland, and fled to the island of Cyprus. Despite the military setback, their financial enterprises continued to flourish. The Dangers of Success Despite the poverty of its individual members, the order grew rich and fat, but seemingly beyond the control of any one nation or king. They became an easy target, waiting for a sufficiently strong and greedy monarch to tackle them. That monarch finally appeared in the dashing form of King Philip IV of France, known as Philip the Fair because he was considered the most handsome man in the world. In 1295, Philip took the management of his finances out of the hands of the Templars and established the royal treasury at the Louvre in Paris. He then began a campaign aimed at taking over both the Templars' extensive properties and treasure. Philip's desperate need for money arose after he tried a trick that Nero had pulled a thousand years earlier. He debased the silver currency of his realm in order to produce more coins by reminting the old ones with less silver. In the short run, he gained from this maneuver, but problems quickly arose when the peasants started paying their taxes with the new coins containing less silver. Like Nero, Philip ended up with more coins but less money, since each coin now had less buying power. Philip then sought to reform the French currency by returning it to its original value, and in 1306 he recalled the coins and reminted them at the value set in 1266 by Louis IX. Philip repeatedly altered the value of the currency in the years that followed, but each alteration hurt him in the end. He needed a constant supply of gold and silver in order to restore the adulterated currency. In order to meet his constant need for money, Philip turned on the Lombard merchants, whose goods he seized. He attempted to tax the clergy, and then he turned on the Jews, expelling them in July 1306 after seizing their property. Even the wealth of the Jews and Lombards combined with his tax on priests failed to meet the needs of Philip's growing government and his thirst for power. He needed massive amounts of money. The greatest concentration of wealth in Europe lay just outside Paris, in the well-fortified castle that served as the main treasure house for the Templars' wealth. To obtain that wealth, however, the king would have to destroy the order, and he proved willing and able to do so. In 1307, Philip issued a secret order that began with a bitter denunciation of the order. 
a bitter thing, a lamentable thing, a thing which is horrible to contemplate, terrible to hear, a detestable crime, an execrable evil, an abominable work, a detestable disgrace, a thing almost inhuman, indeed set apart from all humanity. With these words, Philip set the stage for the skillful propaganda campaign he needed to wage in order to topple and loot the greatest financial institution in the world. Rather than make war on the Templars, the agents of Philip IV coordinated a surprise raid in which they arrested the unsuspecting leaders of the order throughout France. Philip timed his raid so as to arrest Jacques du Molay, the elderly Grand Master of the Order, who had come to France from his headquarters in Cyprus to attend to some business for the Templars and Pope Clement V. Philip's allies immediately unleashed a public relations war against the Templars, accusing them of the worst sorts of crimes in order to incite public horror and outrage against them. The charges resulted in lengthy court proceedings that culminated in a dramatic series of trials, during which French prosecutors accused the Order's leaders of heresy, apostasy, devil worship, sexual perversion, and a whole catalogue of the worst offences against the medieval code of morality. Under fierce torture, the elderly officers of the Order signed confessions that provided lurid details about their activities as idol worshippers, profaners of sacred objects, conspirators with the devil, and perpetrators of sexual deviance upon one another. The charges included accusations of Templars having sex with the corpses of noblewomen, worshipping a cat, eating the bodies of dead knights, and making bonds of blood brotherhood with Muslims. Other witnesses alleged that Templars seduced virgins in order to produce infants, whose body fat the knights could render to make a sacred oil for their idols. Philip's prosecutors accused the Templars of promoting sodomy within the order and they cited this sin in particular as the reason why the Templars had lost their crusades in the Holy Land and control of Jerusalem. The fall of Jerusalem thus paralleled the biblical story of God's wrath and the subsequent destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for similar offenses. This charge of sodomy offered even the simplest mind an explanation of why God would have allowed the Muslims to conquer Jerusalem. The charge made understandable a history that otherwise confounded the faithful who had prayed diligently for so many years for liberation of the Holy Land. Philip's prosecutors even used the very wealth of the order against them. All Christians believed that Satan had appeared to Christ in the wilderness and offered him the wealth of the world if he would but renounce God and follow Satan. Christ had refused and lived in poverty. The Templars, by contrast, had grown to be the richest group on earth and lived in affluence, if not genuine luxury. According to the prosecutors, the Templars, then, must have made a pact with the devil in order to have become so wealthy. After the initial shock of arrest and torture, most of the Templars recanted their bizarre confessions and defended themselves and their order with the bravery and strength by which the Knights Templars had earned their reputation on the battlefield. Instead of Muslim soldiers, they now faced judges, prosecutors, and torturers who spoke their language and professed to worship their God. In their hour of need, the Templars received no help from the Mother Church that they had defended with their lives for so many years. For nearly a decade, the French authorities tortured the Templars to extract confessions from them. When put on public display, however, the Templars would rally and recant their confessions, whereupon a new round of torture and confession would commence. Bowing to pressure from the French monarchy, Pope Clement V abolished the order in a papal bull, Vox in Excelso, on March 22, 1312. The Pope found it more prudent to sacrifice the knights of his church than to defy the will of the French king. In abolishing the order, the Pope hoped to maintain some control over the Templars' property, which he transferred to other religious groups, most importantly to the Hospitallers, another order of religious knights. Four years after the mass execution of the Templars outside of Paris, Grand Master Jacques de Molay and Geoffroy de Charnay were taken from their cells and burned to death on a small island in the Seine River on March 18, 1314. 
Thus, King Philip crushed completely the greatest and most powerful international financial institution of the time. The French government, thwarted in its attempts to obtain the entire treasury of the Templars in Paris, demanded a large portion of it from the Hospitallers as compensation for the money spent on investigations and trials of the Templars. After seeing what had happened to their Templar brothers, the Hospitallers quickly yielded to Philip's menacing threats to purify their order with the same fire that he had used on the Templars. Pope Clement V and King Philip IV quarreled over the money and property of the order, but not for long. Within the same year, 1314, both the Pope and the King lay dead. Many observers, forever seeing the will of God in earthly happenings, concluded that God had called the Pope and the King to appear with the burned Templars before the throne of God for final judgment. On earth, it mattered little who was to blame, since nothing could change what had happened. The total triumph of King Philip over the Knights Templars marked a clear increase in the power of a national government that would not tolerate an international financial rival as powerful as the Templars. Whether Philip and Clement had lived or died, their struggle was settled clearly in favor of the state. For the first time since the fall of Rome, a government in Western Europe had successfully reasserted its authority and power to control financial institutions, and it had broken the commercial power of the Church. Never again did the Church or its institutions exercise so much clout over the financial activities of Western Europe. The destruction of the Templars, however, created a financial and commercial void that the Church was too weak and fearful to occupy again, and that government was not yet large and strong enough to fill. The Rise of the Italian Banking Families At this pivotal moment in European economic history, when the financial power of the Church had waned and the power of state had not yet grown strong enough to replace it, a new group of men and institutions stepped into the breach. The families of the North Italian city-states of Pisa, Florence, Venice, Verona, and Genoa began to offer the same services that the Templars had offered, albeit on a much more modest scale at first. These families created a new set of banking institutions outside the immediate control of church and state, yet with close ties to both. A new system of private family banks arose in northern Italy. These banking families did not operate under a religious mission or within the severe limits regarding money imposed upon the Templars by the Church and by Christian doctrine. The Italian banking families dealt as readily and easily with Muslims, Tartars, Jews, and pagans as they did with Orthodox and Catholic Christians. The banking network of the Italian merchant families soon stretched from England to the Caspian Sea, and they financed trading missions throughout the known world, from China to the Sudan and from India to Scandinavia. They offered a steady supply of credit at rates lower than those tendered by most other financiers, and they controlled more money and lent it at consistent, if not always low, rates. Unhindered by the religious principles of the Templars, they had only one ambition, to take home a profit. The Italian families differed in other important ways from the religious knights. They did not operate from well-fortified castles, nor did they travel in heavily armed convoys. Instead, they lived and worked in the marketplace among the people, catering as much to the needs of small landlords, merchants, and vendors as to those of the aristocrats and high officials of the church and state. Whereas the Templars served only the nobility, the new Italian bankers served everyone. In their financial pursuits, Italian merchants traveled to markets and fairs throughout Europe. Like other itinerant merchants and vendors, they set up tables or large benches from which they not only traded their goods, but also exchanged money, made loans, arranged to take money as payment for a debt for someone in the next town, and performed other related financial services. The modern word bank comes from the way in which these early money merchants did business. It is derived from a word meaning table or bench the prop that literally formed the base of their operations at the fairs. From Italian, the words bank, banco, and banque 
soon spread into other European languages and eventually throughout the world. Money lending in some form or other seems to have been known for as long as there had been money. But the bank became something more than a money lending institution, because the bankers dealt not so much with gold and silver as with slips of paper representing the gold and silver. Banking, as practiced by the Templars, faced a great limitation in that the Church forbade usury, the charging of interest on loans, and getting around that barrier proved to be one of the greatest obstacles that the Italian families had to overcome in order to build their extensive banking enterprises. The Christian prohibition against usury was based on two passages in the Bible, Take thou no usury, or increase, but fear thy God. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Leviticus, chapter 25, verses 36 through 37. And, He that hath given forth usury, and hath taken increase, shall he live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations, he shall surely die, his blood shall be upon him. Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 13. The scriptural prohibition never completely eradicated usury, but it certainly hampered it. Jews often served as moneylenders, since, in the eyes of the church, they were already condemned to eternal damnation. But if Christians lent money for interest, the Catholic Church excommunicated them, thereby barring them from all services and from Holy Communion. The law stated quite specifically that, Quid quid sorti asedit usura est. Whatever exceeds the principle is usury. The Italian bankers, however, found a way around this prohibition, and thus grew rich without endangering their souls. Usury applied only to loans, so through the fine technical distinction between a loan and a contract, the Italian merchants built a whole edifice of borrowing and lending, behind a façade that showed no sign of usury. They scrupulously avoided making loans. Instead, they traded bills of exchange. A bill of exchange is a written document ordering the payment of a certain amount of money to a certain person at a certain time and place. The Latin name for this document is cambium per letras, which means exchange through written documents or bills. This transaction was a sale of one kind of money for another kind that would be paid in another currency at a specified future date. A merchant in need of money went to a banker in Italy. The banker gave him the necessary money in cash, in the florins of Florence or the ducats of Venice, and they both signed the bill of exchange, whereby the merchant agreed to pay a slightly higher amount of money in another currency at the next fair in Lyon or Champagne, France. The merchant did not have to go to the fair personally to pay the bill. Both parties knew that if the merchant failed to show up at the fair, the office in Florence would collect the money owed it. The Italians did not invent the bill of exchange, but they put it to a new and more profitable use. Bankers received a fee for changing the money, and therefore were organized into the Guild of Currency Exchange, the Arte del Cambio which was separate from the lower-class moneylenders and pawnbrokers so despised by everyone. In practice, the bankers became lenders to the rich, while the moneylenders and pawnbrokers continued to lend to the poor. These bills of exchange functioned well in Christian countries, but they did not work in the Muslim world. The Koran prohibited usury even more strictly and clearly than the Bible. It forbade any kind of profit on the exchange of silver or gold. Muhammad said, Sell not gold for gold except in equal quantity, nor silver for silver except in equal quantity. The Koran specifically prohibited bills of exchange by condemning the sale of anything present for that which is absent. The Magic of Bank Money The use of bills of exchange had another beneficial effect on commerce. It helped to overcome a major obstacle of the time, the awkwardness of coins and the difficulty of dealing with them in bulk. Coins were heavy, difficult to transport, easily stolen, often counterfeited, and subject to dozens of other problems on the poorly guarded highways, in the lands of corrupt nobles, and at the sometimes poorly administered fairs and markets that emerged as the new commercial centers of Europe. 
the new Italian bank money boosted commerce by making it transpire much faster. In 1338, a shipment of coins required three weeks to wend its way from Rouen in the north of France to Avignon in the south, a distance of just over 400 miles, and the shipment faced the hazard of being lost, stolen by robbers or pilfered by the very people hired to transport it. By contrast, a bill of exchange could be sent in a mere eight days, and if it was stolen, the thief could not redeem it. Bills of exchange, in other words, moved faster and protected everyone involved in the transaction. Despite the extra cost of 8% to 12%, a bill still proved cheaper than the cost of hiring an armed escort for a shipment of gold and silver coins or bullion. Bills of exchange helped to free money from its spatial limitations. The bills of exchange also freed money from the confines of any single currency and from the shortages of gold and silver that could occur in the country that minted the coins. The merchant could designate the bill in Venetian ducats, Saxon thalers, Florentine florins, Milanese testones, French écus, or any of dozens of other currencies. The supply of bills that could be written in that currency no longer depended upon the supply of gold and silver that those states had. It merely depended on the merchant's confidence in the currency. If they lost confidence in one currency, they quickly began to write their bills of exchange in another. The bills of exchange created new money by breaking through the physical limitations imposed by the use of specie or metallic coins. The bills themselves circulated among merchants as a kind of paper money. Although the activities and services of the banks remained confined to a relatively small number of people and did not involve the average peasant or city dweller, the banks had, in effect, found a way to put more money into circulation. Under the new system, a bag of a hundred florins that might once have sat idle for years in a noble's strongbox could now be deposited for safekeeping in an Italian bank that had access to branches across the continent. The bank then lent the money and circulated the bill of exchange as money. The noble still had his 100 florins, which were now on deposit in the bank. The bank had 100 florins on its books. The merchant who borrowed the florins was richer, and the person who held the bill of exchange now had 100 florins as well. Even though only 100 gold coins were involved, the miracle of banking deposits and loans had transformed them into many hundreds of florins that could be used by different individuals in different cities at the same time. This new banking money opened vast new commercial avenues for merchants, manufacturers, and investors. Everyone had more money. It was sheer magic. The Italian merchants conducted banking as a private enterprise rooted in families such as the Peruzzi, Bardi, and Acciaiuoli of Florence, who had relatives serving in branch offices from Cyprus to England. Together, the banking families of Italy financed the English monarchy under Edward I and Edward II in the campaigns to conquer Wales and Scotland. By backing the English monarchy, the Italian banking families made more money than simply what they received in interest on these high-risk loans. With the English kings as their debtor, they acquired special access to the English markets, and in particular their special relationship with the monarchy gave them a near monopoly in the marketing of English woolens on the continent. According to contracts signed between the Pope and the banking houses of Peruzzi and Bardi on June 9, 1317, the money collected from all the Catholic churches in England and destined for the Pope would be deposited with the Peruzzi and Bardi representatives in London. They kept the actual money in London, but forwarded a bill of exchange to Italy, where the banks paid the Pope from their treasury. The Peruzzi and Bardi bankers in London then used the money deposited with them by the church to buy English woolens, which they shipped to the continent for sale. The bank kept the money from the sale in Italy. The money thus passed back and forth between Italy and England and among the markets on the continent. It moved from the coffers of the state to those of the church. Then it went to the bankers and back to the merchants, where it could be paid as taxes before starting its journey anew. Yet all this could be done without the use of a single coin. The movement was of columns in registers and account books. 
Banking represented a commercial innovation that stimulated commerce in all its phases and benefited everyone, from the peasant to the king and from the local priest to the pope, wherever the banking families opened an office. Bills of exchange provoked a boom in the European markets by helping to overcome the vastly insufficient supplies of gold and silver coins. By making the system work much faster and more efficiently, they increased the amount of money in circulation. The bills of exchange themselves became money as they circulated to third, fourth, and fifth parties in much the same way that we accept paper currency today. The bills circulated throughout Europe as a specialized type of paper currency accepted by merchants in the main commercial centers across the continent. With the spread of Italian banking through Europe, the currencies of Florence and Venice became two of the standards of the continent. First minted in 1252, the Florentine coin bore the portrait of St. John the Baptist on one side and a lily on the other. This gold coin became known as the Fiorino d'Oro, or the Florin. The city issued the Florin in both silver and gold denominations, the gold having ten times the value of the silver. At a time when every city of any size or with any claim to importance minted its own coins in its own size and with its own name, the Florin of Florence, together with the Ducat of Venice, helped bring stability to the late medieval markets. The Venetian doge Giovanni Dandolo introduced the gold ducat in 1284, and it continued in use for six centuries. The Venetian ducat acquired the name Zecchino after the palace of La Zecca, where the coins were minted. The name ducat came from a Latin inscription on the coin. Like the title doge, used by the head of the Venetian Republic, ducat is related to duke and duchy from the Latin ducere, meaning to lead. The Venetian ducat remained unchanged in size and purity until the fall of the Republic of Venice in 1797. The new forms of banking money circulating throughout Europe necessitated new ways to keep account of the money's movements across so many jurisdictions and in so many currencies. Innovations in Florence produced double-entry bookkeeping, a simplified form of marine insurance, and one of the most important innovations of all, the check. In the earliest forms of banking, a person could deposit or withdraw money only by appearing in person before the banker, who would give out money only if the depositor himself verbally requested it. Written withdrawals were considered too risky, since such a request might be easily forged unless the person appeared in person before a bank clerk who could later serve as a witness if needed. Not until the end of the 14th century did the first written withdrawals appear in the records of the Medici Bank. These first checks further increased the speed and flexibility of the banking system. The Italian bankers thrived but like the Templars before them, they were ultimately undone as a result of their success and their dealings with the government. Several of the major Italian banking families backed Edward III at the start of the Hundred Years' War between England and France, but when Edward III defaulted on his loans in 1343, his bankruptcy caused the bankruptcy of the leading Florentine family banks as well as many of their depositors. The entire system of money based on bills of exchange ultimately rested on the honesty and goodwill of the participants, but when the government became too burdened by debts, it had the power to cancel them, thereby destroying the system. The banking fortunes of the Italians dissolved like sandcastles on the beach at high tide. Then, to seal the fate of Florentine banking, the Black Death appeared in northern Italy and ravaged the area until 1348. Even though the original Italian banking families brought financial disaster upon themselves and the city of Florence, banking itself survived. Their innovative practices spread to other cities and proved too beneficial for merchants to allow them to die. Genoa and Venice quickly took up the mantle of Florentine banking, and toward the end of the 14th century, Florence itself re-emerged as an international banking force. Despite great losses in the 14th century, banking revived with new vigor in the next century under the leadership of Florence's greatest banking family, the Medici, who entered banking as relative latecomers in the final decades of the 14th century. 
Even though banking emerged during the Italian Renaissance, it acquired little respect. Their work as money changers and as barely disguised money lenders placed bankers only marginally above pimps, gamblers, and other criminals. In the aristocratic system of Europe based on land and title, the possession of mere wealth had practical importance but lacked prestige. A Dutch church ordinance passed as late as 1581 prohibited bankers, along with the practitioners of other unsavory professions, from receiving Holy Communion. The law remained in effect until 1658. Many clerics also continued to condemn the collecting of interest as counter to biblical injunctions. In order to become respectable after becoming wealthy, the bankers needed to acquire the accoutrements of late medieval life. They needed landed estates, urban palaces, aristocratic titles, and high church offices. In their efforts to procure these trappings, the rich banking families of Europe created the Renaissance, and no family succeeded in it like the late-arriving Medici. Chapter 5 the Renaissance. New Money for Old Art. Bankers are just like anybody else, except richer. Ogden Nash. Some cities continuously reinvent themselves through the centuries by changing their architectural styles, their government, their religion, and sometimes even their names. Other cities remain eternally rooted in the history, culture, and ethos of a single, particular era. No city clings as tenaciously to one spot in history as does Florence, located in the Tuscan hills of Italy. Florence remains eternally the city of the Renaissance, the city of Bernini and Michelangelo, the city of the Medici and Savonarola. Even though Florence existed for centuries prior to the Renaissance and has continued for centuries afterward as a large and important city in modern Italy, its heart and façade remain pure Renaissance. Its greatest buildings and monuments arose during that era, a time when its greatest painters, sculptors, poets, and writers flourished. Too Much History for One City the Florentines claimed to inhabit the cultural capital of Italy, despite the commercial, political, and religious centers having shifted to other cities. Even though the city developed comparatively late in Mediterranean history as an outpost of Rome, the citizens pride themselves on their city's achievements and will place it second to no other city in the world, much less to another in Italy. They boast of maintaining the highest standard of art, the most magnificent architecture, the purest language, and the most glorious history. They even claim that their rather bland cuisine is more sophisticated in flavor and texture than the better-known food of the South, where the cooks apply an excess of spices, oil, and tomatoes. Florence served as the capital of the newly unified Italy for a brief time, from 1865 until 1871 until the government relocated to the ancient imperial and religious center of Rome. Through it all, Florence has produced more history, art, and dreams than one place should be allowed. Today, people make pilgrimages from around the world to experience Florence and to pay homage to the Renaissance. Students study here for a semester or a year and tourists visit for the day. They all make the same rounds to admire the cathedral, to see the great Uffizi gallery, to visit the Academy of Art, and to marvel at Michelangelo's David. They pause for a long lunch in one of the many restaurants or sip coffee at an outdoor cafe. Then they head for the many souvenir shops that offer a variety of souvenirs, from an iridescent David on a thermometer to leather tooled in gold and furniture inlaid with precious stones. Tucked in among the museums and cafes, around the corner from the restaurants and across the street from the churches are hundreds of small shops where one can change money. They are not banks, but they proudly offer their service in many languages. Geldwechsel, Cambio, Money Exchange. They trade cash or traveler's checks in dollars, marks, yen, pounds, and francs for seemingly vast numbers of Italian lira. Because banks have such short daily working hours, 
The money exchanges can charge high fees for their services during the hours when tourists most need them. In addition to currency exchange, they offer gold coins, such as the South African Krugerrand, the Chinese Panda, the Canadian Maple Leaf, and the Mexican Peso, as well as commemorative silver coins honoring everything from the Olympic Games and royal coronations to the preservation of wildlife. The money changers transact their business in small shops or even from vending booths made of reinforced metal, concrete, and thick glass. They do not have the ornate lobbies of the great banks. They do not operate from Renaissance-style buildings with grand staircases, marble floors, and gilded balustrades. Most of them do not wear suit coats and ties or the more stylish dress of the grand banks. Rather, the money changers are markedly plebeian in style and manner. Money changers have been around as long as money has. They can almost always be found near markets where merchants of different lands assemble and, in recent decades, hovering around tourist spots throughout the world. As mundane and undramatic as their daily activities and services are, the greatest banking families of Renaissance Florence came from their ranks, and they had a profound impact on art, architecture, and mathematics, as well as world finance. First Among Equals At its height as a banking city in 1422, 72 international banks operated out of Florence. Of the money-lending families there, none acquired a reputation as grand or as permanently etched in the annals of history as that of the Medici family. Chronicles of the 12th century mention a family by that name in Florence but the Medici did not emerge until relatively late in the story of banking. The merchant, Giovanni di Bici de' Medici, 1360-1429, founded the family fortune in banking. From his two sons, known as Cosimo the Elder and Lorenzo the Elder, came two lines of descendants who virtually defined the Renaissance by becoming the most important bankers and merchants, the rulers of Florence, and cardinals and popes of the church. The daughters of the family married into the royal families of Europe, and two of them, Marie and Catherine, became queens of France and mothers of kings. After coming to great power, the family claimed descent from a knight Averado, who reputedly came to Italy on a pilgrimage to Rome, but stopped in Tuscany long enough to slay a giant who had been terrorizing the peasants. The Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne then supposedly awarded the brave knight a coat of arms, bearing three red circles, representing the dents made in his shield by the giant. Some sources outside the family, however, claim that the three circles represent the three balls that have traditionally been the sign of the pawnbroker. Others say they represent three coins. The name Medici indicates descent from someone in the medical or pharmaceutical field professions that were about equal in prestige to pawnbroking or barbering at that time. The three circles on the family's coat of arms may therefore represent pills or the cupping glasses that doctors heated and applied to a patient's flesh in order to draw the bad blood up to the skin's surface. No matter what the source of the family name and coat of arms, the Medici made their money in banking gained their power in politics, and acquired glory through their patronage of art. They profited from the banking practices and procedures worked out in the previous century, but they were generally more cautious than their predecessors. The Medici dabbled in the bloody politics and unstable finances of the English monarchy. They extended uncharacteristically excessive loans to King Edward IV during the War of Roses. And when he defaulted on those loans, the Medici branch in London collapsed. Their offices in Bruges and Milan also failed due to related causes. But having learned from the experience of earlier Florentine bankers with English kings, the Medici stronghold in Florence withstood the crisis and never repeated those mistakes. When their bank attained its commercial zenith under Cosimo de' Medici, it flourished as the most important private enterprise operating in Europe. Outside of Florence, the family maintained offices in Ancona, Antwerp, Avignon, 
Basel, Bologna, Bruges, Geneva, London, Lübeck, Lyon, Milan, Naples, Pisa, Rome, and Venice. Even though the staff in most cities numbered fewer than a dozen employees, the bank provided a great variety of services not usually associated with a bank. The Medici served as merchants as well as bankers, providing their customers throughout Europe with spices from the East, olive oil from the Mediterranean, furs from the Baltic, wool from England, and textiles from Italy. Other wares ranged from the unusual, sacred relics and slaves, to the bizarre, giraffes and castrated choir boys. Despite the extent of their holdings and the diversity of their commercial services, the Medici never attained a monopoly like that of the Templars, nor did they control as great a proportion of the banking market as had the Florentine bankers of the previous era. By the time of the Medici rise, too many banks were already operating in Venice, Genoa, and in cities outside of Italy for them to exercise quite the same degree of influence. But this lack of a monopoly probably served as their protection. They operated at the center of a network of interrelated merchant and aristocratic families. They served this whole new system as the first among numerous others. Their bank reached its zenith between 1429 and 1464, under the shrewd control of Cosimo de' Medici, who oversaw the branch operations in Rome, Venice, Milan, and Pisa, as well as those in more distant offices in Geneva, Bruges, London, and Avignon. In addition to banks and land, the family held financial interests in several textile endeavors, including two wool shops and a silk shop. The Medici Bank operated until Charles VIII of France invaded Florence on November 17, 1494. A few days prior to the arrival of the French army, the Medici family was expelled from the city, and the French confiscated most of their property and left the bank virtually bankrupt. The family returned in 1530 with the collapse of the Florentine Republic, but the heyday of the Medici Bank had passed. The basis of their fortune came from what we might think of today as the private sector, something that hardly existed in any degree of importance in earlier times. The Medici, who had made their fortune and fame in the world of finance, separate from the state and church, now lost their great commercial position as bankers and merchants of importance, but they increased their prominence in a variety of church and secular offices. The great genius of the Medici family, in comparison to other rich merchant families of Florence, became apparent in their ability to use their wealth and commercial success as a means to acquire political power and aristocratic titles. They were the most upwardly mobile family of their time. Through a series of advantageous marriages, astute political appointments, and well-placed bribes over the course of several generations, the Medici managed to become one of the most powerful families in the civil and religious power structure. The Monetary Mystery of Numbers The Medici, along with the other wealthy families of Florence, financed a great revival in scholarship and later in painting, sculpture, and architecture. Today, we remember this era mostly for its great works of art, such as the many sculptures of David that can be found in museums and plazas throughout the city. The flourishing of art in Florence, however, derived from an older Florentine emphasis on education that consisted not merely of learning the classics, but also of mastering the basic skills needed by merchants and bankers, numbers and mathematics. The Renaissance began not as a movement in arts and letters, but as a practical, mathematical revival to help bankers and merchants perform the increasingly difficult tasks of converting money, calculating interest, and determining profit and loss. In 1202, Leonardo Fibonacci, also called Leonardo Pisano, after his hometown of Pisa, published Liber Abbasi, in which he introduced to Europe what we now refer to as Arabic numerals, even though the Arabs had themselves borrowed the numerals from India. This simplified system offered a great advantage over the clumsy Roman numerals, which were difficult to add and subtract, and which virtually defied multiplication and division. 
the introduction of Arabic numerals eliminated the need for an abacus, since merchants could calculate the new numbers more easily in their heads or on a slip of paper. The universities, the government, and religious authorities expressed grave suspicions of the new numbers, which came from infidels and which merchants and clerks used without the reliable abacus. In stubborn defiance of these shopkeepers' numbers, many European universities continued to use the abacus and to teach mathematics with Roman numerals until as late as the 17th century. Most governments also refused to accept the use of Arabic numerals for official purposes, claiming that they could be easily forged even by a person with little education. Even today, eight centuries after the introduction of Arabic numerals, Roman numerals carry a higher prestige in such acts as inscribing a date on a university or government building. Merchants, of course, could not afford to wait for the approval of professors and priests. They needed a practical means of calculation, even if it lacked the prestige of the classical Roman numerals, and they immediately began using the new numerical system. When merchants noted an overweight or underweight item, they marked it with a plus sign or a minus sign. These signs soon became the symbols for addition and subtraction and, eventually, for positive and negative numbers. The new numbers proved to be practical and quick, and their use spread quickly throughout the commercial sector. In the words of mathematics historian J. D. Bernal, the introduction of Arabic numerals had almost the same effect on arithmetic as the discovery of the alphabet on writing. These numbers brought mathematics. Within the reach of any warehouse clerk, they democratized mathematics. The 13th and 14th centuries produced a mathematical revolution that moved the calculation of numbers out of the secret realm of magicians and into the streets and shops of Europe, and the expansion of banking made Italy the center of this new mathematical development. The revolution erupted not so much in the discovery of new ideas as in the transmission of the arcane ideas of mathematics to common people, aided in great part by the newly developed printing press. In 1478, Treviso Arithmetic, an anonymous textbook, appeared. It was designed to teach people in the commercial trades more about numbers and calculations. The author taught the reader not merely how to add and subtract, operations that were already fairly well understood at the time, but also how to multiply and divide, and how to deal with fractions and arithmetical and geometrical progressions that were important in calculating interest. Only a small number of the best educated scholars had even a vague understanding of such abstract mathematical operations. For many students and young shop apprentices, the zero proved difficult to comprehend and utilize when there were several of them in a single number or calculation. It was easier to recognize the Roman numeral M as 1000 than it was to translate 1000 or to distinguish it from one zero 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 or one zero 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 zero. In fourteen eighty four, Nicolas Chouquet, a Paris physician, tackled this problem by writing Tripartie en la science des nombres, in which he introduced a system to make zeros more easily understood by grouping them into sets of three with a marker between each set. He even gave each set of three zeros its own name. The European languages already had names for the first set, hundreds, and the second set, thousands. But traditionally, anyone who wanted a higher number had to express it as hundreds of thousands and then as thousands of thousands. Chouquet introduced millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, and so on up to nonillion. Using the system of zeros grouped by threes, one nonillion would be written and much more easily read as one zero 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 zero. Although Chouquet used periods where we use commas today. The number represented the largest known at that time. In 1487, Luca Pacioli, a Franciscan friar, published the 600-page masterpiece Summa de Aritmetica, Geometria, Proporzioni, 
a proporzionalità, which taught the now common mathematical operations and moved the student into the greater mysteries of double-entry bookkeeping. With a book such as this, a shopkeeper required no university training to maintain an efficient and profitable business. Arab mathematicians devised algebra as a means of working with unknown quantities. The word algebra comes from al-jabr, a word used in the Arabic title of the book, Hisab al-jabr wal mukabala, The Science of Restoration and Reduction, by 9th century mathematician Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. He borrowed the word al-jabr from Arabic medicine, where it referred to the resetting or restoration of bones a process that he saw as metaphorically similar to his resetting of numbers. al khwarizmi worked in Baghdad and borrowed many of his ideas from the Hindu work of Brahmagupta. al khwarizmis work, in turn, was translated into Latin and spread throughout Europe by Gerard of Cremona. al khwarizmi also helped to alleviate some of the problems of working with fractions which were difficult enough for the average merchant to add and subtract, much less multiply and divide. Arab mathematicians also devised a sophisticated system of decimals in place of fractions. This use of decimals called algorithm, a corruption of the name al-Khwarizmi, eventually became the modern word algorithm, denoting any mechanical or recursive procedure of computation. Jewish scholars, such as Emmanuel ben Jacob Bonfils of Tarascon, introduced these Arabic ideas to European scholars around 1350. They were episodically used by other scholars, such as Regio Montanus in 1463 and Elijah Mizraki in 1532. Decimal calculation gained little attention until the 1585 publication of De Tienda by the Dutch scholar Simon Steven. 1548-1620, of Bruges, who began as a cashier in an Antwerp merchant house. Steven sought to introduce Italian methods of bookkeeping to the northern Europeans, and he published the first tables of interest so that people could understand the arcane procedure performed by bankers, moneylenders, and other creditors. In 1525, Christoph Rudolph published the first German book on algebra, introducing the sign for square root. University academics could not help but notice the great strides made in mathematics during the Renaissance, and somewhat after the fact they searched for the theoretical underpinnings of these new number systems. In so doing, they laid the foundation for a new form of science, an objective discipline based on the apparent magic of numbers. The philosophical groundwork for this mathematical method of science was largely developed by René Descartes, who published his Discourse on Method in 1637. Descartes abhorred the study of mathematics for its own sake. Instead, he sought to use it as a means of understanding the world in order to achieve practical accomplishments in nature. The use of mathematics to understand nature received a second major boost in 1686 with the publication of Principia Mathematica by Sir Isaac Newton. The rise of the money economy created a new way of thinking. As 20th century philosopher Georg Simmel wrote, Money, by its very nature, becomes the most perfect representative of a cognitive tendency in modern sciences as a whole, the reduction of qualitative determinations to quantitative ones. Money was changing the world's systems of knowledge, thinking, art, and values. Banking on the Renaissance The growth of banking that began in the 13th century greatly increased the general interest in new forms of knowledge, such as mathematics. But the interest spread to other aspects of classical learning as well, leading eventually to a revival of art in the classical style. As banking families, such as the Medici, grew wealthier, they did what most newly rich families did. They cultivated an interest in the past and connected themselves to the glories of the past through the lavish display of art and literature in their palaces. When they could not find old palaces to buy, they built new ones that looked old. They filled their homes and palaces with the art of ancient Rome and Greece, and they filled their libraries with copies of ancient manuscripts, newly translated from Arabic or from Greek and Latin. 
these wealthy merchant families could afford to finance their own scholarship and art, freeing it from the restrictive grasp of the church and its monasteries. The new humanism in art led to an emphasis on the human body, as seen in the works of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, who wrote that, The good painter must paint principally two things, man and the ideas in man's mind. The human body became the focal point of this humanistic art. The Medici and the other rich merchant and banking families of the Renaissance also used classical learning as a means to separate themselves from the religious themes that had characterized so much of European culture during medieval times. The banking families owed their power to the riches earned in their commercial enterprises. They did not owe it to the church. Their art, their home furnishings, and their building styles reached back into the pre-Christian era of Rome and Greece for inspiration. While neither anti-Christian nor anti-clerical, this new form of scholarship acquired the name humanism because of its emphasis on people rather than gods, saints, and angels. Like the banking that financed it, the Renaissance was centered in Florence. As the Medici acquired more power in Rome, several even assuming the highest church office of Pope, they took their ideas and new standards of art and scholarship into the Vatican and throughout the church. Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling, depicting the creation of man, for example, emphasized man as much as God, a radical departure from older religious art. In literature, the new humanism de-emphasized biblical scholarship and theology in favor of works about humans, such as Boccaccio's Decameron, 1353, works of secular history, such as Leonardo Bruni's History of Florence, 1429, and works on the glory of humanity, such as Giovanni Pico della Mirandola's Oratio de Dignitate Hominis, Oration on the Dignity of Man, published in 1486. The world around these authors excited their interest and inspired their genius far more than could the abstract concept of heaven or of some afterlife in another dimension of reality. Pico della Mirandola's essay echoes the theme that there is nothing to be seen more wonderful than man. And he compares man to both the animals and the angels. He explains that, At the moment when they are born, beasts bring with them whatever they possess. By contrast, whatever seeds each man cultivates will grow and bear fruit in him. If these seeds are vegetative, he will become like a plant. If they are sensitive, he will become like the beasts. If they are rational, he will become like a heavenly creature. If intellectual, he will be an angel and a son of God. The artists, merchants, writers, and aristocrats of the 14th and 15th centuries did not realize that they were living through a renaissance, since that word did not come into vogue until the 19th century. The revival of interest in the past became known as the Renaissance only after the 1855 publication of Jules Michelet's study, La Renaissance. But this is our name for their time and their culture. During the Renaissance, life and history entered a new golden age that looked forward much more than it looked back. Even though Florence and the surrounding area of Tuscany achieved a reputation for the rebirth of ancient Roman and Greek learning, it also broke from the past by giving birth to modern Italian as a language distinct from Latin. Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy is acknowledged as the first work written in modern Italian. In the works of Dante, Boccaccio, and Petrarch, the Tuscan dialect became the established literary form of modern Italian. The Renaissance flourished and spread new commercial ideas as well as art styles to France, Germany, the Netherlands, England, and even to Scandinavia. In the writings of the 16th century French essayist Michel de Montaigne, we see evidence of new ways of thinking. Montaigne reflected extensively in his writings on the marketplace and its importance in life. In writing his reflections in Essay, which he began around 1571, he is credited with inventing the modern essay. Even the word itself comes from the concept of a test, a trial, or the weighing out of something, and it was closely associated with the testing or assaying of coins and precious metals done in the marketplace. Montaigne described his work as being done in the vernacular, the style and language, of the marketplace. 
In his short essay, That One Man's Profit is Another's Loss, we see the dawn of economic awareness. He makes profit into something natural by placing it within the context of life and decay. He concludes that profit arises from desires that are often not good, much as new life arises from the decay of old matter. Montaigne rarely focused directly on money, but we see in his writing the emergence of the modern system of cost and profit values. We can detect similar developments in literature and art. Money emerges strongly as a theme in the works of Shakespeare, for example, whose characters struggle not only over honor, power, and love, but over money and wealth as well. It would have been unthinkable for a medieval bard or minnesinger to sing about money. But in a play such as The Merchant of Venice, money becomes the central focus. Most of Shakespeare's works are based on traditional themes of power and morality. But in the emerging modern world of his era, he recognized money as an important factor and considered it as much of a test of an individual's character as love and war. Soon after Shakespeare's time, money began to appear in art, particularly in that of the Dutch and other northern European painters. Artists painted bankers counting their money, and in some pictures of domestic tranquility, a box of coins can be seen on the table. People have always depicted in their art items and ideas that they prize, but with the rise of the commercial age, art shifted in focus from religious paintings, mythological scenes, and people with their horses and dogs, to portraits of people with their prized possessions, money, and the costly things it could buy. Together with banking and the Renaissance, even the name America must be credited to the vast cultural heritage of Florence. In an odd twist of fate, the name of a Florentine explorer and braggart, Amerigo Vespucci, 1451-1512, inspired the names of the two continents that constitute the New World. Vespucci was one of many Florentine merchants who traveled and explored the world. Soon after Christopher Columbus opened a route across the Atlantic, Vespucci joined an expedition that reportedly visited the coast of what is now Brazil. In his writings, Vespucci made many wild claims about places that he said he had visited but that, in reality, he probably never actually saw. His maps and writings circulated widely, leading a German cartographer to apply Americus, the Latin form of Vespucci's first name, to the newly discovered southern continent that was thought to be completely separate from the places seen by Columbus farther north. Soon, cartographers applied the designation to the new northern continent as well, giving us the new names North America and South America. In all the world, Amerigo Vespucci is the only person ever to have even one continent, much less two, named for him, and he too was a Florentine merchant. With the rise of Italian banking and the Renaissance, a new type of civilization began to emerge. It was marked by novel ways of thinking and new ways of organizing commercial life. By themselves, the bankers and their new monetary system would not have been able to create a whole new civilization. But the changes that they introduced into European life were followed by a unique event in world history. With the expansion of European hegemony to the Americas, the Europeans acquired more wealth than any other people had ever possessed. The new wealth combined with the new financial institutions created a unique hybrid system of banking that dominated the world for the next 500 years until the First World War. Chapter 6 The Golden Curse Make money. Money by fair means if you can. If not, by any means money. Horace The Quechua Indians, who dig mines and extract the minerals from the Bolivian Andes, toil beneath the ground in a twilight world of fluttering light ruled by the devil and his wife. Only the devil holds the power to grant or deny money, success, and wealth to the miners. Above ground, the miners pray to the Virgin Mary and the saints for help in solving problems of health and love but they go to the dark altars inside the mines to ask for favors from the devil and his consort. The Virgin Mary and the saints control the water above the earth and thus the crops, the animals, and fertility. But since money is derived from the gold and silver that come from the devil's domain in the bowels of the earth, 
Only the devil and his wife can bestow it on humans. In some respects, the devil of the Bolivian miners resembles the Greek god Pluto, who, as ruler of the underworld, had the power to distribute its metals and was thus also the god of wealth. Deep inside the caves, the miners erect altars to the devil, whom they call El Tio, the uncle, and to his wife, China Supe. Statues depict him with large, twisted horns rising up from his head and with bulging, bloodshot eyes popping out of their sockets. Mule-like ears flare out from his head and two long black tusks rise from his lower jaw. His other teeth are usually sharp daggers made from strips of mirrors that reflect what little light there is in the dark cave, giving the devil a smile that sparkles with menacing ferocity. He wears a large crown topped with a snake or a rampant lizard, whose mouth is open and twisted in what seems to be a scream of rage. The statue of the devil usually stands next to the rather plain figure of his wife, who has a broad moon face and a deep red complexion, and who looks somewhat like the Bolivian women one sees scurrying along the streets above ground. The miners make regular supplications before the images of El Tio and China Supe. They offer candles to the lords of the underworld, and each miner brings a daily offering of a cigarette, a libation of alcohol, or some coca leaves for the devil, and a lump of sugar for his wife. In special rituals of appeasement during times of earthquakes or tragic cave-ins, large sacrifices such as sheep or llamas must be made. In such sacrifices, blood is scattered around the altar and the shaman pulls out the pulsating heart of the sacrificial animal to spray blood in the four sacred directions of Inca cosmology. This act forms a contract, or karaku, between the worshipper and the deities. In return for the offering, the devil will grant the minor life. Such sacrifices usually occur in August, the devil's sacred month, when the miners traditionally buy their equipment and supplies for the coming year. Sacrifices to the devil also abound during the pre-Lenten carnival season, when normal restraints are loosened. According to local lore, some greedy petitioners want more than just life, more than just the sustenance to get through another day's work. They want true wealth. To get such riches, the petitioner must bring a very special offering of a fellow human being who is sacrificed in the same way as a llama. Whenever the body of a person, almost always a previously healthy young man, shows up on the mountains near the mines, and especially if he has any unusual marks, the Indians say that he was sacrificed to the devil and China Supe. Such a karaku, a golden contract, with the devil would be made only for money. For nearly five centuries, the Indians of Bolivia have mined the greatest silver deposits in the world, and for five centuries they have remained among the poorest people on earth. It is little wonder that, for them, a magical curse must be associated with the mining of silver, the minting of coins, and the making of money. All around them, the Indians see ample evidence of the success of the curse and pacts with the devil. They point to historical evidence, such as the killing of the last Inca emperor, Atahualpa, by Pizarro, who then inherited all the wealth of the Inca Empire. They point to countrymen who have made millions of dollars in the cocaine trade and who could have done so only with the help of the devil and his wife. How else could these uneducated men have defied all the efforts of the Bolivian army and the sophisticated technology of the U.S. government to capture them? Even in their own lives, the miners know that they risk sacrificing themselves to an early death by accident or from the ravages of poverty, while others, who live far away and never work in the mines, live the luxurious lives of millionaires. They insist that such inequities in wealth can be explained only by magic and special sacrifices to the devil. Treasures of the Americas after Columbus arrived in America in 1492, it took the Spaniards approximately 50 years to locate all the major treasures accumulated by the Indians. The Spaniards looted the great Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, in 1521. Soon thereafter, they raided Central America and conquered the Chipcha people of Colombia, the original El Dorado, before moving on to battle the Incas in the 1530s. 
The Spaniards melted most of the gold and silver immediately so that it could be made into ingots for efficient shipment back to Europe. They saved some of the more unusual pieces, such as a giant sun made of gold, and some of the gold and silver plants from the Inca emperor's garden, and shipped these back to Spain to give the king some idea of what kind of country they had captured for him. One description of these Indian gold and silver treasures survives. The German artist Albrecht Dürer visited an exhibition of the captured American treasures on display in Brussels and wrote, I saw the things which have been brought to the king from the new land of gold, a sun all of gold, a whole fathom broad, and a moon all of silver of the same size. All the days of my life I have seen nothing that rejoiced my heart so much as these things, for I saw amongst them wonderful works of art, and I marveled at the subtle ingenia of men in foreign lands. Soon after the exhibit, royal officials ordered that the gold and silver be melted in order to mint coins. After half a century of constant looting, the Spaniards ran out of rich Indian nations to conquer. In need of new sources of riches, they turned their attention to the source of the silver and gold, the mines. In Mexico and Peru, they found more deposits of silver than the meager mines of Bohemia and other European sites had ever produced. The Spaniards immediately expanded the mining of these deposits, and the silver mines of Mexico and the Andes made Spain the richest nation on earth. But these riches came at what ultimately proved to be a very high price for Spanish society and culture. The two primary centers for mining in America arose in Zacatecas, New Spain, Mexico, and in Potosí, Upper Peru, now Bolivia. Through the centuries, the two colonies jockeyed for the lead in silver production, their position depending on the discovery of new mines and the introduction of new technology. Despite variations in production, America remained the greatest source of silver in the entire world throughout the Spanish colonial era. As early as 1536, only 15 years after Cortes's conquest, the Spanish government established a mint in Mexico to make coins from the vast deposits of silver. Colonial officials applied for royal permission to begin issuing coins in other parts of the Americas, and the king granted permission to establish mints in Lima, 1568, and then in Potosí, 1574. At that time, Spain owned the Americas, except for the easternmost territory of South America, which became Portuguese Brazil. The monarchs owned the land by virtue of a papal bull backed by the Treaty of Tordesillas, signed on June 7, 1494, by Castile and Portugal. As God's spokesman, the Pope could assign such lands as he saw fit. But in addition to the backing of God, the two powers held the land by right of discovery and conquest. This gave them several theoretical layers with which to enforce their claim. With the backing of God and the Pope, the Spaniards and the Portuguese did not need to enact the charade of signing treaties with the native peoples themselves, as the English and other European powers later felt compelled to do in order to make their rule legitimate. Under the laws of Castile laid down by Alfonso X and Alfonso XI, the monarch could grant ownership of land to individuals, who could then buy and sell such lands. No matter who owned the surface rights to the land, however, the crown continued to own all mineral resources in perpetuity. Additionally, the crown demanded payment of 50% of any buried treasure discovered in Indian tombs, pyramids, and temples. The monarch owned many of the mines outright, but for a high enough fee, the crown's agents would lease, grant, or even sell to individuals and groups the right to mine the resources. Even after such a sale, however, the crown continued to collect a fee called the Quinto Real, the royal fifth, or 20% of all silver and other minerals. The percentage decreased in later decades. Even though the Quinto Real supposedly allowed 80% of the silver to remain in the hands of the mine owners, the government enacted restrictive laws that took away much of that as well. The miners had to buy from the royal government all of the mercury and other substances needed for the mining process. The royal government also exercised a monopoly on the trade of salt, tobacco, gunpowder, and most minerals. 
the Spanish crown acquired further profits from mining through the supplies shipped from Spain. These came from a government monopoly that charged the colonists exceptionally high prices. And, of course, the goods had to be shipped in government-controlled ships, in government-organized convoys, adding even more to the cost of the goods. On every transaction in Spain, there was a sales or gift tax called the Alcabala that gradually increased over time from 2% to 6%. This tax had to be paid on any transfer of goods, whether by barter, sale, or gift. The king exempted only the clergy from it. In 1572, the government extended the Alcabala to include all the Spanish territories in America. In addition to paying the same taxes as people in Spain, the Americans had to pay the Almo Jarifazgo, a 7.5% import tax on all goods shipped from Europe. The Spanish government also collected the diezmo, or tithe, for the church, with the officials keeping a portion of it as a collector's fee. This diezmo did not apply directly to the output of the mines, but it did apply to all agricultural products, including those used to supply and feed the miners. Indians, whether they worked in the mines or not, were forced to pay special tribute taxes in the form of silver coins. A minimum of 20% and perhaps as much as 40% of all the silver shipped to Spain from the Americas went directly into the government treasury. The remainder went into the pockets of assorted government officials and various aristocratic families who owned rights in the American mines. To keep the silver flowing, Spanish officials completely reorganized the social life of the native peoples. Upon arrival in Mexico and Peru, the Spaniards found a number of Indian societies of peasants growing crops and paying taxes and tribute to local chieftains and a central ruler. They quickly changed these independent nations into colonies organized around one single activity, the mining of gold and silver. Agriculture was important to the colonial authorities in that it produced food for the miners who could not stop mining to grow their own crops. Ranching was important in that it produced horses, mules, and oxen for transport to and from the mines and cows for dairy products and meat. Roads were important because they allowed for easy transport of minerals and men to the mines and silver to the coasts for shipment across the sea. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the production system of Indian America had centered around the family. But under Spanish administration, the hacienda became the primary focus of the production of food, men, and animals for the mines. The very name hacienda was derived from the Spanish hacer, meaning to make, referring to all the things produced on these estates. The peasants attached to the haciendas grew the crops and raised the animals that would feed the miners. They produced the mules, donkeys, burros, and oxen needed for transportation to and from the mines. They tanned the leather to make saddles, aprons, tethers, ropes, lashes, whips, and the other accoutrements for work in the mines. They chopped down the trees for mining supports and gathered the firewood and made the tallow for the torches used in the mines. They made the sacks used to haul the silver down to the coast, and they supplied the ships with the food and material needed for the return voyage to Spain carrying their heavy cargo of silver bars. The Bridge of Silver The wars and struggles among the European powers from the 16th through the 18th century focused on controlling the wealth of the Americas and the trade with Asia. First Spain struggled against Portugal, and then they both struggled against England, France, and the Netherlands. From 1500 until 1800, the mines of the Americas provided 70% of the world's output of gold and 85% of its silver. The amount of gold and silver extracted from the American mines increased in each century as new deposits were discovered from Canada to Chile. Even as late as the beginning of the 19th century, when the Spanish colonies were poised for independence, Mexico alone produced half the world's annual output of silver. The Indians who worked the mines had no way to measure the amount of silver that they produced for shipment abroad, but oral tradition maintains that they mined enough silver to build a bridge from America to Spain. The precious metals poured forth out of the mines and away from the Americas at a rate unprecedented in the history of the world. 
Spanish galleons transported the gold and silver from the Caribbean to Spain, and from there, merchants of many nations distributed it throughout Europe and the Mediterranean. From Acapulco each year, the Manila galleon sailed with its cargo of silver for the Spanish colony in the Philippines, and from Manila, other merchants traded the silver up and down the Asian coast from Siam to Siberia. Outsiders have attempted to estimate how much wealth the Spaniards and Portuguese took out of the Americas. The colonial powers, of course, went to great effort to keep the amounts secret, causing much scholastic effort to have been spent gathering and evaluating records from around the world. Researchers have measured the amount of ore mined and the amount of metal extracted. They have compared it with the food provisions for the miners and with the amount of mercury used in the treatment of ore. They have compared shipping records with the arrival records in Europe and, most importantly, with the records of the Casa de la Contratación, the bureau in charge of Spanish shipping. Scholars have dug through records, some of which were falsified, and have tried to determine how much gold and silver was pilfered or shipped illegally. Based on all of these methods, a range of estimates has emerged. Historians calculate that from the European discovery until 1800, between 145,000 and 165,000 tons of silver were shipped out in addition to 2,739 to 2,846 tons of gold. At a price of $400 per ounce, the total gold production would have a value of approximately $36 billion. Even these numbers, however, cannot convey the significance of such an amount of gold and silver. In an age without paper money, the introduction of this much specie into the monetary system had an effect that would be difficult for us to imagine. The Portuguese colony in Brazil lacked the silver of Mexico and Peru. Portuguese officials never derived as steady a flow of wealth from their colony as the Spanish did from theirs, and the Portuguese monarchs and aristocrats largely ignored Brazil in the early years in favor of their more lucrative spice trade with India and the Spice Islands. For the Portuguese government, Brazil remained a secondary colony that produced cheap sugar and bought many slaves, but supplied few of the exotic goods provided by the colonies in Africa and India. Portugal's indifference toward its American colony ended dramatically in 1695 with the first of a series of Brazilian gold booms. Prospectors found that some sections of the flat alluvial soil of Brazil harbored rich deposits of gold flecks and nuggets, the extraction of which required much work but relatively simple technology. The district of Minas Gerais, General Mines, north of Rio de Janeiro, became the center of world gold production. Unlike the Spaniards, who relied mostly on Indian labor to work their mines in Mexico and Peru, the Portuguese imported African slaves to work theirs. The Brazilian emphasis on gold mining became so obsessive and so important in the colonial economy that the Portuguese authorities made it illegal to engage in any enterprise in Minas Gerais that did not relate to or promote gold mining. Gold production in colonial Brazil climbed to its zenith in the two decades between 1741 and 1760, when it averaged more than 16 tons a year, 14,600 kilograms. The mining and transport of gold required the work of some 150,000 slaves, approximately half of the total population of Minas Gerais. Prospectors discovered other gold deposits and even precious gems farther west, in the provinces of Goiás and Mato Grosso. To the flow of gold, the Brazilians added approximately three million carats of diamonds for the treasury of the Portuguese kings. In the search for gold and gems, the Brazilians pushed ever deeper into the continent and eagerly passed far beyond the line established in the Treaty of Tordesillas to separate Portuguese from Spanish colonies. The Price Revolution, From Riches to Rags While the Spanish kings squandered their wealth on foreign adventures and wars, the Portuguese kings squandered theirs on palaces, pomp, and pageantry. The rulers wasted money on sumptuous excesses and poured money and gifts into the hands of their relatives, lovers, and other court favorites. 
the wealth proved to be a mixed blessing for the governments and peoples of Spain and Portugal. It caused tremendous inflation. The more silver people had, the more goods they wanted to buy, and the more people who wanted these goods, the higher the prices charged for them. The quantity of goods produced could not keep up with the volume of silver shipped from America. Consequently, inflation increased, thus eating away at the value of the silver and gold. Writing in 1776, Adam Smith noted that, the discovery of the abundant mines of America reduced, in the sixteenth century, the value of gold and silver in Europe to about a third of what it had been before. It is estimated that between 1500 and 1600, the first century of Spanish colonization of the Americas, prices in Spain rose by 400 percent, and for this reason these great changes are known as the Price Revolution. Although this phenomenon of inflation amazed and annoyed people, they seemed to understand it quite clearly. As early as 1556, Martín de Aspilcueta, a professor at the University of Salamanca, compiled a list of reasons why the value of money changed. The most important reason was that, in times when money was scarcer, saleable goods and labor were given for very much less than after the discovery of the Indies, which flooded the country with gold and silver. This was later amplified and explained in more detail by the French political economist Jean Baudin. A special commission, the Junta del Almirantazgo, issued a report in 1628 blaming the poverty of Spain on the riches from the Americas. The report stated that the Indies have been the cause whereby these kingdoms find themselves with few inhabitants, no silver, and a burden of commitments and expenses serving as a bridgehead for the transfer of silver to other kingdoms, all of which would have stayed in these if what went to the Indies were of our harvesting or manufacture. Spanish farmers, ranchers, craftsmen, and manufacturers produced few goods, so they had to be imported from other countries, adding even more to their cost and hastening the flow of silver out of the country to the point that it left nearly as fast as it arrived. Italy sold them glassware, Hungary sold copper, England offered woolens, and the Netherlands offered weapons. So much silver was being exported by Spain that even its shipment became difficult to arrange. Foreign shippers soon had to step in, because most of Spain's ships were occupied in the transportation of silver from America to Spain. The Spanish monarchs had exacerbated their financial situation by expelling the Jews and Muslims in 1492, the same year that Isabella and Ferdinand united the country and Columbus made his first voyage to America. Most Christian Spaniards at that time worked as peasants tilling the soil, growing wheat and olives and raising cows and goats, or else they served as soldiers. Whether soldiers or peasants, they had little education. They could not read and write, nor could they work with numbers. The Jews and the Arabs had constituted the educated class of administrators and merchants. Without them, the Spaniards proved highly ineffective in managing their financial and commercial affairs. People of many nations rushed in to help the Spaniards. Italian merchants, German moneylenders, and Dutch manufacturers quickly moved to fill the mercantile void left by the Jews and Arabs but they took their profits back to their home countries. Without a native merchant class, the Spaniards watched their silver flow through their hands and into the coffers of the other Christian nations of Europe. In describing the impact of American silver on Europe, Voltaire wrote that the wealth entered the pockets of the French, English, and Dutch who traded with Cadiz under Spanish names and who sent to America the productions of their manufactories. He added that, A great part of this money goes to the East Indies to pay for spices, saltpeter, sugar, candy, tea, cloths, diamonds, and monkeys. Silver shipments from America arrived once a year, but the kings usually spent their portion before it arrived. To do this, they had to borrow money in advance of the ship's arrival, and without knowing how much silver might be lost at sea or to pirates. At first the kings borrowed from their loyal subjects, but since they felt no obligation to pay it back, the already overtaxed subjects hid their money and quit lending it. The kings then turned to foreign creditors. Although the Spanish monarchs ruled over one of the largest and richest empires in the world, 
they were constantly at the mercy of their bankers and creditors in Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands, at rates of interest up to 18% per annum. In 1575, Philip II refused to pay his creditors, and they stopped funds flowing to his army in the Spanish Netherlands. The army revolted the following year and sacked the city of Antwerp to make up for their loss of salary. This disrupted trade and taxes, causing further harm to Philip and costing him considerably more than if he had continued to pay the Genoese bankers in the first place. King Philip II borrowed money constantly to finance his adventures. He launched his expensive and disastrous Spanish Armada against England in 1588, and Spain pursued campaigns against the Protestants in the Netherlands in 1568 and 1618 fought revolts in Germany in the 1540s and 1550s, and launched wars against the Ottoman Turks in the 1530s and the 1570s. By the 1640s, many of the Spanish provinces themselves had risen up in rebellion against the harsh taxation and repressive government of the Habsburg monarchs. In some years, the crown's expenditures surpassed three times its income. Aristocrats and commoners also borrowed lesser amounts, making Spain one of the world's greatest debtor nations, and eventually resulting in national bankruptcy. The first bankruptcy came in 1557, during the reign of Philip II. Another followed in 1597, the year before Philip's death. The noble families of Spain were steeped in too much aristocratic pride to bother themselves with mundane business and cheap commerce. They continued to picture themselves and their class as conquerors of the world, whose lives centered on swords, horses, tribute, and booty. They did not see themselves as mere merchants who transported cloth or grain by mule train and old barges to be sold to wholesalers on rat-infested wharves, or to barter and truck with common people in the muddy markets of the city. They too borrowed heavily in order to keep up their lavish forms of conspicuous consumption. Large-scale public and private debt exacerbated the inflation. Gold had much the same effect on Portugal that silver had on Spain. It created an appetite for new goods, but Portugal produced little other than wine, cork, and cattle. To meet their needs, the Portuguese turned to the English for manufactured goods. They formalized this relationship by treaty in 1703, and even more Portuguese gold and wine began to flow to England. The trading partners of Portugal and Spain benefited from the influx of gold and silver from America, but they experienced much the same kind of inflation that had beset the Iberian countries. John Kenneth Galbraith noted that by the end of the 17th century, prices in England had risen to three times what they had been before the first trading voyages to America. During the same period, wages had only doubled. The mining and trade of America's gold and silver continued very much under the control of the Spanish and Portuguese governments and that of their agents. In keeping with the economic thinking of the time, silver and gold were regarded as the keys to wealth. For most people, they were wealth itself. The man with the most silver or gold was the wealthiest, as was the country with the most gold and silver. The rich officials and court favorites of Spain and Portugal used their wealth to buy what they wanted, soldiers and equipment to fight their wars, and luxurious silks, porcelains, and spices for themselves and their palaces. They used the precious metals to decorate their homes and cathedrals and to adorn themselves, their furniture, and their coaches. Baroque Gold Like many people when offered the opportunity, the Spaniards indulged themselves in the ostentatious display of gold. The Spanish Baroque and Rococo eras have probably never been matched for the lavish use of gold in decoration. They cover their walls with gilded molding of fruits, cherubs, urns, and flowing garlands. They applied gold to window frames, mirrors, and wall hangings. They used gold leaf on doors and balustrades. They covered their coaches with gold, and they applied it to the wooden frames of chairs, sofas, beds, chests, and cabinets. They dripped it on their hunting guns and knives. They put it on their belts and shoe buckles. They made dishes and snuff boxes from it. They covered their books with gold filigree and added golden hinges for their bindings. 
They embroidered golden threads into their clothing and the upholstery for their chairs, as well as into their tablecloths, draperies, and tapestries. They lavished yet more gold and silver on the elaborate clothing of their footmen, coachmen, and dining-room servants. It is said that some of the altar objects in the Cathedral of Toledo were made of gold that Columbus himself brought back from America and gave to Queen Isabella. In Rome, tradition maintains that the ceiling of the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore was covered with the first of the American gold donated to Pope Alexander VI. The new wealth of the Americas revitalized the languishing Catholic Church and financed its forays against the rising tide of northern Protestantism. As the Protestants denounced ostentation and turned toward starkly simpler forms of architecture and decoration, the newly enriched Catholic Church encouraged an exaggerated level of decoration as a way to keep and inspire its followers. In imitation of their monarchs and the Pope, the wealthy aristocrats lavished even more gold and elaborate decoration on their churches and cathedrals than on their palaces. They hid the ceilings and walls of old churches behind flocks of golden angels, holding golden banners and attached to one another by long garlands of golden flowers, leaves, and baskets of golden fruit. From every corner and from behind every pediment peeked the cute faces of mischievous golden cherubs armed with golden bows and arrows. The faithful parishioners covered the statues of their favorite saints with gold leaf and then clothed them in silk garments embroidered with gold and silver threads. To accentuate the glittering gold inside the churches, architects cut new windows out of the walls, opened skylights in the roof, and installed gilded mirrors in the niches. This allowed reflected light to strike the gold and make it sparkle and glitter dramatically in the newly brightened and sunny church interior. Artisans made the excess gold and silver into baubles for the table, decorations for the body, and objects for devotion. They did everything they could with it, except eat or invest it. This era, known as the Siglo de Oro, century of gold, marked the apogee of Spanish civilization. Its most treasured and abiding accomplishment, however, proved to be not its gilded architecture, but its gilded literature. In literary terms, the Golden Age opened in 1522, when Garcilaso de la Vega began to write, and it closed in 1681, with the death of playwright Pedro Calderón de la Barca. The Money Culture Even though Spain and Portugal encountered many difficulties managing the gold and silver that they extracted from the Americas after 1500, Many other parts of the world profited handsomely. The spread of American gold and silver across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans opened the modern commercial era. During the 16th and 17th centuries, silver coins and even gold coins became more readily accessible than at any prior time in history. No longer would the use of precious metal coins be limited to wealthy individuals. Now the baker could use coins to buy flour from the miller who used them to buy wheat from the farmer, who used coins to buy bread from the baker. The butcher, the weaver, the wheelwright, the seamstress, the dyer, the coachman, and the cooper began to buy their materials and sell their products more often for money and less often in barter for other goods and services. Increasingly, taxes and tithes were paid in money rather than in produce. Just as the banking revolution had increased the amount of money in circulation and brought merchants from all over Western Europe into a single commercial and financial system, the increase of silver coins brought the lower classes into the system. The discovery of the great wealth of the Americas produced a far more immediate impact on the lives of common people than did the banking revolution. Professions that had traditionally depended upon money, such as soldiers, artists, musicians, and tutors, now became even more focused on payment rather than on exchange of services such as room and board or rations paid in bread, alcohol, and salt. Even prostitutes and innkeepers became less willing to accept produce and goods in payment. They too wanted gold coins or at least silver ones. Particularly in the 17th century, the new allocation of wealth gave rise to a middle class of merchants. They in turn spawned entirely new professions centered on money. 
As banking expanded, brokers appeared who specialized in the buying and selling of anything from real estate to shares in a trading voyage to China. Insurance men specialized in spreading out the risk of one voyage over many. All of these new professions created new sources of wealth that, until now, had been small and unimportant or entirely unknown in aristocratic society. In feudal society, wealth had been derived from titles, privileges, and land bestowed by the monarch or taken by force during war. Now men without title, grant, or land had more money to spend than had the old aristocrats. In an era when warfare was increasingly the responsibility of a professional army rather than of the aristocratic class, the rising merchants found themselves able to buy large amounts of land that did not need to be seized in warfare. In the new social system, title and privilege increasingly followed the accumulation of family money and the careful arrangement of profitable marriages. The greater supply of coins also facilitated international commerce and financial ties that gradually began to knit together the regional economies of the world. Merchants outside Europe would not accept the bankers' bills of exchange, but they eagerly accepted the new silver coins minted in Peru and Mexico. The greatest initial impact occurred in Africa, where the new wealth stimulated the traditional slave market to grow larger than ever. Very quickly after the tapping of American wealth, Africa became a part of the triangular trade with Europe and America. African slaves went to Caribbean plantations. American silver and Caribbean sugar went to Europe. Much of the silver and European manufactured goods then went to Africa to buy more slaves to ship to America. During the 18th century, the commercial ties stretched from the northern and mid-Atlantic to include the Pacific and Indian Oceans and eventually even the Arctic. The network expanded from the slave trade to include the spice trade with South Asia, the silk and porcelain trade with China, the opium trade with India, and the fur trade with Siberia, Canada, and Alaska. In Conquering America, Spain opened a pipeline that pumped a torrent of silver into the world's economy, but Spain was helpless to control that flow. Neither Chinese emperor nor Ottoman sultan, neither Persian shah nor Russian czar proved any more adept at channeling and controlling it than the Spanish kings. Spain had unleashed a power that raced around the globe and operated with a force of its own, independent of both church and state. The wealth of America had run amok, and the world would never again be the same. Phase 2. Paper Money Geld regiert die Welt. Gold rules the world. German Proverb. Chapter 7. The Birth of the Dollar Money, not morality, is the principle of commercial nations. Thomas Jefferson only the muse of history, totally unappreciative of coincidence, irony, and symbolism, could have written a scenario in which both the dollar and the atomic bomb originated in the same little European hamlet. The history of the Czech village of Yakimov reads like a cheap Hollywood script that no reader would find credible and no producer would be willing to film. Yet it was from this tiny town that the dollar developed and grew to become the preferred currency of the world. The movie opens when Count Stefan Schlick, a Bohemian nobleman, discovers a rich vein of silver near his ancestral home, the Castle of Joy, and from that silver he secretly mints his own coins, which become the world's first dollars. The action then fast-forwards to the end of the 19th century, when a young girl named Marie, eager to overcome the double handicap of being both female and Polish, uses uranium from the same mines to discover radium and rise to the top of the science world. After winning a Nobel Prize with the man she loves, he is killed in a traffic accident, and Marie Curie, in her sorrow, devotes the rest of her life to working in the laboratory on radium, which she is convinced is a miracle medicine, but which is slowly poisoning her to death. Almost as soon as our heroine dies, German troopers storm into the Czech village, bringing with them inmates from nearby concentration camps to mine the uranium for the atomic bomb their scientists are striving to perfect. 
Before the Germans can complete their bombs, however, the Russians arrive, fill the camps with their own prisoners, and successfully use the uranium to make their first atomic bomb. Yakimov, a Bohemian village of 2,700 inhabitants, perches at the head of a steep valley in the Krushnehuri, the Ore Mountains in the western part of what is now the Czech Republic. Its broad main street ascends the mountain at a sharp angle, creating an ideal passageway for that peculiarly fresh, cool, and moist air that seems to be found only in mountains. A conglomeration of buildings spanning the last five centuries lines the street, but the old yellow and white paint and stucco have been chipped and broken from their facades. Shutters have rotted away, and tiles have fallen off the houses, only to be replaced by tin roofs painted in bright shades of red, blue, green, and gray. No matter how shabby the old buildings may be, they still look better than the six-story apartment buildings of corroded cement and rusted metal erected on the edge of the town during the communist regime. The ugliness of the buildings is relieved only by the deep green of the trees and the carefully cultivated lilac bushes that bloom along the main street in June. Because the village lies only a few kilometers from the German state of Saxony, Many of the signs along the main street are written in German and advertise ice cream, champagne, and other goods that sell for less on the Czech side of the border. An occasional car can be found beside the road covered with deer antlers, animal skins, or other hunting trophies that the owner is trying to sell to visiting Germans. On summer weekends, the Natashas, Russian girls in short skirts and skimpy blouses hang out along the street selling their services to foreign truck drivers en route to Prague. At the entrance to the town, some of the shops have a platoon of garden gnomes standing in front of them. The Vietnamese women who run the shops stand in the doorway and wave cartons of cigarettes at passing motorists, most of whom are Germans in search of cheap meals, cheap sex, or cheap merchandise. The Vietnamese women came to Czechoslovakia in an era of friendship between the two communist nations. Too poor to pay for the manufactured goods that it received from Czechoslovakia, Vietnam paid in the only currency it had, its own people, whom the Vietnamese government shipped to Czechoslovakia and the other socialist states as workers. After the fall of the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia and the division of the country into the Czech and the Slovak republics, the Vietnamese found themselves suddenly free and far from home. They then sought out small niches in the newly emerging economy, where they could thrive but not succeed so much that they would pose a threat and therefore be deported. Many of them ended up in places like Yakimov, selling garden gnomes and cheap cigarettes. In the center of the village looms the Renaissance-style city hall, which was built as the home of Count Hieronymus Schlick between 1540 and 1544. Behind it sits the squat, half-timbered building constructed by order of King Ferdinand I between 1534 and 1536 to be the imperial mint. It was made into a museum in 1976, but closed after only a decade due to structural damage and deterioration. The building has a bay window on the corner and a coat of arms depicting two crossed miners' hammers topped by a crown. It bears the date, 1536. At the opening of the 16th century, Yakimov came under German administration when Bohemia became part of the Holy Roman Empire. Count Schlick and his family ruled the remote and largely unsettled area from Hrad Freudenstein, it would have been quite an unlikely location in which to imagine a future event that would have a radical impact on the monetary history of the world. Miners discovered silver deposits in approximately 1516, but silver mining was not new to Bohemia. Farther east, in the center of the country, major silver mines had been in operation in Kutnohora for centuries. Rather than merely mining the silver and selling it to others, Count Schlick surreptitiously began minting silver coins called Groschen. According to local tradition, he made the very first coins in 1519 in his castle, even though he did not receive official permission for such minting until January 9, 1520. From the German name of the valley, Joachimsthal, the coins were called Joachimsthaler Gulden or Joachimsthaler Groschen 
names that were far too long for daily use, even by German speakers. The coins became more widely known as Thalergroschen, and eventually as Thalers or Thalers. Because of the ample supply of silver in the mines of western Bohemia, the heavy and substantial Thalers steadily increased in number, and because of the economic and political connections throughout the Holy Roman Empire, the Thalers spread to all parts of it, including Spain. Saxon mineralogist and general scholar Georg Bauer, whose Latin name was Georgius Agricola, began a systematic study of the minerals in the Yakimov area and the ways in which they were mined. He published in 1530 a book on the mines, and he wrote some of the first scientific treatises on mines and minerals. He later became known as the father of mineralogy. With the opening of Yakimov to mining, the community quickly grew to 18,000 inhabitants who stripped the surrounding mountains of trees, which were used as timbers in the mines, and to make charcoal with which to smelt the silver ore. Mining nearly ended when a plague erupted in 1568 and killed nearly 1,000 community residents. By the next century, the miners had become strict adherents of the new Protestantism, sweeping the German states, including neighboring Saxony. But the Bohemian monarchy began a fierce campaign of forced conversion to Catholicism. Many villagers fled or were killed until the population had dropped to only 529 inhabitants by 1613. In 1627, the government closed the Protestant church for one year and then reopened it as a Catholic one. They also shut down the village school, calling it a nest of Protestantism. The village and its mines never recovered, and the government finally moved the official mint to Prague in 1651. In the century between 1519 and 1617, however, when thalers were minted in Yakimov, production began with about 250,000 thalers in the first year. At maximum production, from 1529 to 1545, the mines supplied enough silver to mint 5 million thalers. It is estimated that by the end of the century, Yakimov had put nearly 12 million dollars into circulation, in addition to the many smaller coins produced by its mint. The Spread of the Dollar The coins of Yakimov spread around the world, influencing the names of many different European coins. Initially, for example, the dollar was a large silver coin worth three German marks, but it eventually gave its name to any large silver coin. The word passed into Italian as talero, into Dutch as dalder, into Danish and Swedish as dollar, into Hawaiian as dala, into Samoan as tala, into Ethiopian as talari, and into English as dollar. It also became part of the name of the Swedish Reichsdollar and the Danish Reichsdollar. Taller became a common name for currency because so many German states and municipalities picked it up. During the 16th century, approximately 1,500 different types of Thalers were issued in the German-speaking countries, and numismatic scholars have estimated that between the minting of the first Thalers in Yakimov and the year 1900, about 10,000 different Thalers were issued for daily use and to commemorate special occasions. The most famous and widely circulated of all Thalers became known as the Maria Theresa Thaler, struck in honor of the Austrian Empress at the Gunzburg Mint in 1773. In a century of powerful women, she stands out. She reigned as Empress, and her father, husband, and son were all emperors. Born in 1717, the daughter of Emperor Charles VI, Maria Theresa became Archduchess of Austria and Queen of Hungary and Bohemia. She married the Duke of Lorraine, who became Holy Roman Emperor Francis I. She participated in seemingly every war, treaty, and other major event in Europe during her lifetime, from the War of Austrian Succession, 1740 to 1748, to the Partition of Poland, 1772. The coin bearing the portrait of Maria Theresa became so popular particularly in North Africa and the Middle East, that, even after she died, the government continued to mint it with the date 1780, the year of her death. The coin not only survived its namesake, but outlived the empire that had created it. In 1805, when Napoleon abolished the Holy Roman Empire, 
the mint at Gunzburg closed, but the mint in Vienna continued to produce the coins exactly as they had been with the same date, 1780, and even with the mint mark of the closed mint. The Austro-Hungarian government continued to mint the taler throughout the 19th century until that empire collapsed at the end of World War I. The new Austrian Republic continued to make the Maria Theresa taller until Hitler seized the country in 1937. When Mussolini conquered Abyssinia, Ethiopia, he found that the economy depended heavily upon the Maria Theresa taller. In fact, the natives proved so unwilling to accept any substitute for it that Rome had to mint its own taller's between 1935 and 1937. Later, Brussels, Prague, Leningrad, London, Rome, and Bombay started making them. And after the Second World War, the new Republic of Austria resumed minting the coins from 1956 until 1975. Numismatic historians estimate that a total of 800 million Silver Maria Theresa Thalers were struck between 1780 and 1975, all bearing the date 1780. Other countries began copying the design of the Maria Theresa Thaler shortly after it went into circulation. They minted coins of a similar size and put on them the bust of a middle-aged woman who resembled Maria Theresa. If they did not have a queen of their own who fit the description, they used an allegorical female such as the bust of liberty that appeared on many U.S. coins of the 19th century. The name dollar penetrated the English language via Scotland. Between 1567 and 1571, King James VI issued a 30-shilling piece that the Scots called the sword dollar because of the design on the back of it. A two-merk coin followed in 1578 and was called the thistle dollar. The Scots used the name dollar to distinguish their currency and thereby their country and themselves more clearly from their domineering English neighbors to the south. Thus, from very early usage, the word dollar carried with it a certain anti-English or anti-authoritarian bias that many Scottish settlers took with them to their new homes in the Americas and other British colonies. The emigration of Scots accounts for much of the subsequent popularity of the word dollar in British colonies around the world. Despite the widespread use of the dollar, or taller, from the 16th century onward, no major country adopted it as its official currency until the formation of the United States. It might seem that, as the offspring of Britain, the thirteen American colonies would be accustomed to using the British currency of pounds, crowns, shillings, and pence. But the British colonies in North America suffered from a constant shortage of all coins. The mercantile policies then in vogue in London sought to increase the amount of gold and silver money in Britain and to do whatever was practical in order to prohibit its export even to its own colonies. Beginning in 1695, Britain forbade the exportation of specie to anywhere in the world, including to its own colonies. As a result, the American colonies were forced to use foreign silver coins rather than British pounds, shillings, and pence, and they found the greatest supply of coins in the neighboring Spanish colony of Mexico, which operated one of the world's largest mints. The Spanish coin bore a face value of eight reales in the Spanish system, real being the Spanish word for royal. Eight of these royals equaled a peso, a coin originally established by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand in their currency reform for the United Spain in 1497. The Americans rejected both real and peso as a name for the money, but the number eight stuck to the coin so that it was often referred to as eight bits or pieces of eight. Today, the phrase two bits still refers to a quarter. Because of the great wealth produced in Mexico and Peru, Spanish coins became the most commonly accepted currency in the world. The Spanish word real also gave rise to real, which is used in Oman and Yemen, while an alternate spelling, real, is used in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. The English-speaking peoples, however, preferred the already familiar word dollar. The most common Spanish coin in use in the British colonies in 1776 was the pillar dollar, so named because the obverse side showed the eastern and western hemispheres with a large column on either side. In Spanish imperial iconography, 
the columns represented the pillars of Hercules, or the narrow strait separating Spain from Morocco and connecting the Mediterranean with the Atlantic. A banner hanging from the column bore the words plus ultra, meaning more beyond. The Spanish authorities began issuing this coin almost as soon as they opened the mint in Mexico, with the intent of publicizing the discovery of America, which was the plus ultra, the land out beyond the pillars of Hercules. Some people say that the modern dollar sign is derived from this pillar dollar. According to this explanation, the two parallel lines represent the columns, and the S stands for the shape of the banner hanging from them. Whether the sign was inspired by this coin or not, the pillar dollar can certainly be called the first American silver dollar. In 1782, Thomas Jefferson wrote in his Notes on a Money Unit for U.S. that the unit or dollar is a known coin and the most familiar of all to the mind of the people. It is already adopted from south to north. The American colonists became so accustomed to using the dollar as their primary monetary unit that, after independence, they adopted it as their official currency. On July 6, 1785, the Congress declared that the money unit of the United States of America be one dollar. Not until April 2, 1792, however, did Congress pass a law to create an American mint and only in 1794 did the United States begin minting its first silver dollars. The mint building, which was started soon after passage of the law and well before the Capitol or White House, became the first public building constructed by the new government of the United States. In using the word dollar, the Congress may have yielded to popular usage, but neither Thomas Jefferson nor Alexander Hamilton showed much fondness for the term yet they never suggested an alternative. They wrote the laws to refer to the currency as the dollar or unit, apparently with the idea that they would think of a better name later. Unit was never much used outside of the law, and the people continued with dollar. In accepting the dollar as the national currency of the United States, the Congress made official what had already become common practice in most parts of the colonies. With virtually no access to gold or silver, the U.S. government lacked the ability to mint coins other than by melting the silver coins of other nations and reminting them as American. Rather than go to such effort, U.S. authorities allowed the Spanish dollar to continue as the de facto currency of the new nation. After Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821, the new Mexican government issued its own pesos with a slightly higher silver content than the old Spanish reales. The new Mexican peso, or Mexican dollar, as it was usually called, immediately became legal tender in the United States and remained so throughout most of the 19th century. In order to determine the initial value of the U.S. dollar, the newly formed American government set up a study to weigh the Spanish dollars circulating in the United States and found that they averaged 371 and a quarter grains of silver rather than the 377 grains claimed by Spain. In accordance with this finding, the U.S. Congress set the value of the American silver dollar at the rather odd standard of 371 and a quarter grains, and it remained at that assigned weight for as long as the United States minted silver dollars. In 1787, the United States issued its first coins. The copper coins worth one cent bore the motto, Mind Your Business. The sun appeared above a sundial with the inscription Fujio, meaning I fly. Because of this inscription, the coins became known as Fujio cents. The other side of the coin bore the image of a chain of thirteen linked circles, each inscribed with the name of one of the thirteen newly united states. The chain encircled the inscription, We are one, and for the first time in coin history it bore the name United States. The image of the chain came from the Iroquois, who depicted the unity of their five tribes in a wampum belt composed of interlocking links and known as the Great Chain of Friendship. By using emblems such as the chain in addition to the eagle, stars, or the bust of liberty, the colonists had made an important decision to distinguish their American dollar from European coins. Because European coins bore the likeness of a monarch, 
George III on British coins, for instance, and Carlos III on Spanish ones. Some Americans thought that U.S. coins should bear the likeness of President George Washington. The majority, however, rejected that idea. Most newly independent Americans felt that the use of a president's image, even that of George Washington, smacked too much of elitism and royalty. They claimed that the money of a free, democratic people should bear inscriptions and allegorical figures, not portraits of politicians. This steadfast refusal to put the picture of a person on the coin persisted in the United States for almost a century. The Pacific Dollar The use of Spanish, Mexican, and American dollars spread north into Canada, where they became the de facto currency of the land. In 1858, authorities in the Dominion of Canada, which then included only Ontario and Quebec, acceded to popular usage and created the Canadian dollar as its official currency. They pegged the value of the Canadian dollar at a one-to-one -one equivalent with the U.S. dollar. The provincial government issued small denominations in copper but relied on American and Mexican silver dollar coins even after the formation of the Dominion of Canada. Canada did not issue its own silver dollars until 1935. Throughout the Caribbean, the Mexican dollar played a primary role, just as it did in the United States. Virtually all of the former British colonies in this area adopted it as their currency. The dollar also became the name of the currency of Anguilla, St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda, Montserrat, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Guyana, the Bahamas, Belize, Barbados, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, Trinidad and Tobago, the Turks and Caicos Islands, and Jamaica. Even though the word dollar originated in Europe and spread to every continent, it has rarely been used as an official name for a European currency. That is, until 1991, when Slovenia gained its independence from the old Yugoslavian Federation and chose Toller, a variation of dollar, for its new national currency. The new name clearly set Slovenia monetarily apart from its Yugoslavian, Turkish, Italian, and Austrian neighbors and former rulers. The Spanish and Mexican dollars became so closely associated with commerce in the Pacific Basin that in the 19th century other countries also began to mint their own coins, which were known as trade dollars. By a Congressional Act of February 12, 1873, the United States issued special trade dollars for American commerce with China, but they served more generally for trade with any Asian nation. Britain began issuing such trade dollars in 1895 and marked them in English, Chinese, and Malay Arabic script. The Chinese called these many different silver dollars yuan, meaning round things, and that became the name of the standard currency in China and modern Taiwan. The association between yuan and dollar in Taiwan has been so close that the two words are used interchangeably. The Japanese adopted the Chinese name but reduced it from yuan to yen in 1871. The Japanese issued gold and silver coins and, staying true to its original meaning of dollar in the late 19th century, the yen and the U.S. dollar shared an approximately equal value. The use of trade dollars in the Pacific Basin solidified the use of the word dollar throughout the area. The Kingdom of Hawaii and the later Republic used the dollar as its primary currency in a system based on that of the United States. Their silver dollars bore the bust of the monarch on the front and the national coat of arms on the back. In the Pacific area of today, the U.S. territories and affiliated commonwealths of Guam and the Federated States of Micronesia continue to use the U.S. dollar as their currency. In addition, the name dollar was adopted for the currency of the Pacific nations of Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, the Cook Islands, Kiribati, Brunei, Singapore, Hong Kong, the Solomon Islands, Pitcairn, Tokelau, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, and Western Samoa. By contrast, the franc became the second most common denomination in the South Pacific, but it was used only in the French colonies such as New Caledonia, French Polynesia, and the Wallace and Futuna Islands. In the Eastern Pacific, most of the Latin American countries from Chile to Mexico use the peso, which descends directly from the same Spanish reales as did the dollar, making both the dollar and the peso offspring of the same mother despite their different names. 
As of 1994, some 37 countries and autonomous territories around the world had adopted the name dollar for their national currency. Although countries such as Belize pegged the value of their own dollar to that of the U.S. dollar, and other countries such as the Cook Islands pegged their dollar to the New Zealand dollar, most countries operated independently of one another with their own values set in the world currency exchanges. The Last Silver Dollar After reaching its maximum usage around the beginning of the 20th century, the American silver dollar coin began to die. In 1935, during the Great Depression, the U.S. Treasury ended the minting of silver dollars. Then, with the passage of the Coinage Act of 1965, they ceased using silver in American coins, replacing it with copper covered in cupro-nickel. In Africa, only Liberia, one of the oldest independent countries on the continent, and Zimbabwe, one of the most recently independent countries, have named their national currencies dollars. In Liberia, founded in 1822 by emancipated American slaves, the first currency consisted of American coins that the settlers brought with them to their new homeland. Although supplemented by various tokens and by the coins of other African colonial powers, such as Britain, the use of the dollar continued in Liberia until 1943, when the government banned the use of all foreign currency except the U.S. dollar. Beginning in 1960, Liberia had its own silver dollars minted at the Royal Mint in London, but it continued to use American paper dollars for all denominations higher than one dollar. Liberia became one of the last countries to mint and use silver dollars, thereby bringing to a close a long chapter that had begun over four centuries earlier in the distant mines of Yakimov. Beginning in 1987, the government of Liberia began withdrawing the silver dollars from circulation and issuing in their place a cupro-nickel dollar that looked like the old silver dollar and bore the date 1968 but contained no silver. They continued minting and using these fake silver dollars stamped with the year 1968 until the 1990s. To profit more from foreign sales, the corrupt Liberian government issued its own Kennedy dollar in 1989, but they misspelled memoriam as memoriam, thereby increasing the novelty value of the coin among collectors, but doing little for the respectability of the Liberian currency. Chapter 8 the Devil's Mint The trouble with paper money is that it rewards the minority that can manipulate money and makes fools of the generation that has worked and saved. Adam Smith, George Goodman At one end of 14th Street in Washington, D.C., prostitutes and drug dealers brazenly ply their trade night and day. At the other end, near the White House and the bridge into Virginia, the federal government prints money, night and day, in the workrooms of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, a part of the Treasury Department that advertises itself to tourists as the Money Factory. On weekday mornings, tourists begin lining up well before the opening hour of 9 a.m. to see how America prints its paper money. The visitors enter the building through a sequence of security checks leading into a dilapidated wooden corridor. Large color portraits of the President, Vice President, and Secretary of the Treasury beam down from the walls. Visitors pass a sequence of photographs and paintings detailing the history of paper money in the United States and culminating with a life-size recreation of President Lincoln signing the legislation authorizing the federal government to print money. At the end of the long corridor, visitors watch a short video on the history of paper money after which guides divide them into small groups before they enter the work area. These small groups wend their way through the carefully marked visitors' corridors, past glass-enclosed galleries from which they can watch the sheets of dollars being printed, examined, cut, and stacked, as the guides dispense a constant flow of facts about America's money. The dollar is printed on textile paper made by the Crane Company, using a mixture of 75% cotton and 25% linen with a polyester security thread. The printing machines are made by Germans and Italians. 
Nearly half of the bills printed in a day are $1 notes, and 95% of the bills are used to replace worn-out bills. The average lifespan of a bill varies from 18 months for the $1 note to an ancient 9 years for a $100 note. A bill can be folded 4,000 times before it tears. Approximately 3,000 people work for the Bureau of Engraving. It takes 490 notes to make a pound, and it would require 14.5 million notes to make a stack one mile high. Coin and paper account for only about 8% of all the dollars in the world. The rest are merely numbers in a ledger or tiny electronic blips on a computer chip. At the end of the process, the workers bundle the bills into packages of 100, which they then stack into bricks of 4,000. These bricks are loaded onto a pallet for transport to the basement from where they will be sent to the various Federal Reserve offices around the nation for distribution to banks and the public. Along the way, the curious visitors pepper the guides with questions. Question. Why are so many employees listening to music on headphones? Answer. To block the loud sound of the printing, cutting, and stacking machines. Question. Why are some of them eating? Answer. They are on break. Question. Why are all of the checkers so fat? Answer. Because they sit all day and watch money go by with little chance for exercise. Following the tour, the guides usher the visitors into a cavernous hall where interactive displays invite them to press buttons to learn about the different parts of the dollar or to hear about its history. Children press the buttons, but the lights do not go on, and so none of the questions are answered. They rush to the next interactive display, only to find that it, too, no longer interacts. The large room also offers souvenirs for sale, such as a souvenir pen filled with shredded money. In a corner, Japanese tourists buy sheets of uncut American currency from women behind security windows of thick glass. They take the money home with them to use as novelty wrapping paper for gifts and flowers. The twentieth century became the era of paper money. Never before had so much of it been manufactured in so many countries and in so many denominations. Behind the perpetually operating machines of the U.S. Treasury lay a long process whereby paper money won the confidence of ordinary people. Mulberry Money The Chinese economy has always operated by its own monetary rules which were usually created and enforced by a powerful state with a large bureaucracy and a strong army. Whether China was under the rule of a dictatorial emperor, rival warlords, or the Communist Party, its commerce has almost always been controlled by state forces rather than market forces. In such a system, gold and silver coins rarely had any role. For much of Chinese history, the emperor's government issued simple tokens usually known as cash and made of brass or copper. These tokens had a square hole in the middle so that they could be strung together in sums of up to 100. Since the cash itself was bulky and merely a token anyway, it was a small step to simply drawing a picture of the cash on a piece of paper. The drawing could then stand for 1,000 or even 10,000 coins. The invention and dissemination of paper money in China marked a major step forward in government control of the money supply, a development that could have occurred only in a great empire with a ruler powerful enough to impose the will of the state on the economy, even to the point of executing those citizens who dared to oppose its monetary policy. The invention of paper money, of course, had to await the invention of paper and printing. Unlike metal technology, which came early in human history, the discovery of paper and the dissemination of paper-making technology came relatively late and spread slowly. The ancient people of the Mediterranean used parchment made from sheepskin for recording information. For a while during the Hellenistic era and the time of the Roman Empire, papyrus was exported from Egypt for use as a simple writing material, but it was not durable enough to be used as paper money. It is no accident that printing, paper-making, and paper money all originated in China. In the first or second century A.D., Tsai Lun supposedly made the first paper from the bark of the mulberry tree, whose leaves fed the caterpillars of the lucrative Chinese silk industry. But actually, 
papermaking may be centuries older than that. The technology for making paper seems to have been confined to China for at least a millennium. The use of paper money in China was mentioned as early as the Tang Dynasty, and some illustrations of it have survived, but no examples from that era have been found. Of all the strange customs Marco Polo encountered during his travels to Asia in the 13th century, none seemed to astound him more than the power of the state to produce paper money and to compel its use throughout the empire. Chinese bureaucrats made paper bills from the mulberry bark paper. Once stamped with the vermilion seal of the emperor, these bills carried the full value of gold or silver. Chinese notes were as large as napkins. A note representing 1,000 coins measured 9 by 13 inches. Despite its awkward size, the bill weighed very little and thus represented a great improvement over the coins, a thousand of which weighed about 8 pounds. The use of paper money in China reached its peak under the rule of the Mongol emperors. They needed to administer the largest empire in world history, and like any ruler of a great bureaucracy, they found paper an invaluable asset. The paper bills made collecting taxes and administering the empire much easier, while greatly reducing the need to transport large quantities of heavy coins. In 1273, Kublai Khan issued a new series of state-sponsored and controlled bills. To enforce their use, he utilized essentially the same methods that any government must use to back up its currency. He gave payment only in the form of paper money and compelled everyone to accept it in payment under penalty of great punishment. To ensure its use in circles wider than merely the government, the Chinese government confiscated all gold and silver from private citizens and issued them paper money in its place. Even merchants arriving from abroad had to surrender their gold, silver, gems, and pearls to the government at prices set by a council of merchant bureaucrats. The traders then received government-issued notes in exchange. Marco Polo saw clearly that this system of paper money could work only where a strong central government could enforce its will on everyone within its territory. Much the same observation of governmental power over paper money was made by the Moroccan traveler Mohammed ibn Battuta, who visited China in 1345. He reported that it was impossible to pay with gold or silver coins in Chinese markets. Such coins had to be converted to strips of paper about the size of the palm of the hand and bearing the seal of the sultan. He also reported that every foreign merchant was required to deposit all of his money with an official who then paid all of his expenses, including the cost of a concubine or slave girl if the merchant so desired. At the end of the merchant's stay, the official returned what money he was due as he departed from China. Ibn Battuta described China as the safest country in the world for merchants. No matter how far they traveled or how much paper money or other goods they carried with them, they were almost never robbed. To create this level of safety, the government operated a police state in a surprisingly modern sense. Bureaucrats sketched detailed portraits of all entering foreigners so that their pictures could be quickly circulated if they committed a crime. At each stop, the merchant had to register with the police, and his name was forwarded to authorities at the next stop before he could leave. At each stop, an army official inspected foreign merchants each morning and night and locked them up in a hostelry for the night. Ibn Battuta, however, observed a possibly unintended consequence of the outlawed use of coins. Since merchants were forbidden to own silver or gold coins, they melted the contraband coins into ingots, which they stored in the rafters above their doorway. Ibn Battuta may have been witness to a form of resistance that had escaped Marco Polo's notice, or, more likely, the power of the emperor and the central state was in decline during the 14th century, more than half a century after Marco Polo's visits to the court of the powerful new Mongol rulers. Today, no known copies of the Mongol money survive, but museums exhibit the few remaining Quan notes issued by the Mongols' successors, the Ming emperors, between 1368 and 1399. The Chinese then abandoned their paper money system, and it did not reappear until the dawn of the 20th century and the economic colonization of China by the various European empires.
by using paper money and brass or copper tokens instead of gold or silver coins, the Chinese authorities never had to worry about the purity of their coins. Herein, however, lay a crucial distinction between the money system of China and that which developed in the Mediterranean. The purpose of paper money in China was to allow the government a monopoly over silver and gold. Paper flowed from the capital to the provinces, while gold and silver flowed from the provinces to the capital. Paper functioned as part of the tribute system and stifled the development of healthy commerce. By contrast, the paper systems that developed in the West, at least initially, were designed to increase the flow of goods. Only later did they fall into the Chinese trap of becoming a way for government to confiscate gold and silver. In the West, paper found its most important use as a means of keeping ledgers in banks. Long before it was used as a means of printing more money, it was used by bankers to increase the money supply. Only later did it gradually emerge as a replacement for coins in daily commerce. The initial development and circulation of monetary bills made of paper came about as a side effect of banking. Paper money helped to solve a major problem in handling gold. Because even minute amounts of gold had great value, people had always found ways to adulterate gold coins. One of the simplest was to sweat the coins by vigorously shaking them in a pouch so that they hit and scraped against one another, a process that invariably left a little gold dust behind. One of the earliest solutions to this problem by merchants in the Mediterranean was to seal gold coins in a small purse with the exact value and type of coin written on the outside. Thus, merchants became accustomed to accepting in payment a coin they could never touch or see. The merchants had to have faith in the stamp of the person who first sealed the coin, usually another merchant, a government official, or a banker. It was only one more step from this process to keep the gold coins in a safe place and circulate only the label. The Duke of Arkansas Despite the importance of paper money in Chinese history, the modern world system of paper money did not develop in China, or even in the Mediterranean homeland of Marco Polo or Ibn Battuta. It evolved in the trading nations around the North Atlantic. Repeatedly in European records, we find mention of money made from leather during times of warfare and siege. Reports indicate that European monarchs occasionally used paper money during periods of crisis, usually war. And they do maintain that in Catalonia and Aragon, James I issued paper money in 1250, but no known examples have survived. Then, when the Spanish laid siege to the city of Leiden in the Lowlands in 1574, Burgomeister Peter Andrianzund collected all metal, including coins, for use in the manufacture of arms. To replace the coins, he issued small scraps of paper. During the time of Gutenberg, the technology for both printing and superior papermaking spread through Europe. Some scholars maintain that the boom in paper production came as an indirect result of the bubonic plague, which killed a third of the European population. The old clothing left behind by the millions of plague victims became a cheap raw material for papermakers and thus encouraged new uses for the paper. Regardless of the importance of the plague in stimulating the paper business, the invention of movable type for printing certainly created a new and greatly expanded market for printed materials and made possible the expanded use of paper money. In July 1661, Sweden's Stockholm Bank issued the first banknote in Europe to compensate for a shortage of silver coins. Although Sweden lacked silver, it possessed bountiful copper resources, and the government of Queen Christina, 1634 to 1654, issued large copper sheets called plat mint, plate money, which weighed approximately four pounds each. In 1644, the government offered the largest coins ever issued, ten-dollar copper plates, each of which weighed 43 pounds seven and a quarter ounces. To avoid having to carry such heavy coins, merchants willingly accepted the paper bills in denominations of one hundred dollars. One such bill could be substituted for five hundred pounds of copper plates. It was unclear at first whether paper money should be created by the government or by private institutions such as banks. 
Generally, local banks lacked the ability to create a truly national currency. The first national experiment for such paper money was undertaken in France. By royal decree on May 5, 1716, the French chose a Scotsman, John Law, to head up a bank named Law & Company, but quickly renamed Banque Générale. John Law, a handsome, wealthy, and popular ladies' man, had written several pamphlets on trade, money, and banking, including Money and Trade Considered with a Proposal for Supplying the Nation with Money, published in Edinburgh in 1705, in which he proposed that paper money could create wealth. Law was a self-taught banker who was also a heavy gambler and a convicted murderer in England. He allegedly claimed that he had found the true philosopher's stone to make gold from paper by printing money. The creation of the bank proceeded in clear imitation of the already successful Bank of England. Under special license from the French monarch, it was to be a private bank that would help raise and manage money for the public debt. In keeping with his theories on the benefits of paper money, Law immediately began issuing paper notes representing the supposedly guaranteed holdings of the bank in gold coins. Initially, the bank operated quite successfully, but it remained independent for a mere two years before the Duc d'Orléans, who ruled as regent for Louis XV, a minor, took control of the bank by decree on December 14, 1718, and changed it to the Banque Royale, the official bank of the French government. The bank continued under the administration of John Law, who had by now become the Duc d'Orquensa, and who issued ever more paper with the confidence of the government behind him. Law was also instrumental in establishing the Compagnie d'Occident of 1717, generally known as the Mississippi Company, and formed to bring home the great wealth of France's holdings in Louisiana. Investors received their profits from subsequent investors in a giant pyramid scheme. To maintain the illusion of great profits lying just over the horizon, the company directors hired unemployed men to dress as miners and march through the streets of Paris with shovels and axes on their shoulders as though they were off to rake in great wealth from Louisiana. The Banque Royale printed paper money, which investors could borrow in order to buy stock in the Mississippi Company. The company then used the new notes to pay out its bogus profits. Together, the Mississippi Company and the Banque Royale were producing paper profits on each other's accounts. The bank had soon issued twice as much paper money as there was specie in the whole country. Obviously, it could no longer guarantee that each paper note would be redeemed in gold. The Mississippi Company collapsed when it became obvious that the wealth would never materialize and the bank fell with it. By the end of 1720, the Banque Royale lay devastated with a trail of worthless paper notes behind it. In The Great Mississippi Bubble, American writer Washington Irving vividly described the scene in Paris. The doors of the bank in the neighboring street were immediately thronged with a famishing multitude, seeking cash for banknotes of ten livres. So great was the press in struggle that several persons were stifled and crushed to death. The mob carried three of the bodies to the courtyard of the Palais Royal. Some cried for the regent to come forth and behold the effect of his system. Others demanded the death of Law, the impostor, who had brought this misery and ruin upon the nation. The disgraced and hated John Law, the mastermind behind the whole paper affair, fled to England and then to Venice, where he died in 1729. His title, the Duke d'Orcansa, died with him. Half a century later, during the French Revolution, the new Republican leaders sought to finance the government and their revolution with a new form of paper money, the assignat. In all, the various governments of the French Revolution issued some 40 billion assignats before 1796. The government finally bowed to public anger at the paper assignat in a great public spectacle at the Place Vendôme on February 18, 1796. Before a great crowd, government officials solemnly destroyed all the machines, plates, and paper used in printing the assignat in an effort to show that the assignat itself, rather than the government's manipulation of paper money, bore the guilt for the monetary collapse. The government began the unfortunate cycle anew by issuing yet more paper money, but calling it by yet another name, the manda. 
the father of paper money. The idea and the technology for paper money had become firmly established in Europe, but its first successful application occurred across the ocean. Neither China nor Europe became the cradle of paper money. Rather, it was to be North America, the continent that was perpetually short of coins. John Kenneth Galbraith observed that, if the history of commercial banking belongs to the Italians and of central banking to the British, that of paper money issued by a government belongs indubitably to the Americans. As early as 1690, the Massachusetts Bay Colony printed the first paper money in North America. Colonists later printed various types of money geared for local use over short periods of time. But one man was largely responsible for creating paper money in much greater amounts for use in three of the colonies on a nearly permanent basis. Benjamin Franklin holds the honor of being the father of paper money. In honor of his role in this creation, the hundred-dollar bill, the highest denomination currently issued by the United States for general circulation, bears an engraved portrait of Benjamin Franklin. Born in 1706, the tenth and last child of a Boston chandler, a candle and soap maker, Franklin grew up in a family lacking the money and the social connections to educate him. Instead, they apprenticed him into the chandling business at the age of ten after he had completed only two years of school. At twelve, he quit his apprenticeship to become an apprentice to his half-brother James, a Boston printer who published the New England Current, which he had founded in 1721. James's questioning of colonial officials in his newspaper sometimes landed him in jail and in other types of trouble with the British authorities. As a printer's apprentice, Franklin gained his education through his work. He became a skilled reader who developed a great interest in the ideas behind the documents he printed, as well as in the technology of printing. Because of a stormy relationship with his brother, Franklin left Boston for Philadelphia, where he found work as a printer's assistant. Then, after working in London for a brief time, he returned to Philadelphia, where he and a partner acquired their own press. Soon, Franklin was not only publishing books, but writing them as well. Despite his lack of a formal education, Franklin became the quintessential scholar of the Enlightenment and perhaps the most beloved of all the Founding Fathers. Through his printing, Franklin developed an early interest in the manufacture of money. In fact, he wrote one of the first pamphlets on paper money at the young age of twenty-three. At a time when paper money existed only as an emergency substitute for real money, he printed some of the first paper money used in America, and he continued to print money periodically throughout his life. In 1729, Benjamin Franklin published A Modest Enquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency. The colonies attempted to follow Franklin's plan by issuing paper money, and Franklin himself was contracted to print the money issued by Pennsylvania, a service that sometimes caused his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, to be late in delivery. Colonial authorities in London, however, saw the issuing of paper money as an impudent usurpation of power by the colonists. In 1751, the British Parliament outlawed the use of paper money in New England and, in 1764, extended the ban to the other American colonies. In response to this parliamentary ban, Franklin himself went to London in 1766 to petition Parliament to allow more money to be printed. Despite his later reputation as a diplomat and scientist, Franklin supported himself throughout his life as a craftsman, using his entrepreneurial talent to run a modest printing business. At the dawn of the information age, he was an information specialist, printing and distributing the ideas of his time to an increasingly literate public. His message focused sharply on a creed of thrift, honesty, and commerce. Franklin's commitment to his ideology is demonstrated clearly in a letter dated July 11, 1765, which he wrote regarding the Stamp Act more than a decade before the Declaration of Independence. Idleness and pride tax with a heavier hand than kings and parliaments, he wrote. If we can get rid of the former, 
we may easily bear the latter. His dicta have become a part of the American language and public psyche. Remember that time is money. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. There are three faithful friends, an old wife, an old dog, and ready money. No nation was ever ruined by trade. In this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Franklin's creed was not one of greed or miserliness. It was one of conscientious work. He advocated this creed not merely as a means of making individuals prosperous, but as a way to improve the whole society. He believed that the world would be a far better place if everyone produced more and consumed less. For Franklin, money always had to be made within the confines of a strict social and personal morality. Because of this, he could not sanction the enslavement of one person for the financial gain of another. Later in life, after the United States had won its independence from Britain, he turned his attention to the issue of slavery, calling for its abolition throughout the new nation. Benjamin Franklin was a man of deep morality, yet he eschewed and even mocked the hypocrisy of established religion. He rejected religious dogma and the hierarchy of officials who dominated the church, but not the morality of religion. He had a dictum for this philosophy as well. God helps them that help themselves. He served the community and country well with his creed. He organized not only the first public library in Philadelphia, but also a hospital, a fire department, a police department, and the Academy of Philadelphia, which became the University of Pennsylvania. He also founded a discussion group that developed into the American Philosophical Society. He helped found the U.S. Post Office and, as a convention delegate, made the census a part of the U.S. Constitution. He invented the lightning rod, bifocal eyeglasses, and the Franklin stove, which generated safe, efficient indoor heat, yet released a minimal amount of smoke into the house. In his devotion to the public good, Franklin declined to apply for a patent on his inventions. He wanted them to be manufactured by anyone who wished to do so. Such decisions kept Franklin from becoming a wealthy man, despite being quite successful throughout most of his life. He died on April 17, 1790, as a famous and much admired man, but a man of only modest financial means. A Continental Experiment The foundation of the United States of America offered the chance to put many of Franklin's ideas about paper money into practice. The newly forming nation provided the first modern experiment with paper money on a national scale, and the American Revolution has the distinction of being the first war to be financed with paper money, albeit a rapidly depreciating paper money. The Second Continental Congress created paper money before it had declared independence from Britain. To enforce its claim of independence, the new country needed to raise an army to fight a war, but Congress lacked the money to finance it. They issued paper bills of credit, supposedly backed by gold and silver, and with a stiff penalty for any traitor who refused to accept them as currency. In 1777, Congress issued $13 million worth of paper bills called Treasury Notes, but dubbed Continentals by most people because of the label Continental Currency printed on them. The Continentals began with a nominal value of one Spanish-milled dollar of silver but they quickly traded at two continentals for one silver dollar. As Congress issued more continentals to pay for its prolonged war, their value declined proportionally. By the beginning of 1780, Congress had issued some $241 million in continentals, and they were trading at a rate of 40 to 1 silver dollar. A year later, the value of the bills had dropped to 75 continentals to 1 silver dollar. In 1791, James Madison wrote for the National Gazette that the situation of the United States resembled that of an individual engaged in an expensive undertaking, carried on, for want of cash, with bonds secured on an estate to which his title was disputed, and who had, besides, a combination of enemies employing every artifice to disparage that security. 
the American Congress stopped issuing the virtually worthless paper money in 1780, but most of the states continued to issue their own paper money. By 1781, the Continental had lost so much value that it gave rise to a new cliché, not worth a Continental. Fortunately for the United States, however, Britain was giving up its struggle to hold on to the reluctant colonies and directing its commercial attention elsewhere in its search for profits. After much debate over what to do with the Continentals following the Revolution, the newly forming U.S. government agreed to redeem the Continentals in government bonds, paid at the rate of one cent for each Continental. The whole experiment with paper money so disgusted most Americans and provoked such a deep mistrust of paper currency that the United States printed almost no paper money for nearly a century. Even the delegates to the Constitutional Convention could not decide what to do about paper money. In Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution, they forbade the states to mandate any substance other than gold or silver as legal tender. No state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Even though Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution gave the federal government the power to regulate the value of money, the delegates could not agree on giving it the power to issue paper money. Because of grave and tumultuously voiced differences of opinion among the delegates regarding the value and usefulness of paper money, the Constitution remained silent on the federal government's ability to issue it. For many Americans, the experiment with paper currency during the American Revolution was a great failure because they lost so much money. But to the rest of the world, the experiment appeared to be a great success because the Americans had won their war using the novel technique of issuing paper money. The Mint of Mammon in the years following the early experiments with paper money in Europe and North America, one of the most interesting treatments of the subject was penned by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in his poetic tragedy Faust. In some ways, Faust should be treated as two works, since Goethe published Part I in 1808, but did not complete Part II until 1831, shortly before his death. The two parts represent the contrasting vision, interest, and style of a young versus an old man, and in some ways they represent the contrast between the medieval world of romance, belief, and magic, and the modern world of finance, rationalism, and skepticism. The story of Dr. Faust, as related by Goethe in Part I, was already an old one when Goethe tackled it. It deals with a medieval alchemy professor who seeks to make gold from base metals and, more importantly, to acquire ultimate knowledge about the universe and human pleasure. Toward these ends, he makes a wager with the devil, promising his soul if the devil can grant him a moment of ecstasy that Faust will want to last forever. Faust sets out on a quest that includes seducing a beautiful young maiden and abandoning the pregnant girl after killing her brother. The story told in Part I of Goethe's Faust is a highly emotional tragedy, written by a young genius at the start of his great career. Some scholars call it the quintessential literary work of the Romantic era. In the second part of the play, written at the end of Goethe's life, Faust and Mephistopheles visit the court of the emperor during the pre-Lenten carnival season of masquerades and tricks. The emperor is besieged by his treasurer and stewards, reporting the lack of funds and the need to pay the wages of the soldiers and servants. His moneylenders demand payment on debts, and even the wine bill has come due. Mephistopheles offers the emperor a way out of his financial mess. He has found the key to making gold, the secret that all alchemists had sought for centuries. He obtains from the emperor permission to print paper money the heaven-sent leaf. Faust comes to the emperor's carnival ball dressed appropriately as Plutus, the god of wealth, and through magic he and Mephistopheles show the emperor the riches he can have by printing money. They convince the emperor to sign a note bearing the inscription, To whom it may concern, be by these presents known, this note is legal tender for one thousand crowns and is secured by the immense reserves of wealth safely stored underground in our imperial states. 
He has based the value of his money on the future mining of gold, the untapped treasures still buried in the earth. By the next morning, the emperor has forgotten that he signed the note, but during the night Mephistopheles has had thousands of copies of it made in various denominations. The new money has been unleashed to the great joy of creditors, debtors, soldiers, and other citizens. Already people are ordering new clothes, and business booms for the butcher and baker. Wine is flowing freely in the taverns, and even the dice roll more easily. Priests and prostitutes scurry about their business with greater enthusiasm because of the new money, and even the moneylenders are enjoying a brisk new business. And people value this the same as honest gold? asks the incredulous emperor. The court and army take it as full pay? Much as I find it strange, I see I must accept it. Like John Law and Benjamin Franklin, whose experiments with money made a lasting impression on Goethe, Faust found the key to the modern economic world in money. It was a system for borrowing against future earnings and using those earnings today. With this supply of seemingly endless paper money, Faust literally remakes the land by draining marshes, building factories and new farms, and digging canals. Goethe had shown that the modern money economy, based on its strange new money, was a continuation of alchemy by other means. Writing in the first decades of the nineteenth century, Goethe seemed to forecast many of the industrial achievements of that age. In other writings, he predicted the building of the Suez Canal, and nearly a century before the opening of the Panama Canal, and long before the United States had made an important appearance on the stage of world history, Goethe predicted that the young nation would build a canal to connect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. As a scientist and statesman, as well as a poet and playwright, he foresaw the great accomplishments and the shortcomings of the emerging industrial world that would be financed on the newly emerging monetary system of paper money. At first, the spread of Faust's new money brings happiness and improvement, but soon the hidden costs begin bubbling to the surface. Peasants are killed while developing their land. A new class of government functionaries arises with names such as Quick Loot and Get Quick describing their attitudes toward life. Soon social unrest in the newly enriched nation leads to rebellion, and a new anti-emperor rises to challenge the old one. The many versions of Faust's bargain with the devil all end the same way, when the devil finally claims his due and descends with Faust into hell. Of all the writers and composers who tackled the story of the Faustian bargain with the devil, only Goethe, after a lifetime of studying human passion and behavior, gave the story a different ending. In the poem's final verses, a host of heavenly angels take the body of Faust away from Mephistopheles and sing that, For him whose striving never ceases, we can provide redemption. The seventeenth century marked the inauspicious debut of paper money onto the modern world scene. But as demonstrated by both the French and American cases, paper money carried great potential dangers. As long as it was supported by gold or silver, all seemed well and paper seemed just as reliable and far more convenient than precious metals. Invariably, however, the government or bank in charge of printing the money issued more paper than it had metal to back it. No matter how important the reason or how pressing the cause, once begun, the devaluation process spiraled, with more and more bills being issued at less and less value. The dangers and temptations, as well as the great mystery surrounding paper money, weighed heavily on the thinkers and poets of the nineteenth century. In the play Oedipus Tyrannus, written in 1820 by Percy Bysshe Shelley, greed incites people to abuse paper money. This perspective on paper money becomes clear when Mammon appears and asks another character, What's the matter, my dear fellow, now? Does money fail? Come to my mint, coin paper, till gold be at a discount, and a shame to show his bilious face. Money began as a specific, tangible commodity, as cowrie shells and stone discs, cacao beans and metal nuggets. 
In its second stage, it came in the form of paper, which retained its tangibility but lost its value as a commodity. Paper money could not be eaten as could salt blocks or cacao beans, nor could it be melted and formed into metal tools or ornaments like copper, tin, gold, and silver coins. Paper money lacked usefulness except as money. The use of coins and other commodities involved tremendous abstraction, but the use of paper made money even more abstract. Whether seen as a solution to practical problems, as portrayed by Benjamin Franklin, or as a Faustian bargain with the devil, as portrayed by Goethe, paper money was to play a crucial role in the 19th and 20th centuries, bringing great profit to some at a great cost to others.